Ladies and gentlemen, I am uh, Nathalie Ophor. Uh, I am General Director for Financial Stability and Markets uh, at the Banque de France and also um, a steer co member of the uh, Network for Greening the uh, Financial Sector, the Network uh, of Central Banks and Supervisors for Greening uh, the Financial Sector. So it's a great pleasure uh, for me to welcome you today and kick up the seventh edition of the Green Finance Research Advances uh, Conference. And uh, I'm especially pleased to welcome those who uh, come in spite of the snow, very little snow actually, but uh, nevertheless. <laughs> um, the conference is co-organized every year by uh, the Institut Louis Bachelier and the Banque de France in partnership with Finance for Tomorrow and the Institute for Climate Economics. So let me here thank all the staff involved uh, in the organization of the event. It's always a lot of work. Uh, the objective of the conference is to bring together academics, finance practitioners and regulators to discuss uh, research issues related to the integration of climate risks and more generally environmental issues into macroeconomic modeling and forecasting and into the risk assessment of the financial sector. But this year edition is special. For the first time, we have invited submissions from the academic community, receiving more than 100 submissions, many of very good quality. We had to accommodate new slot sensations to give credit to these uh, interesting new pieces of research. Uh, I think it's a recognition of the important progress made by the economic uh, and academic community on green finance topics. Just to name uh, three of the research topics uh, on the agenda of this conference. Uh, first, the development of sustainable finance uh, markets and products. Uh, second, physical risks, uh, where we need a lot more understanding. Uh, and third, climate stress testing, uh, which is one of the key approach and tool for central banks and supervisors and will be critical to help us frame possible policy options. These discussions are indeed critical and will feed our own research and policy work. Uh, at the Banque de France and the SEPR, we actually conduct also research on these topics in order to better understand the economic and financial issues related to the effects of climate change or the transition to a net zero economy. For that, we have set up an internal research network on climate and green finance, bringing together uh, researchers from across uh, the institution. And you can have an idea of our research on climate change related issues on a dedicated web page on the Banque de France website. This research uh, and uh, also, of course, the engagement with the broader academic community helps us in the pursuit of our mandates and embed these considerations on a day-to-day -day across all our business lines. In spite of the good progress made, I just mentioned, more research remains needed. And I am very proud to welcome three very prominent key, uh, keynote speakers. We will help us identify some of these uh, new promising research avenues. Professor James Stock from Harvard University. Professor Stock has an impressive and wide-ranging research record. And many of you know him as well as uh, for his leading introductory uh, textbook in econometrics with Mark Watson. Professor Stock is also Vice Provost for Climate and Sustainability, leading the newly launched Salata Institute for uh, Climate and Sustainability at Harvard University. Professor Stock will be delivering a keynote speech on the macroeconomic costs of the uncertainty re uh, surrounding climate policies. Uh, second, Professor Galina Hell from the University of California, Santa Cruz. She will present her latest research on how transition and physical risks are priced or not in the financial markets, a strand of research crucial to central banks uh, to assess financial risks. 
And finally, Matteo Sicarelli, Head of Forecasting and the Policy Modeling at the European Central Bank, will speak about the transmission channels through which climate change and pol climate policies impact the macroeconomy over the business cycle. So I really uh, would like to warmly thank them for having accepting, accepted our invitation. Uh, this edition aims also to highlight the short and medium term climate risks and obstacles to the energy transition and the role of central banks in addressing them. Uh, we have been for working for a, for a few years on longer term horizon associated climate risks. And while certainly we need a clear understanding of uh, long term phenomena governing the joint evolution of climate and the economy, the short and medium term aspects of energy transition are also crucial for an orderly transition and are perhaps less well studied in the economic literature. That's why we propose to have a roundtable specifically dedicated to discussing these short term risks. In an environment marked by uncertainty with the imperative on, of an early uh, transition to low carbon economy, at least we hope for that, uh, the financial risk associated with a disorderly transition may materialize in the short term. The roundtable will aim to precisely improve our understanding on the short term financial implication of a disorderly transition to net zero and where are the information gaps. The roundtable will aim to tackle some key questions regarding the type of risks over the short term uh, to medium term, how to model and monitor these risks, how to integrate these risks in the decision process of uh, financial institutions. The panel will include representatives from central banks, from academia, from international organizations, but also from the private financial sector. I think that uh, the format and onions of this conference are the right ones to facilitate exchanges and hopefully foster our common agenda. It is decisive for our community of central banks and supervisors to identify analytical blind spots and gaps in our collective knowledge. We look forward the Banque de France to a closer dialogue and when possible collaboration with the French academic community. You certainly know that uh, the central banks, the NGFS, the Central Banks and Supervisor Network for uh, Greening the Financial System, which a secretariat is provided by the Banque de France, has set up an advanced and fruitful dialogue with two research networks, namely uh, GRASFI, the Global Research Alliance for Sustainable Finance and Investment, and INSPIRE, the International Network for Sustainable Financial Policy Insights, Research and Exchange. And we certainly would like to uh, do the same with the French uh, Academia. Last but not least, the Banque de France decided at a time when the attention of the Academy uh, to uh, these questions was not as well established as it is uh, today. And we decided to, to launch a prize for young researchers in green finance five years ago. Um, we can say that the academic interest is now uh, undisputed, but we think that we still need to bring in more talents and encourage bright young economists to investigate these questions. So the name of the laureate of the fifth edition will be announced tomorrow, if I'm not wrong. Uh, but uh, beyond research, so it's a teasing, huh? uh, but beyond research, our a community need to take action. And uh, it's really uh, what uh, we need now, not only uh, analysis, but also action. But action has to be uh, well uh, grounded. And I think we can fairly say that we collectively have been moving quite fast over the past years. Thanks in particular to the evidence-based, but also action-oriented works and tools developed by the NGFS in particular. That is why, again, I am so pleased to welcome you uh, this year to share your latest research and views on green finance. 
So let me wish you uh, all an insightful and fruitful uh, discussion. And I give you the floor. <laughs> Thank you, Natalie. Uh, good morning, everybody. I think people are coming slowly but surely. Okay, I'm Jean-Michel Beaco. Well, it's uh, well, <laughs> nothing to say. I'm uh, CEO of Institut du Bachelier. And thank you very much for being here today and welcome to this uh, seventh conference, uh, Green Financial Research Advances Conference held at Banque de France. Um, this year, we are delighted to see physical people as well as people online. And I thank everybody, including the, uh, I think, uh, 600 people who have uh, said that they will assist uh, online or let's say here today. Uh, it's now a conference which is uh, seven years old, uh, successfully organized by, co-organized by Institut de Bachelier and Banque de France since the origin. So I think it's uh, something notable with the help of I4C and Finance for Tomorrow. The purpose of the conference, Nathalie just said it, uh, it's a flagship at ILB. I mean, uh, uh, for us, uh, GF, RA, or Green Financial Research Advances, is a flagship uh, similar to the uh, risk forum, the International Risk Forum in spring uh, in Paris as well. And um, it's, uh, it is meant to share academic knowledge on green and sustainable finance between practitioners, academics, and regulators. Because green is definitely a hot topic, uh, this new edition shows some new stuff. First of all, uh, we have launched an international call for papers last summer to get uh, new perspectives from researchers uh, worldwide. As a result, more than 50 papers were submitted. And I think if I'm not mistaken, uh, 18 of them will have been selected uh, and will be presented at this conference. Furthermore, we extended the conference uh, to two days. So formerly it was one day, now it's two days, because again, I mean, uh, these evolutions are definitely, uh, let's say, led by the urgency to respond to climate change. So I'm very glad that we upgraded the conference accordingly. Climate or green finance is becoming every year more complex, more sophisticated, and such level of complexity cannot be mitigated without a robust and dynamic academic research base. Complexity also calls for a wider variety of expertise from different fields, uh, from economics and mathematics, of course, but also physics, biology, social sciences, and legal. It also calls for better, better data and innovative financial engineering. That's why ILB has committed to achieve, uh, to tackle this issue of data and financial engineering through its uh, green and sustainable finance research program, as well as the recent launch of the ESG Lab. ESG Lab is of paramount importance at ILB. It provides green and finance practitioners the tools created by engineers to resolve complex issues such as scenario analysis, net zero methodologies, impact measurement, as well as more broadly ESG risk measurement and modelization. In addition to this new lab, ILB has launched an open source ESG data cartography, which is available on our website. Back to the ESG lab, I want to, uh, to tell you that uh, it's already 20 young engineers. So here we have the, uh, the young economists and uh, at ILB we have set up as well young engineers and old engineers as well as me. Uh, <laughs> that you can, of course, contact anytime, especially if you want to have applied research to your issues. 
I will end up by uh, saying uh, a big thank you to Banque de France. Uh, really, thank you very much because uh, working with you is really a pleasure, I want to say it, because you are very professional and uh, you have, I think, even you have upgraded ILB accordingly. And um, uh, thank you very much, Nathalie. Thank, uh, thank you to Banque de France. And uh, I want to say a big thank you as well uh, to the scientific committee because uh, it has been a, a big work. Uh, 50 papers is uh, is not nothing and selecting 18 out of them is uh, really, a, a, it's a big deal. Okay, and thank you the ILB team for organizing as well as uh, uh, Stéphane and Peter for leading this uh, conference with you, uh, Banque de France. Uh, I wish you a good conference. Again, two days of conference, so we will have um, the starters, the main dish, then cheese, dessert. So I think we, we have a, 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 a very good program in front of us uh, and I wish you a good uh, conference. Thank you. So many thanks. Many thanks to uh, Mrs. Ofova and Mr. Biako for launching our conference. So we've got a dense and rich agenda and our first uh, keynote speaker is uh, Professor Galina Hell, Mrs. Hell, if you want to join us on stage. So I will briefly introduce you. So Galina, you are Professor of Economics at uh, University of uh, California, Santa Cruz. You were previously a research advisor at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. And prior to that, you have been on several faculties of uh, the University of uh, Yale, Yale University, Stanford University, University of California, Berkeley. You are also director of the International Finance and Macroeconomics Program at CIBRA, so the Central Bank Research Association, and also co-director of the Center of Analytical Finance at the University of California, Santa Cruz. So you have been researching more specifically the nexus between the ESG sustainability goals and the financial system with a view to better understand the implication for financial stability. So as you will explain in a few minutes, the materiality of climate-related risk depends on whether and how these risks are priced in by the markets. And you will guide us through the existing literature on the pricing of these climate-related risks and what that means in terms of challenge for redirecting the financial system and the financial markets to account for these risks and finance the transition. So without further delay, Galina, I'll give you the floor. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak uh, at this conference. Um, it's great to be in Paris in person after many years. Um, and uh, it's wonderful to be presenting at this conference where people are working on green finance, which I think is a topic that's very important. As Thomas said, I will talk about um, a little, give you a little overview of the literature on how climate ri whether climate risks are priced in in different asset markets. Uh, but I also want to talk about uh, the role of financial system in the climate solutions. So there will be two parts to my talk. The first one is very much, as Thomas said, addressing the question of how much the risks are already priced in, which is a crucial question for the policymakers, because depending on the answer to that question, we can evaluate how, uh, how big of a financial stability risk climate risks are posing. But I also want to talk about um, things that are less researched in terms of how can financial markets uh, participate in climate solutions. So I'm going to talk about risks and opportunities, if you will. Um, so I don't need to explain in this audience is that uh, there is a two-way connection between financial markets and climate change. On the one hand, there are climate risks that come from, uh, you know, fall under different types of financial risks. There are regulatory risks, credit risks, collateral risks, and the vast asset value risks. And the question is, how much are those priced in? Those come from both physical and transition risks, and I don't think anybody in the audience needs an explanation for this. Uh, a less researched, uh, I think, is the question of how can financial system contribute to climate solutions? And I think here it's important that we think about three types of industries, not two. 
right? So a lot of people think there is green and non-green or there is uh, polluting and non-polluting industries, but I think we really need to think about three, right? So there is an exposed or industries that are currently producing greenhouse gas emissions. These are exposed industries and they're posing climate risks. They're neutral industries that have a minimal climate risks. And then there are green industries or green firms that are actually investing actively in climate solutions. So the firms that are, there's a difference between neutral and green firms. And that's why I think it's important to think about green firms and, or industries and climate solutions as a separate issue from climate risks. Obviously, acknowledging climate risks and understanding that the green industries are providing the hedge against those climate risks, uh, you know, would help move the money from exposed to green industries already. But there is, I think, more needed in terms of moving money to the green industries beyond just the hedge for the climate risks. Uh, and when I talk about climate solutions, I'm going to mention a little bit about the mitigation efforts, and these are uh, any kind of projects that reduce green greenhouse gas emissions and therefore reduce the climate risks. But given where we are in the time of history, we already are facing a substantial amount of global warming. We also need to take adaptation seriously. We already see manifestations of the cli physical climate risks all over the world, including in Europe last summer. And so we really need to invest a lot in adaptation. Uh, so I will talk a little bit about what are the barriers to getting financial markets for profit financial institutions to participate in climate solutions. Um, it helps to think about different physical risks. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. So physical risk could be acute, like extreme climate, climate events, uh, extreme weather events, fires, floods, hurricanes, extreme heat, or they could be chronic. And the chronic... Um, Risks are, you know, increase in the global temperature, increase in the sea level. And what's important about chronic risks is that it's not just the distribution is moving to the right, say, if you think about the temperature chain, is that all over the world, across the space, the distribution becomes more fat-tailed, right? So the hot places get hotter and the cold places actually get colder. And the same thing is true about the precipitation. And so just looking at the first moment even though it's a good approximation in some applications for the effects of climate risk, if you actually want to price those risks, looking at the second moment of this distribution is very important. And the only comment I have about transition risk is that we frequently think about that as coming solely from the regulation, uh, such as carbon taxation. But one needs to keep in mind that technological development, as well as consumer and investor preferences, are also posing transition risks and the risks of stranded assets for the financial system. Now, physical risks in that whole climate research literature are relatively easy to measure. Anybody who's worked on that knows that easy has to be in quotes, but we have pretty good data on, temper on the physical manifestations of climate change. It's a lot harder to measure um, transition risks. We have very little reporting of actual emissions or exposure of firms to those uh, transition risks. And we also have a lot of policy uncertainty uh, across the world. So measuring these risks is very hard. And so that is a, a caveat to any of the literature summaries that I'm going to talk about. Uh, one thing I learned from looking at the whole bunch of papers written on the question of how much the climate risks are priced in is that if you are looking for you know, longer time series, you tend to find that the effects, there's more pricing in of the effects after COP21, after the Paris uh, Climate Accord. And here's one example of, kind of can explain why this might be the case. So this is a climate change risk index uh, from the paper by Sontner and co-authors. What they did, they, um, you know, web scraped the corporate calls and did natural language processing to see how much climate risks are mentioned. And so this is just a summary of the climate risk index. They have other measures as well. If you don't know this paper, it's a fantastic paper and they share the data with ISIN codes for the firm so you can merge it. Uh, but you can see that there is a substantial 
increase in this recognition of climate risks by the firms in the sample after 2016. And their data only goes through 2019, and one would think that that kind of increase in climate awareness, climate risk awareness, is only going up. Okay, so uh, I forgot to mention in the beginning that uh, the work I'm presenting here is based on a number of projects I'm working on. The names were on the first slide. Uh, but this particular one is um, work that I'm doing with a PhD student at UC Santa Cruz, Bhavya Sharma. She's going to be here tomorrow. Uh, and there's also, I'm drawing on the work with uh, Ted Liu, another uh, PhD student who's on the market this year, and Anirvan Sanial, yet another uh, PhD student in Santa Cruz. So, um, so I'm just going to go as a class by as a class. Hopefully it's not going to be too tedious. Uh, but you really see quite a bit of differences. So if you look at the equity, there's quite a bit. I'm not going to go through all the methodology. I'm just going to try to extract some quantitative results from the literature. And I'm not yet ready to say, well, are these numbers close to 0% priced in or 100% priced in? That's the next step I'm still working on. Uh, but at least I'm going to give you a numbers and you can kind of judge whether they're big or small. So it seems to be consistent across the papers that there is a greenium. So there is a reward for firms that report uh, their uh, emissions and that they have low levels or they have a reduction in their carbon emissions. Usually people focus on carbon. I see very little about other greenhouse gases. Uh, and so with lower emissions or firms reducing emissions, there is lower stock returns. So there is a greenium. It's cheaper for firms to raise capital if they're green. And so one standard deviation of greener portfolio tends to reduce sharp ratio by about one and a half percent. So it's one and a half percent of the ratio. So it's pretty small number. Uh, and after Paris uh, uh, Climate Accord, we see the numbers are a little bit larger. And you can see that one standard deviation in carbon intensity, so how much carbon emissions the firm produces as a share of their value added, tends to increase the uh, returns by two and a half to three and a half percent. So, so that's actually uh, quite large. And in another paper, uh, the authors find that implied cost of capital is lower for green than for brown portfolios by up to two and a half percentage points, which is a pretty large number if you think about the, you know, the stock returns scale. Okay, so I think the slides will be shared. So there, all these papers are linked, and I want to apologize to people in the audience and on Zoom whose papers I'm not citing. Uh, they're written faster than I can read them. Uh, so please send them to me. We will include them in in our analysis. Um, so we're doing some work also with the data on equity returns. So this is with Anirban Sanyal, a graduate student, and Julian DiGiovanni at the New York Fed. So we're looking at just a simple response of stock returns by country industry to physical and transitional risk. So physical risks are measured as disasters. Transition risks are measured as new policies as reported by IEA, okay? What we find is that there is quite a bit of dispersion across countries. Uh, and of course, that depends on uh, how exposed those countries are. And part of this dispersion across countries is also driven by the fact that there's quite a bit of dispersion across industries. So um, this, this chart is showing, um, we're estimating a random coefficient model, so it's just showing those random coefficients as estimated from the regression of stock returns on, on physical and transition risks. These are transition risks. You see that there is some decline in stock returns. I'm realizing that I'm looking there, but I'm not pointing. Uh, there is a decline in stock returns in um, some countries and some industries, but the magnitudes are very small. And so you can see distribution for each country across industries and then for each industry across countries. And in many cases, you have as many positive responses as you have negative responses. So this is definitely that, you know, when you just look at the average, which is the numbers I just summarized to you from the papers, uh, you will probably have attenuation. So this heterogeneity is very important if you're doing research 
on these topics. Um, so I'm not going to go, there is even more variance in the response to physical risks. Um, but, but as you see, the averages kind of tend to be zero. So uh, that's a little bit warning for the people working on in that space. Okay. Um, for sovereign bonds, I was actually surprised not to find more papers on sovereign risks, sovereign and climate risks. Maybe it's all work in progress. Maybe I didn't look hard enough. Uh, but we find that there's some effects. So people find that there's some effects, right? So sovereign green bonds have a slightly lower, lower yield, very slightly, two to seven basis points. And sovereign default probability does increase with climate risks. So it, you know, if we can measure it, the markets should be able to measure it. So, uh, and that's from the paper uh, by Ted Liu, that 1% increase in vulnerability to climate risks increases default probability by five percentage points. Uh, and extreme weather events in developing economies can also reduce debt to GDP levels by 16%. So it's, it's because of the access to, to borrowing. So there is, looks like the markets are reacting to it, but maybe not fully. Um, and you can also see that observed high temperature anomalies increase CDS spreads by 14 to 28 basis points. And there's a lot of uh, heterogeneity, and you see that the effects are larger for Sub-Saharan Africa, which is a lot more exposed to, to the uh, temperature change. You also see that the, um, that the CAD bonds can actually reduce the welfare loss from climate change events by about 15%. So there is definitely an argument for supporting CAD, CAD bonds, uh, and you know, I'll talk a little bit about that towards the end. Uh, okay. All right, so looking at the corporate bonds and munis, you also see some effects, about 30 to 40 basis points. Um, premium for emission heavy firms, and that premium also increased after the Paris Accord, and especially in the countries that have a stricter environmental regulation, so this is something you would expect to find. But again, the, the effects are pretty small. One standard deviation increase in climate change news index only leads to six basis points drop in corporate bond excess returns, okay? And we see if you look at the, um, more generally at corporate bonds, the physical risk is priced in for below grade bonds, a little bit for munis, but not for investment grade bonds. So either, you know, there might be some endogeneity, maybe if the bond is exposed to climate risk, it doesn't get an investment grade, but I don't think, you know, given how small in basis points these differences are, uh, I'm worried that we're not, we're not accounting for the climate risks properly in the corporate bond market. Uh, for, is there a clock so I know? When, when do I need to stop? 20 minutes, perfect. I got time. Okay, so um, uh, in mortgages and real estate, these are markets that are more explicitly exposed to climate risks. Uh, I live in California. Uh, two towns near Santa Cruz burned two years ago, um, losing about a third of their uh, housing stock and access to water. Um, so uh, there's a wonderful paper by Nancy Wallace looking at very, very detailed data for California. And remember I talked to you about the th fat tails. In California, in the areas that are hot, the temperature increase on average in the summer is about 10 degrees Fahrenheit, which is what about five degrees centigrade. So it's a lot more than one and a half to two degrees already because these are already hot areas. And that dramatically, together with a uh, decline in precipitation dramatically increases the wildfire risk. And so in affected areas, you see about 60 basis points increase in uh, foreclosure and delinquency in the affected areas. Um, she also finds this very interesting effect that if there is a major disaster, the FEMA level disaster, when the federal aid comes to rescue, there is actually a negative effect on delinquency because some people who maybe were going to foreclose now get FEMA money and they're not going to foreclose. But if it's a regional event, there is quite a bit increase in foreclosures. So this is not the famous fires that we are thinking about, but the smaller events, and they need to be also taken into account. 
Uh, and across asset markets, the mortgage markets uh, are most attuned to the climate risks, partly because the insurance costs are affected, insurance availability is affected uh, by the climate change events. I cannot get private insurance on my house in California because of fire and flood risk. I have to get the st California state insurance. Um, market price is for mortgage credit risk is about 10% higher for exposed areas. So that's the market which you can kind of benchmark on and think that probably that's priced in. The question is still whether the markets are thinking about the distribution of these weather events as being static or whether they are realizing that the whole distribution is shifting to the right, the frequency and severity of extreme events is going to go up and whether the pricing of individual events is consistent with that distribution shifting. Um, okay. Uh, syndicated loans, I think is most researched, uh, probably asset market, uh, in addition to equity in terms of the climate risks. There's quite a bit of work, especially in Europe. Uh, there's a lot of data available. Um, but the results are not very encouraging. So there is no, there used to be actually a discount on syndicated loans for exposed firms, for the firms that are uh, emit a lot of greenhouse gases. So since Paris, there is no more discount, and there might be some surcharge for scope one emission by about eight basis points, which seems very small. Um, there is a discount when the green bank is lending to a green firm, then you get about 60 basis point discount on those loans. And you get about 50 basis points penalty for when there is an E incident in the ESG, right? So, uh, and this kind of reputation E incident uh, that's reported, the firm has to pay 50 basis points more on the loan. Uh, so not everybody has access to the pricing data. So there's also quite a bit of work on the quantity of lending by sovereign, uh, by syndicated, by bank syndicates. Um, on average, in Europe, the banks are shifting to more green firms. So about 2% decline to exposed firms after Paris. Uh, but the banks that are already exposed to those uh, greenhouse gas emitting firms, they actually double down on the lending. Okay, And there's a nice theory paper that explains why that might be the case. There's about 25% loan increase by the, firm, by the banks that specialize in lending in those uh, exposed firms. So with an average decline of 2% and 25% increase by those exposed, by those non-green banks, uh, we probably don't actually see decline in the lending to the exposed firms. In the US, there is no effect. Um, and what we also see, and that's what I gather also from talking to uh, you know, people in, the, in financial market practitioners, is they're focusing more on greening rather than on green, right? So uh, if you think about how do we get to net zero or zero, right? We don't want to take the money out completely from the industries that produce greenhouse gas emissions. We want to incentivize those industries to produce less and less greenhouse gas emissions. The right way to do it is to reward uh, reduction in emissions as opposed to lower levels, okay? Because we don't want all the money to move from energy sector to, I don't know, sector that doesn't produce emissions. I can't think of one, but I'm sure they exist. Uh, so greening firms should be getting more funding, but actually in the data um, that has been studied, there's actually less funding going to greening firms. Okay, so a very under-researched topic, I think, is related to uh, agriculture funding. And so that's from Tadler's job market paper. He looked at the lending to farms that are exposed to physical risks. And what he's finding is that uh, when the farms are hit by uh, climate shocks, the farms that are small or medium tend to lose money and the money tends to go then to the big farms, okay? So climate risk increases the concentration of money in the green funds 
And to the extent that we have more people employed in smaller funds than in smaller farms than larger funds, farms that also has implications for uh, agricultural labor market. And to the extent that larger farms tend to have more monoculture that also is likely affecting biodiversity. So that feedback loop through uh, drying up of funding to small farms that are exposed to climate risks is also a potential contributor to the climate risk. Uh, two other asset classes and then I'm done. So this is uh, the papers I've written recently uh, looking at real exchange rates. It's very hard to look at nominal ones, too many things affect them, so I looked at real exchange rates. What I find is that uh, just looking at physical risks, because I don't know how to properly measure transition risks, the real exchange rates do not react to this physical uh, climate shocks in the way that the model would predict. Uh, but the model predicts relatively small but permanent uh, real depreciation of the currencies and the countries that are affected by the shocks. Uh, with Grace Gu, my colleague at Santa Cruz, we looked at the FDI and we tried to, we, the referee said you have too many regressions, we have like 200 regressions. We tried at every level of aggregation, every definition of the shock, and we find no consistent response of foreign direct investment to uh, physical or transition risks. Um, we find that in emerging markets, there is a little bit of the effect of physical risks. That's the difference between that red plane and a blue plane uh, on the bottom chart. For advanced economies, the difference is pretty much invisible. And what we find is that the response to physical and transition risks crucially depends on the firm's emissions. So we have a model that shows why it might be the case. This sign could go in either direction, depending on where in this emission productivity distribution the firm is. And so that's one of the implications of our paper is that we really badly need the data on firm level emissions to be able to even study those questions uh, and obviously to implement the policy. So the way I read the literature, it doesn't appear that climate risks are fully priced in. There is a huge heterogeneity across asset classes, countries and industries and risk types. And the, a lot of papers are written, but I think more papers still need to be written as we get more data. And the big call for policymakers, of course, is to create incentives for the firms uh, to report their emissions and to create some kind of auditing uh, of those emissions as well as ESG reporting. Um, okay, which I'm sure we'll talk about it uh, later in today, tomorrow. So what about solutions, okay? Uh, so this is from, uh, it's basically captured from IPCC, you know, so how much money are we putting in climate solutions? So the blue thing before 2021 is how much money we are now to put into climate solutions. The purple line is how much money we need to be putting to climate solutions to maintain uh, one and a half degrees pathway. Okay, so we are not there. We need three to six times more money. And currently, where the money come from is a lot of money is coming from public sector, a lot of money is coming from uh, uh, corporations, very, some money is coming from banks, very little money is coming from institutional investors. We have, so the total amount of money we want to get to one and a half degrees is actually not a huge amount. If you think of it in the scale of global financial markets, it's only six trillion dollars. We can come up with $6 trillion because the global assets under management is over $100 trillion. So we can totally, totally make it. Now, uh, so what solutions we're talking about? Most money that does go towards climate solution goes towards mitigation. And I would say 20 years ago, I would say absolutely, we should put all the money towards mitigation so we don't have to do any adaptation. But since we didn't do that 20 years ago, now we also need to be putting money towards adaptation and very little money goes towards adaptation. Adaptation solutions take two forms. There could be man-made solutions such as building the levees, uh, you, know, you know, creating, um, you know, fire defenses, uh, digging up sand from the ocean, pouring it back on the beach. Uh, there could be also nature-based solutions such as restoring coral reefs, restoring mangrove forests, restoring rocky reefs, and uh, 
you know, coastal marshes to protect low-lying lands from increase in the sea level and increase in the wave energy. Uh, and they're pretty much in every aspect, they're a nature-based solution. The nice thing about them is that nature-based solutions have co-benefits in terms of biodiversity, in terms of wildlife, habitat, and other things. So, and pretty much no private money is currently going towards nature-based solutions. So I was thinking about why not, right? Uh, it's an important problem. Why aren't financial markets interested in solving this? So if you think about the profile of the payoffs on such investment, you basically, let's say you're trying to transition something that's not sustainable to something that is sustainable. It means you go into the red for a couple of years, you spend a lot of money on changing the heating system, let's just say, in a hotel in the city. Uh, it costs you a lot of money, then it saves you money later on, but those savings are small and accrue over a long period of time. Most financial uh, players are not interested in such long-term payoff to a short-term um, uh, high-level investment. Also, the payoffs are uncertain because we don't know in you know, uncertainty about, say, carbon tax, you don't know how much savings are you actually going to get. Another problem is the payoffs are actually not easy financialized. What I mean is that your payoffs are in terms of potential savings that are uncertain. If you go with that to the bank or to a, a investment fund, they're going to say, wait a second, I want to see a cash flow. This is not a cash flow, this is something very nebulous. So can we create a way to financialize those benefits over time? Payoffs are also distributed across stakeholders, uh, which means you need participation of all the stakeholders in order to kind of provide guarantees, let's just say, for, uh, for an investment. And there obviously always a lot of risk. So if you're investing in climate solutions, especially some nature-based solutions that, you know, in a sense might be hard to monitor and hard to enforce. Uh, and a great example of this is uh, carbon credits that people get for not cutting the trees. Well, if they cut the trees next year, they don't have to give back the, the carbon credit. So, so that's not really a solution. And then of course, Another issue is a scale. Some of the solutions are too small of a scale to be of interest to large financial institutions. Some of them are too large of a scale to be uh, taken up by just one financial institution. So tokenizing potentially could be, could be a way to do it. So, uh, you know, so I thought about what can we do to overcome those challenges? Structured finance could be one, and I'm going to give you one example. Um, per participation of NGOs and the government. So if you can have private-public partnership to help de-risk those financial uh, instruments, then they can be more attractive to financial markets. And the co-benefits is a key word for that because the government, so I'll give you an example. So the hotel that is trying to change the heating system, right? The, the city is interested in supporting this project because the city cares about the quality of the air and the city's green index overall. And so the cities might, might be willing to give a grant to the hotel, which would reduce the amount of the investment the private sector needs to put in, which automatically increases ROI by reducing the I. So that, that would be an example of how co-benefits can actually um, be taken into account. Uh, I already mentioned fintech tokenization. Uh, we need to innovate on financial instruments more generally to be able to address some of those challenges. So I'll give you three examples. Uh, I don't know how many people know this one. It was pretty well written up in financial literature. Um, it's the Nature Conservancy sponsored Belize Blue Bond debt conversion, right? So uh, it's a pretty standard debt repurchase agreement, except that the savings from that, uh, you know, the debt service flow, as well as some extra money that came from the Credit Suisse loan is going to be put in the, in, is, is being put into the endowment that then the government of Belize is promising to spend on protecting the ocean stuff. And the Nature Conservancy is the agent who wrote that contract that's supposed to monitor and enforce that contract. Another important piece 
is that there was a guarantee from the, uh, the government, so DFC is the US, uh, the, the, the agency that provides insurance against political risk. And so they provided some guarantee. And the Nature Conservancy also provided liquidity and equity through their subsidiary, okay? So they basically bought up all the debt at 55 cents on the dollar, and now they don't have to service that debt. And um, that, then Credit Suisse, who issued the loan, securitized that loan, and it was oversubscribed, and it's got 3% coupon for the first three years and 6% coupon going forward. Now, is this debt going to do well? Is it going to get defaulted? How much is it going? It's, it's too soon to tell. But it gives you an idea of how many different types of actors it takes to create a deal like that. That wasn't their first one. They started with Seychelles, um, but eventually they got to Belize. So, um, you know, there is an NGO, the Nature Conservancy, is a, is a philanthropy, and there is a government insurance that needed to, to happen to participate in this. So, uh, and by the way, the underlying things is a link to, you can read more on this. Um, so another thing that I think is very exciting is an advanced market commitment. So advanced commitment is the financial instrument that allows to pre-purchase something that's going to be uh, available later. But the commitment is made to just purchasing a certain amount, not necessarily from some actor. So it's not like a contract. Right? It's just saying that's how the vaccine development in the U.S. was financed. The U.S. government said we're going to buy so many vaccines at this price. Whoever gets that to sell them first, we're going to buy them. And that maintains the competition but creates uh, the ability to borrow against this advanced commitments. And so markets can also provide these commitments. It doesn't have to be the government. So um, in California, there is this frontier climate organization that allows companies to pre-purchase their carbon offsets. And the money from those purchases, they get invested into uh, carbon removal technologies. So the ones that don't involve planting trees, the, the you know chemical, high tech. So the factories that are going to remove carbon from the atmosphere are not built yet. So this is the advanced market commitment. The money to invest in those factories comes from those pre-purchases. Uh, so what do they offer? This uh, uh, frontier uh, climate, they provide expert intermediation because uh, say Delta Airlines who are, want to make those advanced market commitments, they do not have capacity to figure out which uh, startup carbon removal plant is good, which one is not. So there is this intermediary that does this triage for them. Uh, again, remains to be seen how well it works. Um, another case I have is um, this company called Climatize. They're just waiting for their permits from uh, all the appropriate financial regulators. Uh, the idea is they get small change from your online purchases. You get an app on your phone those small change that get aggregated and invested in climate solutions, such as putting rooftop solar or something like that. Uh, the idea is that you do get, it's still your investment, it's not a donation, but you don't actually care how much return on your investment you get if that's your small change. So it's really tokenizing to the extreme and they're using quite a bit of FinTech in order to, to manage this. Okay. Anyway, so, uh, I think that's, that's my last slide. So there's a lot of projects that are available for funding, okay? Most of these projects are currently funded to the extent possible by government and very little by non-government organizations. But I think they don't all have to be funded by government or government organization. And so what we need is kind of a climate solution marketplace where we can sort the solutions into those that have an attractive investment profile already, maybe with some financial innovation, but no need for guarantees or uh, public sector involvement. Uh, so it could be traditional investment, it could be impact investment, it could be green investment as regulators are providing incentives to create green portfolios and green assets. Uh, those projects should be available for funding, but they're not easily found. 
uh, then there are projects that need the risking or that need to boost the ROI through the co-benefits that could be funded by the government. And so it can come in the form of government insurance or government or non-government grant, et cetera. And then there are projects that have no hope of being attractive to private sector. These are the projects that should be getting government and NGO money. At the moment, we are not triaging those projects and we potentially have the government funding the projects that could be funded by private sector. All right, so uh, that was a lot of information, so thank you so much. Please send me the papers that I should cite in that literature survey, and if you have any ideas for climate solutions, please send those uh, as well. Uh, I'm organizing a conference in the spring that's going to focus on those climate solutions. I'll keep you posted. Thanks, Gaina, for this uh, very clear, insightful presentation and this very concrete example as a, as a way forward. So, and you're precisely on time also, so thank you very much for Good. that as well. So that means we've got another five to ten minutes for questions uh, with the audience. So what I want to say also, for those of you who are online, there should be a chat function or a box somewhere on the page for you to be able to uh, write down some questions that you want to share uh, with the, the speaker. And I'll be uh, translating these questions uh, to uh, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. L. Uh, in the meantime, uh, for all of those of, you, those of you who are in the room today, uh, in the armchair, you should have a mic. So if you've got a question... People there. If you've got a question, it seems to be better with the sound. <laughs> <laughs> Hoping the others online have heard me. So those of you online, just to repeat, uh, you should have a chat function uh, on the page and you can ask questions online and I will uh, transfer, uh, transmit them to uh, Mrs. L. And for those of you uh, in the room, there should be a mic uh, in the armchair uh, and the floor is yours for questions. We've got five to ten minutes for questions. So who wants to go first? I've got a question there from uh, Antoine Mandel, if I'm not mistaken. Please introduce yourself very quickly. Uh, Antoine Mandel from uh, the University of Paris, one. Ju uh, just with the clarity question, you show the number of graphs, the mic works? Yes. Uh, you show the number of graphs where you were, as they representing the change in the supply of credit or in the, in the, the, the amount of credit as a function of temperature anomaly. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by temperature anomaly in this context? Is it that you, have, you see the instantaneous change given in over time? of the credit, or is it that you exploit special uh, heterogeneity uh, of, uh, you know, whether variables to do that? So, so it's uh, from Ted Lewis' paper, but I happen to know it. So, um, temperature anomaly is deviation from normal, and the data is annual frequency, so is during that year, was there a period, I'm not exactly sure how long, that there was a temperature anomaly, and it just measured, no, I think it's just measured average temperature anomaly over a year. But then the data is at the county level, so a lot of, so the identification of the results is mostly from uh, spatial differences. Many thanks. Many thanks, I think we've got another question there on the right-hand side. You should have a mic in the Uham chair, Dr. Fotei. Between what you've presented on debt capital markets and the premium uh, corporate uh, market markets, and the, um, the relationship or impact of non-monetary policy, um, is, there, is there a connection? Is there research about this? How that is connected, and what the impact has been or could have been uh, of the, the massive uh, non-monetary policy? So, you ask monetary policy effect on greenium. I did not see anything, which doesn't mean it doesn't exist. <laughs> uh, but in that, um, specifically in either sovereign or corporate debt literature, I did not see. You know, maybe they put you know in you know policy rate as a control on the right hand side, but not an interactive effect. I have not seen that. 
Are there any other questions from the room? And when you ask a question, please do use the mic and do try to speak close to the mic. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel, for your wonderful presentation. So Hi, uh, Galina. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, wonderful presentation. So one question on sovereign financing for uh, climate uh, objectives. So you have um, given us quite a very detailed summary about the literature about the Greenium also on the fixed income markets for sovereign issuers. And here, so there are several instruments available. One is uh, green bonds, so we can talk about greenium. Uh, and there, there are many like pending issues about how to verify the use of proxies against uh, the preset objectives. And even if the use of proxies goes to the areas uh, that are previous, uh, that are prescribed, we can't uh, guarantee there is an impact on climate. So this is uh, the second missed link. Then now there are also these like new instruments available on the market, which is the sustainability linked bonds, uh, used uh, more widely by corporate issuers. But now two sovereign, two sovereigns have also uh, used this instrument. So there, could you tell us a bit whether this is new, like? more promising instruments in the sense that probably in terms of pricing, not only we can see, uh, we, we, we should be able to think about in terms of greenium, but also there's the penalty part, right? If the country or a corporate issuer missed uh, the targets, they will be pen penalized. So whether this new mechanism will give a good incentive for sovereign issuers to uh, finance climate projects uh, or you know to meet the climate objectives. So I want to have your view. Thank you. Yeah, no, this is, this is a great question because, as I mentioned, the risks are hard to measure, but also they, the money is fungible. And it's, you know, I think that problem has been discussed since the very beginning of green bonds. Um, the question is, you know, who verifies and how on the arm's length market, uh, how the money is actually being used and if it has impact on climate. Um, I think that's one reason the greenium is maybe smaller than it could be because there is, you know, against that greenium, what's working is this uncertainty about how much impact um, the, the money is going to have and how much risk reduction, right? So if you are just uh, an investor who doesn't care about the impact, you just want to hedge against the climate risks, it's not clear that the green bond is gonna be a hedge. And so I think that's a problem that needs to be addressed through, you know, very much like we have audit for other, uh, other kind of, uh, you know, uh, efforts by the companies, you know, and disclosures. We need to have those disclosures as well. In particular, if we have proper emission disclosures that are audited, then it would go a long way towards, uh, towards this. Another thing that I've been thinking about is that you know, we have those technologies, you know, we can measure emissions of the firms by flying drones with sensors over them. Like, why, why don't we do that? You know, and so is there a market failure? Who should be flying those drones? I, I'm not a big fan of drones, but, you know, that seems like a pretty obvious solution to actually monitor emissions year to year. And then if your green bonds are linked to the emission reduction, and that's the way the advanced commitments would work as well. Uh, because then you can get your carbon credits through emission reduction. So I don't know why we don't use technology for this. Maybe we are in some places that I'm not aware of, but I think that could be done. Because there are satellite projects to measure uh, emissions uh, from uh, remote sensing currently being implemented, but maybe not at the... So the question is, do the satellite, is that... Does it have the precision Not enough to target? Yet. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Bit, That's why the I'm resolution thinking is a bit too low. Yeah, exactly. So, but, but we have technology. Years. You know, we have we are flying drones over farms already to measure you know, the moisture level to see how much we need to water stuff. So that's great already. But you know, those drones are already flying, so might as well put another sensor on them. 
So I think with this uh, discussion on the, the future of the technology to help us uh, transition and, and, and manage some of this risk, I think we are uh, just on time. Thank you very much, uh, Galina, for, for coming over and for this uh, very clear, insightful presentation. Uh, so many thanks again uh, in the name of uh, all the organizing committee. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Okay, so I hope um, this works with the microphone and everything. So, um, yeah, this is a joint project with Francesco Giovanardi and Lukas Radke from Cologne and uh, Florian uh, from the Bundesbank. So I have two disclaimers, actually. The first is the usual one uh, due to my and Florian's affiliation, that these are our own views and not the ones of the Euro system or the Bundesbank. The second disclaimer is that this paper is much more macro than the title, uh, the title might uh, suggest, actually. So um, we'll see um, how that uh, goes along. So feel free to um, comment on everything that looks too much like a simplification for a finance person. We do some of those deliberately to get like clean and tractable results. Um, so happy to hear um, your, your take on this. So the motivation is like the entire conference, of course, that there is this massive externality around, um, which is not properly addressed by uh, fiscal policy, like by carbon taxes or our cap and trade schemes, um, these uh, yeah, large climate externality, which has then um, led some um, commentators, policymakers to um, calls to finance or in particular and central banks um, in, in, a, in a wider sense also, to take this um, into account uh, in, in their uh, monetary policy implementation and, and in the general investment decision that financial investors undertake. Um, one of these measures, uh, and that is the focus of our paper, is something that has come out of the ECB strategy review, namely um, a proposed tilting of the collateral framework towards green bonds and bonds issued by low carbon firms. Um, so that has been announced uh, last summer, so in summer 21. It's not implemented like the um, tilting of the asset purchase programs that has been come into effect in October, but it's something that is still like currently being implemented or um, prepared to being implemented. And something similar also has been among other central banks um, announced or already implemented, for example, by the Bank of England, the People's Bank of China. So, so there is some active uh, changes to the monetary policy implementation frameworks of several central banks. And the idea of um, this preferential collateral treatment is relatively straightforward by selectively treating certain assets preferentially at lower haircuts. This will affect bond prices, so it will increase them, make them more attractive to investors to hold, and thereby is supposed to relax financing conditions uh, for green firms. And what well, this is relatively clear from a um, like asset pricing or banking point of view. It's um, not so clear how this actually looks then in a, in, in a macro uh, general equilibrium framework. And this is what uh, our paper is about. So we're going to build a relatively straightforward DSGE model that is typically used to implement monetary policies and um, augment that along certain dimensions to talk about um, the effect of such a preferential policy on green bond issuance green investment, um, pollution externalities, which um, you might just call uh, carbon emissions. And we also are able to talk about potential adverse side effects of such a policy on, on financial markets. And well, you can just condense that to what extent is a preferential collateral policy a suitable environmental or climate policy instrument. So, so this is what, what all this boils down to. Um, and these three extensions that we have to um, make to the standard business cycle model uh, in principle is first, okay, we need an environmental externality. This is obvious, otherwise we cannot talk about environmental policy. Um, we are going to have firms in the model that issue risky bonds, risky meaning um, they are um, defaultable. And banks are also um, play a more dominant part than in many standard DSGE models in the sense that there is um, a motive um, to uh, yeah, purchase bonds that can be used as collateral. And again, the basic idea is that the yield on a green bond in, in our model, and I think this is consistent with the data, will decrease if it is treated preferentially, so if it um, receives a lower central bank haircut. This will um, induce firms to increase their bond issuance because it's cheaper to do so, 
Um, they also will increase their capital, so their the real investment and, and, and this is the crucial point, also increase their leverage. And, and this will um, be the key argument, uh, actually, what, um, what we are going to um, follow in, in our paper. Oh. Okay, so in the model, the optimal collateral framework is just determined uh, by three things. Two of them are, are standard in the way um, central banks implement their monetary policy. So having a sufficient amount of collateral around there just facilitates monetary policy implementation. If, if there's no collateral, central banks cannot really do a lot because banks pledge collateral um, in, in return to get uh, central bank funding. So, so you need a sufficient amount of collateral supply to um, financial markets to work, actually. The... Second thing is um, an overly lenient collateral policy, so accepting practically every asset for and in a very extreme case, would induce risk taking on the financial on, on the corporate sector. This is consistent with uh, several empirical studies that have been um, uh, looked at how um, firms behaved uh, after um, the unconventional monetary policies of several central banks. So there is at some point um, uh, like a, a tipping point where increasing collateral supply might actually not really give a lot of benefits to banks because they might already be like saturated with collateral, but it would um, like misalign um, risk-taking incentives on, in the non-financial sector. So, so this is the, the, the core part of um, how collateral policy would be determined if it were not for the environment, right? So if the environmental externality is there, there is actually scope for preferential treatment precisely because uh, a lower haircut, for example, on, on a green bond would achieve a tilting, a, a change in the actual um, green investment share, to, to, to put it uh, bluntly. So, so this is kind of the trade-off we are deriving from the model and uh, that we are going to quantify. Um, and our quantification actually um, delivers, more, yeah, I, I don't know whether to call them modestly positive, or I, I think I leave that uh, um, interpretation open to, um, to the audience. So a very strong preferential treatment is quite powerful in changing the green investment share, but still less, and I mean a lot less effective than the optimal carbon tax. I think this is not very surprising, but it's still a point I think that is worth uh, making. And we can discuss how robust um, that result actually is, but this is what, what the model uh, would predict. Um, this policy, unfortunately, is not optimal because it violates the financial market trade-off I described uh, on the first slide. So if we just keep the, the conventional haircut constant and, and, and just remove the haircut on, on green firms or, or green bonds, uh, which is the same in our model, actually, um, we would, um, again, misalign incentives for risk-taking on the corporate side. We would have inefficiently large amount of collateral relative to the um, default risk on the private sector. So that would, under our baseline parameterization, actually even be a um, I mean, it would be very tiny welfare gain, actually, um, because this um, environmental policy conflicts with financial market objectives by the policymaker. So, I mean, I, I was saying that there are practically um, two, um, two effects that the um, preferential treatment balances. So we can also compute the optimal collateral framework just by doing um, standard macro-optimal policy, where we show that the optimal preferential treatment is less than what the central bank could maximally do. And in, in our baseline calibration, we come up with something which sounds quite realistic, um, uh, which would be a haircut gap of 20 percentage points, meaning um, an identical green firm would receive a 20 percentage point lower haircut than the conventional firm. This is, I think, a realistic ballpark. Um, and and yeah, this is what, what our model uh, would predict. Um, and then there is one qualitative point that is, um, I think, important to make. As soon as you can implement the optimal tax, which we arguably are not at the moment, but if you could do that, there is absolutely no scope for this preferential treatment. Why? Because the tax only affects the asset side of firms. It just makes investment in the, in the green sector more attractive than uh, in, in the conventional sector, but it doesn't change the financing margin, right? So, so the point here is these uh, preferential haircuts on bonds work through the leverage decision of firms. So, so bond issuance versus equity financing. And this is where the uh, efficiency losses of this policy qualitatively stem from, right? So as soon as you use the tax, there is no inefficiency, lo inefficiency loss on financial markets. So this is why I call this policy an imperfect substitute. So you would only need to do that if you cannot use the tax. So this is, I think, the, actually the, the key um, economic mechanism or the novelty that we, that we bring to the literature. 
Okay, in the interest of time, I have to uh, skip to literature and um, also be a bit quick on the model. It's going to be a bit messy, but I try to keep the mess uh, at, a, at a minimum. So lots of agents are just standard uh, in, in macro DSG, like the household. I'm not going to talk about it. It is completely standard. Um, we're going to have a um, final good firm. This um, is slightly augmented uh, to talk about environmental policy because we assume that it's combining two types of intermediate goods which we denote by ZG and ZC for green and conventional at prices PC and PG together with labor um, to produce a final good. So, so far so standard. Um, however, there is going to be, and this is the key externality, this one minus, um, this, oh, sorry. Hmm. This um, calligraphic P here, this is going to be the pollution externality, right? So, so the more greenhouse gases are around or the, the, the more pollution we, we observe, um, the lower the aggregate output of this final goods firm will be. So, so this is also standard in, in that strand of literature. And we assume that this pollution is um, depending on the um, stock of emissions, which is this calligraphic Z. And um, these emissions are only generated by the, um, by the conventional firm, right? So, so there is no production of the green firm entering there, just more conventional production means more pollution, and this has negative effects on, on the macroeconomy. Um, so yeah, this is following this um, canonical representation from Hoytel's Review of Economic Dynamics paper from 10 years ago. Okay. More interestingly, banks um, are modestly standard with, with slight extension, so they are going to invest into corporate bonds of both sectors, so BC and BG, at the price QC and, uh, and QG. Um, they will use corporate bonds as collateral to se settle some unmodeled liquidity deficit. You can microfound this, we do this in an extension, but for the baseline it, it doesn't really matter where this liquidity deficit comes from. The point is you need bonds to settle this. And um, we take the convenient shortcut we do often in the market, we just assume a cost function uh, that is decreasing with available collateral. So the available collateral in turn is given as the haircut, uh, haircut weighted value of corporate bonds outstanding. So this is just the um, corporate bond portfolio on um, banks' balance sheets and uh, each of the positions here, QCBC and QGBG, are um, weighted by 1 minus phi, where phi is the central bank haircut. And this can again be a type specific, so we assume the central bank perfectly observes who is green, who is not green, and um, can practically affect um, the willingness of, of banks to pay for these bonds because it can selectively uh, set these haircuts. So, um, as under standard prox uh, profit maximization, um, we can derive a first order condition for bond prices. R is the, the payoff of the bond. I'll uh, be more specific on that on the next slide. Um, the point is that the bond price is not only taking into account the financing conditions of banks, which would just be the deposit rate in, in that sense, but it also takes into account the collateral usability. So, since this thing here was negative, the overall expression here uh, will imply that Q tau, so the type specific bond price, goes up if the bond is usable as collateral. So in the extreme case, if I set the haircut to zero, for example, for the green firm, this would induce an increase in, in QG or other way around, it would uh, induce yields to decrease. So this positive um, wedge is then um, how the central bank can actually affect the, um, the allocation of investment in the economy. Okay, firms. Um, we'll, uh, I, I will use a very simplified exposition of the problem uh, for tractability reasons. We, we have a more general one in, in the quantitative analysis. So just assume there are two periods. We set interest rates to their long run value, which is just the household uh, discount rate. And then we uh, have a look at the conventional and green firms separately. Um, and I'm going to start with a default free benchmark which just assumes uh, firms can issue bonds as long as they will never default, so as long as dividends are always non-negative, uh, non right? And what does this mean? In the first period, the investment a firm can undertake is um, bound uh, by the amount of debt it can raise. And in the second period, um, debt still has to be lower than the um, production value of their assets. So we have linear production technology, so KT is just next period profits times the price tomorrow, net of the taxes. So, so that would be the, where the carbon tax kicks in in the model. Um, and if there are no default costs, you just level up to 100%. If you 
in this frictionless, or almost frictionless benchmark, um, do a preferential haircut policy, we can see that the return on investment, this is this um, Xi thing here, which uh, obtains from equating the cost of capital, normalized to one, to the expected return, um, is proportionally increasing in what the central bank does on the bond market, right? So if there would be no default frictions, um, there would be a one-for-one one increase in the investment return with, with the haircut. So, so that would be a nice situation. Um, yeah. Um, when we take corporate finance a bit more seriously and um, allow for default risk, and we do this by um, having this uh, uninsurable uh, productivity shock M here, as things get a bit more complicated. So um, I have to be a bit quick on the, on the details here. Um, so I'm going to skip, uh, skip this one and um, show quickly how this um, endogenous default risk changes the picture. So the firm now uh, will not optimally lever up to 100% because this is costly. So we will have an interior solution to lever, uh, oops, excuse me. Um, Ah, okay. We will have an interior solution to leverage, which is given by this uh, M bar here. Um, and what we can see, and, and this is, I mean, it's very uh, difficult to see this now uh, if I'm just showing this for, for 10 seconds, but if the haircut goes down, this will actually induce firms to lever up. So, so this M bar would go down if the um, haircut reduces, right? So, so the, the, this difference goes up and um, the right-hand side, uh, which uh, we make sure um, under standard assumption will also adjust. So if debt financing becomes cheaper relative to equity financing, um, firms will in, in, uh, increase their leverage ratio, which I think uh, makes a lot of sense. How does this affect um, investment? It still works, right? So, so still um, a lower haircut will increase the attractiveness of green investment relative to conventional investment. But there is some efficiency loss here because of the leverage ratio. So this is the key inequality here. The, the effect of collateral policy of haircuts on the return on investment is um, lower in the case where we allow for default than in the case without default. Um, this is different from carbon taxes because, again, carbon taxes do not affect the leverage choice. They just make the um, firm larger or smaller, but they, they keep the debt to uh, equity financing trade off uh, intact. Okay. Um, calibration is uh, we, we do our best uh, to, to um, have a, a serious um, calibration. So, environmental part is uh, relatively standard, financial markets also. Uh, and then we do a bunch of um, external validation checks, which I probably have to skip. Um, so the first one is we actually show that our model picks up um, macro moments both on the financial side, the, the real side, so the investment moments, and also actually the correlation of, of output and pollution um, very well. So these are not targeted, they are just um, uh, predictions by the model and uh, it, it looks um, fairly decent, I would say, for, for uh, such a relatively simple DS3 model. Um, what we then do, and this also actually goes uh, back to one of the questions that has been asked during the, the keynote speech, actually. How does the central bank, can, uh, how does it affect the greenium, right? So, so we actually collect data on green versus conventional bonds um, and check what happens after the ECB has announced their um, preferential policies back in 2019, 20, and 21. There, there were certain announcement dates around which we um, observe um, or after which we observe a substantial drop in green bonds rel relative to conventional bond yields. And what we can show is, and sorry for rushing through this, uh, that the, the data um, moment after I think 30 trading days is roughly consistent with what the model would predict. So we can have these announcement effects in the model as well. And I mean, the announcement was 2019 on 20. Um, and the model would predict like after four years, maybe we are roughly um, in line with um, um, so with what the data is telling us, which also makes sense, given that preferential treatment might be implemented like next year. So, so this four-year uh, announcement horizon is also kind of kind of plausible. So we view this as an, um, like additional a test that the model actually picks up, um, not something crazy, but something roughly consistent with um, how the data uh, look like. Um, 
Okay, I have to skip this and um, just walk you very quickly through the three um, numerical experiments we are running. I mentioned those on the first slide. The first one would be a very strong preferential treatment. Just keep the conventional haircut constant and treat all green bonds as if they were AAA rated. So we take the value from the ECB collateral framework and um, check what happens. Second one, compute optimal collateral policy. So vary both of them at the same time. I show you on uh, the, the numbers on the next slide, and the third uh, experiment would be um, let, let the Pigouvian tax also move uh, freely. So we set it actually to zero. So we assume there is no fiscal uh, measure to um, to address the climate externality. And how the look, uh, results look like is that it indeed increases welfare to do this uh, strong preferential treatment, not a lot actually. Optimally, you have here this 20 percentage point haircut gap. So if you allow both of them to vary freely, this is the, the baseline value from the ECB and, and this is the, the AAA value. Um, and, and this is what our model predicts would be the optimal value. Um, yeah, those are just too many numbers to, uh, to discuss them in detail now. Um, in contrast, the optimal tax, and, and don't be, uh, th that has to be taken with a pinch of salt because the welfare um, effect on removing or optimally addressing the preferential treatment is a bit too small because, I mean, we work in a, um, in a DS2E model that does not take into account stuff like tipping points. So all of the numbers are relatively small. We, we added a bunch of extensions where we also have more drastic welfare effects of, of climate change. Uh, and the point is here always, this ratio, the, the relative welfare gain of the optimal collateral policy Relative, yeah, relative to the optimal tax, there is always this factor of roughly 100, right? So if you make the um, tax much higher, you would also get a, a much higher um, optimal haircut gap, but still the, the relative gain of this collateral policy is always a lot smaller. Okay, um, that I will um, skip, and I think I should conclude because I'm out of time. Um, so... I mean, I said all of this um, several times already, so let's, uh, let me not uh, repeat all this and just um, thank you for your attention and to open the floor for discussion. <coughs> Thanks. Okay, thank you, Matthias. <laughs> Almost in due time. Okay, thanks for this presentation. It's now time for the questions in the room. Do we have some questions? So I remind you that you have some micros in your chair, if you need it, on the left, and we have also Others here. Okay, it's better like this. Okay, I'll do that. Okay, no question right now. Let me check if we have some questions online. Not yet. Okay, um, well, I'll have some questions then. Sure. Um, so first of all, thanks for this presentation and this model, which is really interesting. I liked the model and uh, what was a bit difficult for me, just because it was the first presentation, mm -hmm. is to make the distinction between what is dynamic in the model and what is static. Mm -hmm. The way I understood it, um, the premium were dynamic. But um, my question was about default rates. Probably it, we were in a static framework according to this kind of questions? Um, okay, so the policies, when, when it comes to the preferential policies and also the environmental tax, um, they are all long run things, right? So they in the model, they vary with the business cycle, but this doesn't really matter because the cyclical variations of default risk are kind of, um, it doesn't, uh, so, so, so green and conventional default risk almost correlates one for one. So, so what matters are the long run policies. So, so we have um, in, in the model um, second moments that look plausible, but they don't really affect the um, degree of preferential treatment. So you could, for example, add a lot of other shocks, make everything more volatile. But what matters for this specific problem, because it's a long run, externality and also then a question on how to allocate capital in the long run. It's about long run policy. So the, the haircut was uh, time invarying, but it, it doesn't really make such a difference to to allow that to be time varying. Okay, yeah. thank you. Do we have, oh yes, we have one question. Let me go to you because you, you'll need the mic. Uh, do you hear me here? Thank you. Well, for, for the person online, we prefer you to have the mic, sorry. Thank you. Um, I might have missed it from your presentation, which was very interesting. I didn't understand exactly 
how this capital accumulation works in the sense that you have investment, but um, do you accumulate capital? Do you have like green capital and, mm -hmm. and non-green capital or is your financing going towards something else? No, it's, um, this is one of the simplifications I was already mentioned or alluding to in the beginning. We have no switching of technologies or something. There are, is a set of firms that is always green and a set of firms that is always dirty. And they accumulate capital subject to this default risk um, that they have. But um, there is no switching or something which might change to some extent the, uh, the, the optimal results, right? So, so if you allow for switching, you might want to have um, like, like uh, I don't know, a subsidy for switching or some other fiscal instruments against. We would have to benchmark what, what we have here, um, but we refrain from doing so to keep the comparison clean on something affecting the asset side versus something uh, affecting the financing side and not so much the, the composition. So, so this is shut off completely throughout the analysis. Uh, okay, yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. I have a question online, so if you don't mind, I will read it to you. Yeah, sure. This is a question about the collateral premium for bonds mm -hmm. um, from Daniel Gibas, who says that it seems to me that it is essential for the model dynamics to work as presented, that there is a collateral premium for bonds. Yeah. The question is now, is this a realistic assumption in a world where a central bank face significant structural excess liquidity? Uh, which may actually diminish the collateral premium, if it really exists. Yeah. So, um, the data say that there is a collateral premium, right? So, all the empirical work that I have uh, had to skip practically uh, on our quantification of the collateral was based actually on um, policy changes by the ECB in uh, where they exchanged liquidity for bonds, right? So, to actually, for example, participate in a long-term refinancing operation, you need collateral to participate, right? So, so um, it's not that you can argue that um, just because banks accumulate a lot of reserves, there is no agent in the economy that needs collateral. So, so actually, even to get this liquidity, um, banks need to pledge stuff. And, and this was, um, at least to some extent, um, bonds, right? So this, um, the, the data, and um, I, I think most of the models on, on that that I know predict that, um, or the data say actually that they are still sizable collateral premia even under this ample reserves regime. Okay, thank you very much, Thomas. It's now time now yeah, to sure. to thank you first of all for this presentation. <laughs> And I will now ask to Gong to come with us and present his paper about building portfolio of sovereign securities with decreasing carbon footprint. Could you please put the, the slide of Gong? Thank you. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And first of all, uh, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me and also for me to be here in person to participate in this wonderful uh, research uh, conference. And so here I, I'm going to present my work uh, on building portfolios of sovereign securities with decreasing carbon footprints. So this is an BIS working paper and it is a joint work uh, with Benoit Mojon. Uh, from the, from uh, the Inter Bank for International Settlements and uh, Eric Rondeau from University of Lausanne. And both of them are also present online. So if you are interested in our work, you can, of course, download our um, paper um, by scanning uh, the QR code. Before I start, so I only have one disclaimer, which is the views I'm presenting here are uh, those of the author and do, authors and do not represent the views of the BAS. So to set out actually the uh, roadmap for my presentation, so I'm going to walk you through uh, in the introduction uh, the motivation for our research uh, and this, especially the research question and our contributions uh, to the literature. And then uh, in the second phase, I'm going to walk you through the data request actually for to run the strategy uh, we are designing uh, for a net zero portfolio and the methodology behind. Uh, and the third step is to show you some quantitative analysis from our strategy to build a net zero portfolio of sovereign securities. And here I'm going to present actually two different approaches. One is a uh, unconstrained baseline approach. Uh, the second one is a constrained approach uh, to, um, to build this net zero 
portfolio. Uh, and then I will conclude. So in terms of the motivation, I think uh, we have all listened to Professor uh, Galina Hill this morning. Actually, the core question, the fundamental question we are all facing, uh, regardless of countries and economic sectors, is we are facing the global warming. And the carbon intensity reduction is urgently needed to achieve the objective of keeping global warming under 1.5 degrees uh, by the end of the century. And for that, according to uh, the UN statistics uh, and also based on the Paris Agreement, uh, we need to reduce uh, carbon emissions uh, by 45% by 2030 uh, in order to reach net zero by 2050. Uh, and as uh, Gardena said this morning, actually different countries and also different sectors should participate in this collective action. And especially finance where investors could provide some incentives to accelerate this net zero transition. And this is what I'm referring to uh, in the uh, keynote speech uh, this morning about these in investors' preferences during this uh, net zero transition. So we already see that many private initiatives uh, have proposed the solutions uh, for like uh, investors to um, align their portfolios of corporate securities, um, mostly uh, stocks and also corporate debts to these net zero objectives. But little has been done actually uh, with regard to uh, investors' portfolios of sovereign securities. On the other hand, sovereign bonds represent uh, one of the largest asset classes, and also this is a significant percentage uh, of uh, diversified investment portfolios, especially uh, on sovereign securities, especially among institutional investors. So we think that it is timely to think about how to green or uh, to align portfolios of sovereign securities uh, towards the Paris Agreement of net zero. However, many questions are still pending, uh, especially as regards how to measure sovereign issuers' carbon intensity. And also we need to uh, deal with uh, the financial and macro implications of a potential rebalancing of sovereign security um, portfolios. So this is what we are proposing in this research work. So we try to answer the question whether it is possible for, inst inst for investors to design strategy uh, which reallocates uh, their sovereign assets um, based on the criteria of net zero to achieve a portfolio with decreasing carbon footprints. At the same time, which is also very important, we also want to ensure investors that the financial performance of this net zero portfolio wouldn't be uh, uh, affected, negatively affected. So our work is closely related to three strands of literature. The first one is on carbon disclosure and uh, carbon intensity measures. So as I have mentioned, it's still quite uh, a, there is a heated debate about how to measure or aggregate a carbon intensity or carbon emissions first at the country level. So we face uh, in, in data collection, for instance, the questions we have always asked is about like double accounting and also also whether uh, um, we can find carbon emissions as per GDP components. Also, country coverage is another issue often uh, we are facing uh, in our uh, research endeavor. And this is also very much discussed in the literature. The second strand of literature uh, to which our work is related uh, concerns climate risks and portfolio management. Here, there are already some strategies that have being proposed, uh, I cited a few papers here, as regard how to green or decarbonize portfolios of corporate securities, uh, mostly stocks and um, corporate debt. For instance, strat strategies include uh, by excluding the most polluting industries, sectors, or if this is not possible, so, uh, so strategies also consist of excluding the most polluting firms uh, in a given uh, industry without changing the industrial or sectoral allocation. For instance, my uh, co-author, um, Ehi Zhongdu and Benoit Merong uh, have also another paper uh, in 2021 on corporate securities. 
The third strand of literature uh, is about the impact of climate risks on sovereign debt. And, and here, um, of course, uh, this morning uh, in the keynote speech, uh, it was mentioned the physical risks on sovereign debt. But more and more, if investors uh, are shifting their investment preferences, there could be increasing transition, transition risks to sovereign debt issuers as well. And this is uh, the area actually our research aims to contribute. So with this strategy uh, of uh, decarbonization of sovereign uh, portfolios of sovereign securities. So now let me present uh, very briefly uh, the uh, framework uh, we are using to design this net zero um, portfolio. And then I'm going to uh, discuss a bit what kind of data we are uh, using to construct this net zero portfolio. So graphically speaking, we start with a benchmark uh, portfolio of sovereign securities. So here is represented actually a, um, a benchmark portfolio uh, consisting of sovereign securities from advanced economies, but also from emerging market economies. And then our strategy consists of doing actually a optimization uh, exercise along two dimensions. So the first dimension uh, is about the environmental objectives. So for instance, we can set a target of a 10% carbon intensity reduction per year uh, for a given number of years, say five years. This is our baseline scenario. The second dimension is about the financial performance. So for the object, objective one, of course, this would consist of changing country weights within this portfolio in order to achieve this 10% carbon intensity reduction per year. And then there is another dimension which consists of saying we need to keep the financial performance in terms of re financial returns of our net zero portfolio as close as possible to the benchmark uh, portfolio. Just think about our net zero portfolio as an index fund. So we want to track uh, the financial performance of the benchmark uh, index. So within the, the, then we need to have some metrics and optimization uh, solutions in order to uh, um, optimize or to construct this net zero portfolio. So under the dimension, the first dimension, we need to come up with metrics that measure carbon intensity uh, such that we can calculate the reduction. So commonly I use the two uh, metrics. One is uh, the CO2 emissions uh, production of is, is through the production processes divided by GDP. And then the second one is uh, the CO2 uh, emissions uh, in terms of consumption divided by the population uh, in the country. I'm going to talk about these two metrics um, in the next slide. On the other dimension, so in terms of uh, keeping financial performance. So we are using the standard uh, optimization um, metrics uh, in the finance literature. So either to minimize active weights or active shares uh, of the um, uh, component countries in the portfolio, or we minimize the tracking error uh, volatility. This is the, the two uh, methods we are using to achieve, um, uh, to meet with this second objective in terms of financial returns. And of course, we can also add additional constraints uh, in terms of, for instance, credit rating uh, of the overall uh, um, portfolio and other conditions uh, that I'm going to um, present uh, later on in my presentation. So with this being said, the first set of data we are using that we need to construct the net zero portfolio is to have a benchmark portfolio of sovereign securities. When you think about the, uh, in, in the market, actually, there are many indices uh, available uh, to provide this benchmark. And we choose this JP Morgan uh, government bond index for advanced economies and JP Morgan emerging market indices for uh, the emerging market uh, economies. So this is one um, possible index to use from the markets to construct this benchmark for portfolio. You can, of course, use other benchmarks such as S&P and uh, MSCI indices. So why we are using JP Morgan indices? This is because uh, those indices give us quite detailed country weights uh, in the, to construct this uh, benchmark, uh, such, as, such that we can compare uh, carbon emission reduction and the financial performance of our net zero portfolio with the benchmark. 
And so in our benchmark, we have 13 advanced economies that you can see their weights uh, on the um, left hand panel. So the 13 advanced economies represent 90%, more than 90% uh, of the benchmark portfolio. And then we have 21 emerging market economies. Uh, they represent 9.4% 9, 9 of the benchmark. This also reflects a bit uh, the current practice in the market. So uh, the, the, the majority of sovereign securities uh, that are high quality uh, uh, sovereign securities come from advanced economies. All the government bonds we talk about in this exercise are uh, labeled, uh, denominated in local currencies, and then converted into uh, US dollars. Uh, and JP Morgan provides the two versions of uh, those um, uh, numbers in hedged and, hedged and versus non-hedged. And here we can address, using these two versions, we can address uh, the impact on uh, exchange rates and also the fixed income markets very much hedged. This is one fact I want to point out. The second set of data we, are, uh, we need for our exercise, of course, concerns the carbon intensity metrics. So how to calculate? Uh, so first, we need to retrieve data on carbon emissions at a country level. Second is to cal cal calculate carbon intensity. So our CO2 uh, emission data come from uh, SMP, uh, True Cost Sovereign Environmental Database. Uh, alternative data could also be used, and we are using uh, true cost data because uh, there is a large number of countries included, and also we have a GD GDP decomposition. So we know uh, the carbon emissions coming from domestic consumption, domestic production, from exports and imports. This drives me to uh, this critical distinction between a consumption-based uh, carbon intensity metric versus a production-based metric. So as you can see here are the two uh, flowcharts. On the left uh, is the calculation that we are using in our baseline analysis. So we take from the true cost the data, a data set domestic consumption. So all the uh, so CO2s emitted from uh, consumption within a country, plus all the CO2 emissions uh, emitted from all the imported goods. Then as we talk about consumption, so we scale it by total population in the country. So consumptions are associated with the consumption, uh, emissions are associated with the consumption uh, of a country's population. This is very important because uh, we, uh, we, we, our baseline scenario uses this metric because we think that consumption-based metric can address the issue of carbon leakage. Because especially in advanced economies, a lot of consumption come from imported goods, which could contain a stronger or larger share of carbon emissions. And also with economic development, we also see that uh, among uh, emerging market economies. So the, actually the carbon footprint intensity increases in terms of per capita um, consumption. An alternative way is to calculate uh, the production-based carbon emission. So from production plus everything a country exports to the rest of the world. And here uh, the metric, the intensity is calculated in terms of uh, the per million uh, US dollar GDP term. I just want to give you actually a, a visual representation of these two uh, distinct uh, metrics. On the top, the two panels represent the consumption-based carbon intensity for uh, advanced economies on the left-hand side and for um, the emerging market economies on the left-hand side. And then uh, at the bottom, you have the two charts for the production-based um, carbon intensity uh, metrics. So I'm going to focus on the first two. So on the top, the consumption based carbon intensity uh, metric because this is our the result the baseline result I'm going to present uh, in this um, presentation so you can see that in terms of consumption based carbon intensity advanced economies have a a, I mean, have a very strong um, uh, high number. So in average, uh, as you can see uh, through these two horizontal lines, uh, in blue is the average number for, uh, in terms of carbon intensity uh, for from advanced economies in 2015. And then the red line represents the average in the portfolio uh, for advanced economies uh, at the end of 2020. So you can see that the level is much higher in advanced economies uh, than in emerging market 
economies. But one thing I want to point out is advanced economies have also um, made a significant effort to reduce their carbon intensity between 2015, uh, end of 2015 and end of 2020, because you can see that they, there's a downward shift from uh, the blue horizontal line to the dashed red horizontal line. So from basically six, uh, around the 16 uh, tons um, per capita to um, around uh, 14 uh, tons, so there is a significant reduction. However, we don't we don't see this reduction for uh, the subsample um, of emerging market economies. Then, just a word on the portfolio optimization. Uh, so, from the f the second dimension on the financial returns. So, uh, as I explained, we use we you can use two minimize uh, optimization methods. And here, uh, just very brief briefly, active share minimization is to minimize the difference between the weights uh, in our net zero portfolio uh, and in the benchmark uh, portfolio for a. Um, given for a given country. So the alpha P represents the share of a given country I in our net zero portfolio. Uh, and the alpha ITB is its share in the uh, benchmark. So you can see that the optimization, optimization consists to minimize the difference, uh, any changes between uh, the weights of the country in our net zero portfolio relative to the benchmark. And the second metric is in terms of tracing, uh, tracking error volatility. So this is actually to um, minimize the volatility of the difference between the performance of, an, of our net zero portfolio relative to um, the benchmark. And in the following uh, results that I'm going to present to you in the next slides, uh, I focus on the results using uh, active share minimization. One more minute. Okay, sure. Um, so let's go to uh, the um, results. So graphically speaking, so you can see that, uh, so this is net, our net zero portfolio versus our uh, the, the benchmark. The blue dash line represents, the horizontal blue dash line represents the benchmark uh, uh, carbon intensity at the end of 2015 uh, for the benchmark portfolio. And the level is around 16.5 tons of CO2 per capita. As I demonstrated, advanced economies have in any case done an effort to reduce carbon intensity uh, in their countries. So without doing anything, uh, the benchmark uh, portfolio could achieve a 14% carbon re intensity reduction over five years without any uh, changes in uh, country weights. However, what we are arguing here is our net zero portfolio could do much better, which is this black, uh, black line. So with the objective of 10% carbon intensity reduction per year, we can achieve a 14 uh, for a 41% 40, cumulative uh, carbon intensity reduction over uh, five years. So the difference between uh, the benchmark and net zero portfolio is very large. Of course, investors could build a portfolio with a different targets, and we are showing a lower uh, target of 5%. The portfolio could still achieve 23% uh, carbon intensity reduction over five years. Financially speaking, actually, the returns are very similar between the net zero portfolio and uh, the benchmark with a bit higher volatility. So, in the time limit, I just want to uh, tell you that the decarbonization was achieved, this 41% carbon intensity reduction is achieved through very radical country weight changes. So here we can see that the United States, for instance, its weight is reduced from 37% to 20% in our exercise. Well, Denmark and Sweden, those small uh, open economies, actually the weights are in have been increased a lot, so four times for Denmark and 12 times for Sweden. Similar uh, things could be, ob be observed for emerging market economies. So here people may wonder, 
uh, this is quite radical, and this is unconstrained, right? The un unconstrained approach. So there are operational and also macro financial risks to this unconstrained uh, approach. It is because some countries like Sweden and Denmark probably they are uh, unable to meet the increased demand from the market, and also we are still quite difficult to, there are difficulties for investors to move away from dollar-based assets. And the huge uh, country weight rebalancing could also entail macro financial risks in terms of exchange rates, for instance. This is why we do a second exercise with a, a few constraints, especially in terms of country weights. So we say, we can't change the country, increase or decrease the country weights by more than 50%. Uh, in the portfolio to avoid the radical counterweight shifts. And this is what you see. Uh, actually, this is uh, the last two um, before um, the, the second two last slides of my presentation. So for this unconstrained approach, you can see that we can still achieve a quite good uh, decarbonization uh, compared with the 10% uh, carbon intensity reduction objective compared with this horizontal line with this uh, rose line, which represents the benchmark um, scenario. However, you also notice that we can no longer achieve the 41% carbon intensity reduction, given that we are under uh, constraints. So the portfolio could achieve 30% reduction over five years. This is because uh, the, um, uh, basically the, the rebalancing is milder and we are shifting weights towards large economies which are situated with a mid-range carbon intensity. So, he, uh, so here in the, uh, in, um, in the advanced economy portfolio, you can see Germany is a beneficiary country from this constrained approach of our net zero analysis. So, uh, without further ado, uh, so the, just maybe just to mention that the follow-up work is for us to uh, endogenize the price taking, the pricing effects, because here you t we sh I should say that investors are price takers. Maybe this is typical investor, uh, institutional investor. So we are actually endogenize the pricing uh, mechanism uh, in a follow-up work to analyze the macro financial implications of this net zero strategy. And then the second point is uh, for us to better embed uh, climate ambitions in our analysis, because until now we are using historical data without the in a country's efforts, uh, forward-looking efforts in decarbonization. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Gong. We will now take quickly some questions from the room because we are running, running a little bit late. Two minutes, yeah, two questions. Okay, um, yes, please, the microphone. Could you please present yourself each time you have a question? It's nice for everybody to know who is asking. Shall I go first? Okay, I'm first? Carmelo Saleo, European Central Bank. Um, an observation first in your definition of consumption-based, I wonder why you're not taking out exports and your production base, why you're not adding in exports there, uh, subtracting the other one. I mean, you, you put in imports, but you should subtract exports and vice versa. Uh, and then I have a question, why are you doing this uh, per capita? I mean, I, I understand the politics of it, but in the end, uh, if we're using the per capita result, we get into strange situations. If the Czech Republic were to go magically to zero, it was the highest one, the consumption-based thing, that wouldn't change anything in the world. And the production in South Africa was the biggest one in emerging markets. You bring it down to zero, nothing changes. This should be done on an absolute basis, and then you would also lose this effect of the small countries where we should be overweighting Denmark and Sweden and things like this. Sure, thank you very much. So uh, very br briefly, uh, in our consumption-based uh, metric of uh, carbon intensity, actually we take out exports, we include imports. So it basically consumption, which is uh, based on domestic production, domestic production consumed within the country, plus everything we consume from abroad. So 
through imports. Versus production actually is everything which is product, uh, produced within the country plus, uh, so, and consumed within the country plus everything uh, which we, I mean, the country produced but exported. So this is just a by definition. Um, and then, so, uh, of course, there is a debate on which metric to use and especially uh, things should be in absolute terms per capita or per million and dollars of GDP. Uh, so our choice here in our baseline is uh, somewhat arbitrary and we run actually alternative analysis in the uh, annex of our paper to show if we change metric uh, what would be happening. Uh, but for investors, actually, they still need a comparable uh, index or way of thinking in order to think about their portfolios. So rarely, actually, they uh, reason in terms of the absolute terms. So we need to actually convert carbon emissions uh, into carbon either carbon footprint or carbon in, uh, emission intensity uh, for comparative um, purposes. I stop there. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Since we are running out of time, I have a question online that I will transform into a remark. Okay, thank you very this much. This is really interesting. Uh, this is a, a remark by Noemi Berger, who said that when you look at your graphs with the consumption-based uh, uh, metrics for uh, each um, country, you have figures for 2020, and there might be a bias regarding the COVID that makes the consumption-based metrics, uh, or even the production one, lower than, than the reality. Mm. Well taken, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Gong. And I'm now calling um, my Mirko, Marco. Yeah. I don't know how, Mirko, okay, thank you. Hello, everybody. So thank you for accepting uh, our paper uh, at this conference. So actually, Emanuele Kini, my, my PhD student, uh, was supposed to come, but he couldn't make it. So that, that's why I'm here. Uh, Ede, uh, Emanuele is with the EDEC Risk Climate Impact Institute, uh, which I thank a lot because since when uh, Emanuele joined them, uh, they gave him a lot of time and resources to really uh, improve the draftest version that we submitted to this conference and now it is looking a uh, much better paper than we submitted so let me tell you what we do uh, so uh, I'm an econometrician uh, never really worked uh, in green finance uh, I do most of my applications uh, of my fancy econometric tools in, in asset pricing and, you know, as many of you, I started to take part to conferences and especially I remember when I was a PhD student uh, six, seven years ago, I came to a conference just about risk uh, organized by the Institute Louis Bachelier and it was a plenary talk. Someone was starting to think about climate risk and the typical question from the audience, which was mainly French econometricians, European econometricians, people working in finance. The typical question was, but why do we care about this risk? Is there Anything new with respect to what we already know? Uh, do investors care about this risk? Uh, exactly as Natalie was mentioning in the uh, introductory talk to this conference, it's not even clear if investors uh, price these risks, also as Galina mentioned. And it seems that the evidence is there that some of these risks, like environmental risk, climate risk, are priced, but uh, if something is priced, the risk premium that we can get are very small. So I took, uh, we, we took the point of view of an econometrician who comes with a set of large returns, uh, as people now surprising do, a set of explanatory variables, large set of explanatory variables. In finance now we talk about the factor zoo, we talk about 400 factors derived by sorting individual portfolios according to what we call in this paper financial characteristics like size, book to market, accruals, past returns. And we have methodologies developed in the last five years, especially and published in top finance journals, which allows us to, to, to disentangle, to put order into this factor zoo of financial factors, what we call financial factors in this paper. And now all of you guys, all the guys mentioned by Galina in her, in her uh, plenary talk, uh, came up with new measures or new proxies of environmental risk that should be reflected if these are risk, risks which are priced into the return of assets. And so in my point of view, 
Now we are at the stage where we have a new zoo, a green zoo of factors, explanatory variables that we want to throw in into our model and see if they're priced or not. Now, my field of expertise is to uh, make this model work. And so I just, I want to let the data speak if I use a large set of financial characteristics and a large set of what I call in this paper environmental. Sometimes I use green, I'm very sloppy. So every time I say green, think about environmental characteristics. I don't want to assign, assign ex ante to, uh, you know, uh, positive or negative uh, emissions or environmental scores. I don't want to assign ex ante, assign to the type of effect that these uh, uh, individual company environmental characteristics have on returns. So when I say green, think about brown, I'm uh, agnostic ex ante. So question is, using a state-of-the-art econometric model when, with a large set of financial characteristics, which is what we have been using in asset pricing in the last 40 years, uh, plus a large set of environmental characteristics. So when we control for environmental characteristics of individual companies, when we control for financial characteristics of the companies and we add environmental characteristics to our standard asset pricing model, do these environmental characteristics matter to explain returns? By explaining, I mean explaining both the time series variation risk and the average of returns, so risk premium. So I will look at these two aspects. Uh, if so, which characteristics and in which way? Uh, so these are the two questions I'm trying to, to, to answer. We are trying to answer. So I don't need to, to explain uh, to this audience that you know, there's tons of research uh, on this topic. Um, the two main ways to see if environmental risk is priced uh, in, in I, in my paper, we, in this paper, we look at stock returns, but in all asset classes are. One, you build long short portfolios of uh, companies by sorting companies according to some environmental metric, like emissions, for instance. And then you use this portfolio either as a risk factor in a standard linear factor model, and you see if that is priced or not, or you think about this portfolio as the only test asset you care, and then you run a regression of standard risk factors, and you see if standard risk factors explain it, and if there is an alpha. The other way of checking or testing if environmental characteristics are priced in the cross-section of asset returns, of stock returns especially, is just to run panel regressions where you have a large panel of individual returns, individual by individual company returns, time t plus one, and you regress it on past values of characteristics, uh, like the two papers in the JFE and the JF by Bolton and Kapczewski. Uh, and they find that uh, emissions are able to predict returns. So these are the two ways in which finance uh, people have tried to see if um, environmental characteristics can be emissions, can be E-score, can be ESG scores are priced or not. Uh, there is some, uh, some findings related to agrinium, as Galina was mentioned, mentioning, but if anything, this agrinium is small, fully agree with Galina, and at the end of the day, we will find this, but in a completely machine learning way, if you want, or fancy linear asset pricing model. Uh, and I can tell you that what Galina mentioned maybe is there for, uh, for, for, for emissions as measured as carbon intensity, but I also have a paper where I try to improve the measures of emissions uh, that Bolton and Coulter work. So we reconstruct the true cost data set, if you want, using a new model, and we find opposite results. So it's not even clear if uh, characteristic, environmental characteristics define in the same way uh, a priori, but then measure in a different way have the same effect on returns. And this is the trend of literature on the aggregate confusion started by Roberto Rigobon and all these Coulters. With our model, we can, we can, so these models, the model I will show you, can put order on all these things because we let the data speak on which type of characteristic matter or doesn't matter to explain stock returns and it will also tell you in which way. So, uh, yeah, so this is literature, uh, you know it. Oh, but there is one thing. Uh, uh, try to go back. Yes, there is another thing. Uh, a lot of the papers that Galina mentioned and many asset pricing papers try to see the effect of environmental characteristics on returns, try to control 
for the user factors or the user characteristics or the user predictor of returns that we know from finance. But in order to do this exercise, often these papers use very uh, simple methodologies. They take a stand on the few reasonable, reasonable uh, financial factors or financial characteristics that should explain or predict returns. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we are able to deal with a large set of characteristics, uh, financial characteristics, so we are able to deal with a large set of controls, so we don't need to take an a priori stand on which a set of controls we, we use it. And why is this an important question? Because uh, especially in the last three to four years, there has been a huge amount of research showing that environmental characteristics like emissions or ratings are very much related to uh, what I call financial characteristics like size, and so on and so forth. For instance, Aswani uh, and co-authors in 2022 just say that what, uh, what um, Bolton, find, the Bolton and Kapczewski find in their previous paper uh, may not hold true if you change the measure of emissions. When you rescale emissions by revenue, so you go to carbon intensity, all the Bolton most of the Bolton results don't hold anymore. So this is a way to control for kind of financial characteristics where you want to see if a green characteristic and environmental characteristic like emission explain returns or not. So our methodology is able to account for any possible effect. Uh, actually, we want to disentangle the effect of financial characteristics from the one of environmental characteristics on asset returns. Uh, and so we, we will say something about this. Okay, so uh, maybe let me go directly to the model. Uh, and then I'll tell you that we are not the first people to use this, uh, but let me first tell you the model. So our model for returns uh, is a linear factor models for a large panels of the returns. We are looking at individual stocks. So we have a large panel of US stocks, okay? We have in mind that there are some factors which can be interpreted as the usual financial factor, like the FAM and French portfolio size, book to market momentum. And the betas of these factors are related to uh, some characteristics that we call financial characteristics. So this is a linear model with time varying loadings and the loadings are a linear function of size, book to market and uh, all the financial characteristics that uh, we found in finance. And then I want to see if I add a new piece of this model, so a new linear part of this model where I still have some betas which are function of some characteristics multiplied by some factors. Uh, if this new part adds something on top of the part that we know from finance, so uh, standard financial factors. So what is this new part? Okay, linear part, betas, which are a linear function of green characteristics or environmental characteristics, so potentially time-varying betas, and some factors which can, be, which can be interpreted as environmental factors. Why am I saying so? Because it turns out that if you define a model in this way, uh, where uh, you are agnostic about which are the factors, and the only thing that you know is which type of characteristics you have inside size, book to market, momentum, and so on. And here you put green characteristics like emissions, environmental scores, and so on. It turns out that as we allow the factors to be latent, so we don't impose the factors ex ante, but the way you estimate this model ex post, you can interpret the factors as only linear combinations of stocks sorting them on financial characteristics, like you get exposed from the estimation of these models factors, which can be interpreted as a size and book to market factor, so on and so forth. But we are also able, when I add this new part, to interpret the new factors, which load only on green characteristics as portfolios, which are linear combination of the stocks where I sort all individual stocks in my large cross section according to their what I call green or environmental characteristics. Actually, the model will tell me which factors explain most of the returns, a factor which I call green factor, and which combination of stocks done according to sorting them on green characteristics, so which portfolio of stocks obtained by sorting them on green characteristics, and which green characteristics matter more to explain stock returns. So I get the factors ex post. My methodology doesn't impose the factor. So it could be that the loadings to these green factors, so this portfolio doesn't exist in a sense that there is no green factor or environmental factor which explains returns, which would mean that uh, after controlling from everything we know from finance, there is no new information uh, in the set of green characteristics which I consider, like uh, environmental scores or emissions, 
by new information, I mean information which allows me to explain the returns more than what we already know from uh, standard finance models. And that's actually what we find, but uh, actually, well, let me go to the results. Uh, yeah, so actually, what do we find if I don't make it to the end? Uh, let me go back. Okay, so uh, is there, so with our fancy model, can we find a, a factor uh, which is only related to uh, green characteristics? Uh, emissions, environmental scores, which explains returns on top of what we already know from finance. And the answer seems to be uh, almost no. Sorry, this is kind of slow in replying to me. Almost there. No. Okay, so I need to be harder. So, uh, do we find a pervasive factor which can be constructed from green characteristics which explains uh, returns? No, we can only find a factor which explain, constructed from green characteristic, which explains only returns from a subset of stocks, which are the stocks, the stocks in the oil and, uh, and utilities. Okay, so in the jargon of financial literature, this factor would be called a weak factor. So it's a factor which affects only a subset of stocks, all the other stocks, when you control for factors that we already know from finance, are not explained at all by any factor which is related to, to, to environmental data. Okay, um, so we so we find this what we call weak factor. Okay, which explains some part of the time series variation in the premium of only of oil and utilities. But we get these factors exposed. Okay, not exempted. And which characteristics uh, matter more to construct this factor is just sectorial carbon intensity and emission scores, uh, sectorial carbon intensity and emission scores. Uh, so the model, yeah, these are the details of the model, but I gave you the main idea. So uh, in the interest of time, let me move forward. Uh, I mean, to, do, to, to, to be able to interpret this factor as a pure green factor, and to disentangle it from financial factors that we know from finance, uh, I need to innovate in the way these models, with these linear factor models with latent, with, uh, latent factors and time varying loadings are estimated. So the original model that I presented before uh, has been proposed by Kelly, Pruitt and Sue in the JFE paper. They also have a set of um, paper supplying this methodology. Uh, there is also in this paper that we have with, with Emanuele uh, an additional econometric innovation where I want to keep the two factors separate, what is separate in our model, orthogonal. So the factors I will have, the green factor that I will be able to, be, to estimate is by construction orthogonal to factors which come from uh, financial characteristics. So you you will not have this uh, uncertainty in the interpretation in the sense that this factor will also be correlated to size of book to market and you tell me, oh, you call this a green factor, but actually it's only a size factor, simply because uh, only big companies have ESG ratings and small companies don't have it and so on and so forth. So my factor is um, free from all these type of discussions by construction and to do this, I needed to, we needed to have an, a, a, an econometric innovation to the original model proposed by Kelly Pruitt and Sue. But let me skip the econometric details and uh, let me go to, uh, oh, let me say two words about the data. So we have a large, sorry, we have a large panel of individual stocks, okay, US companies uh, from July 2018, December 2021, so monthly returns. By What I mean by financial characteristics is what we believe in finance to be good predictors of stock returns, like total asset, book to market, investment size, turnover, beta. So uh, this, this, all these financial characteristics are what is considered state-of-the-art predictors of stock returns. And then I want to see if I add on top of these characteristics a set of environmental Characteristics meaning ESG score from MSCI and ICON, E score only from MSCI and ICON. Uh, the weights of the MSCI uh, of the E score into the MSCI ESG score, sector carbon intensity, adjusted, adjusted carbon intensity uh, from ICON. Uh, these are this is my set of environmental characteristics. Why these sets uh, and no more? Because I to estimate the model, I need to have. 
uh, a long enough time series and a large enough cross-section of characteristics. If I add more uh, characteristics, the risk is that in all these widely used data sets, uh, you have very few stocks with observations for those environmental characteristics. So I selected only the environmental data, if you want, which have a long enough time series and a large enough cross-section. So I have a few thousands of stocks in my sample which are, uh, we, we, for which I have data. Um, we know uh, that from the literature that some environmental characteristics like emissions are related to financial uh, characteristics like revenues. Okay, so we orthogonalize by running cross-sectional regressions all our environmental characteristics on uh, fin the financial characteristics that you've seen before. So we have a set of uh, environmental characteristics which are by construction orthogonal, so independent if you want. To the, uh, to the financial ones. And so every time I will speak about the effect on the environmental data on the factor uh, or on the returns through the factors, it will be uh, really the pure effect of the ESG score on top of uh, what we already know from finance. So, so main results uh, well, we take five financial factors. Okay, why five? Because in finance, we believe that. I mean, Five factors should be enough to explain uh, the, 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 the cross-section of stock returns, and we only impose one green factor, okay? So you can think about this as the factor which explains the most of the returns on top of the five financial factors selected by the model. The five financial factors will be very similar to the five factors of Farm and French plus some momentum or combination of these, so, uh, but they come out exposed from our model. We don't impose them ex ante. And these are the loadings, okay, of our financial factors on the different characteristics. In a, another way to think about this is which uh, type of characteristics should you use to source stocks to form our factor? Because our factor will be, at the end of the day, a portfolio of the original characteristics. It turns out that emissions, so our factor, you can interpret it as a, long, a portfolio which is long, on uh, stocks in less polluting sectors. So is compatible, is our factor will be by construction, will have a positive mean by construction, so a positive risk premium. And the model tell us that to get this positive risk premium, we need to be long in stocks, which are in sectors, which, have, uh, which are polluting less. Um, so this is compatible with what Galina said, but we don't impose it ex ante. So the data is telling us that this factor is there. But when you add these factors to the other factors that we have in our model, does it explain? So this is the time series of our factor increasing. It has a positive risk premium, sharp ratio of 0 0.40. So this is in sample, okay? So this is not huge. This is not an anomaly portfolio. So this is reasonable, annualized. But when we add this factor to the, what we know, to be the good factors from finance, do we increase uh, the explanatory power of the finance factor? When we look at all the stocks, the answer is no. So when we look at how much our green factor extracted with our methodology improves compared to financial factors, we find nothing when we look at the entire cross-section of stocks. If we zoom in only in the two sectors of oil and utilities, we have a slight increase in the ability of our factor to explain the time series variation of uh, oil companies, but this increase, you know, is just two, three percent, okay? And, and also we have an increase of 10% in the ability of explaining the risk premium compared to the previous factors. This is exactly very much in line with what Galina said, but only concentrated in oil and utilities. For everything else, there's nothing there. And that's the conclusion of the paper, the main conclusion of the paper. Uh, if we use state-of-the-art econometric methodology, which let the data speak on the relationship between environmental characteristics, uh, financial characteristics, and returns through a linear factor model with time varying loadings, can we find ex post? This is in sample, huh? so this is not out of sample. This is in sample, so these results should be big if I was forcing the results. Can we find an environmental factor pervasive for all the asset classes? For sure, no. No increase in the explanatory ability of the environmental factor that we find uh, on, on all stocks. Maybe there is something there for oil and utilities, but, but no more than that. 
Uh, we are repeating the same analysis on, on, on bonds and other asset classes, but this is future research. So I leave the floor open for questions. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mirko. I'm afraid I will have just one question since we are running yep. out of time. Okay, please, uh, let me bring you a mic. Just one thing. Uh, I'm a complete ignorant on, on green finance and green data, so re send all the technical question on the green data to Emanuele. He's the true expert on all the details of the paper. He did an amazing work in going to the details of all this. Okay, so I'll ask a kinematic question. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so um, I understand how and why you are talking to lies environmental factor yes versus all the other financial ones i want to do it only for interpretability right right, right. but so uh, so let me ask you this question so potentially there are financial characteristics that are correlated with yes that, that are predictive yes. of the yes. green factors and we orthogonal right. we or, this is why we do the other step of orthogonalizing right. the characteristics on the financial yeah ones. let me ask my question though. yes so uh, so to the extent that you know the green factor does matter the you you can think of this orthogonalizing procedure as a decomposition of this yes. green factor into the residual and the portion that's predicted by other financial characteristics so what you are reporting is essentially just the effect of that component yes. that is not explained by other but it doesn't mean that the the predicted component. So I yes. wonder if it's possible for you to also measure the impact of the predicted component of the green factor. Let me ask another question. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you deal with non-random selection of the firms that do report these environmental factors versus those that don't? So first of all, excellent questions. So thanks. So th th these questions I can handle. So that's, that's great. Um, uh, so. The other conclusion, which I didn't mention, is exactly what you said. So my paper doesn't say that uh, green data are useless in explaining returns. The only conclusion I can draw from what I presented is that uh, if there is correlation between green characteristics, environmental data, and financial data, uh, the orthogonal parts of the, what is not the predicted part, the residual part, is very much useless to explain the entire cross-section of stock returns. Now, with this model, I cannot answer your question because I would need a structural model linking the uh, emissions to size, revenues, or financial characteristics in general. So in this framework, I cannot address. Because this is a, think about it as a machine learning exercise where I let the data speak and the maximum I can say is that the orthogonal part doesn't explain. Um, the second question was? The random selection. Uh, in the model as it is, uh, we cannot do it. Can the model be extended with uh, including the probability to be inserted in the data set? Uh, yes, but we need another econometric paper. So I cannot address it here. The only thing I can do is to find the, to see if the results are robust when I eliminate characteristics and I add uh, stocks or reduce stocks when I add characteristics. And the results are very robust. So I can do it just ex post. If I want to do it in a more structural way, I need to change the model. Uh, can be done, but probably it's two, two years of work because nobody has done it before. So what you're saying is correct, but we have the same problem in finance. So it's, yeah, something to think about for the future, but it's a super valid point. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation. And now we are um, listening to Olivier on uh, green bonds and green consumers. So Olivier, it's 20 minutes for you and then five right. minutes for the questions. Thanks a lot. Right. Thank, you. thank you very much. Um, so, um, this is joint work with Maxime Sauzé and the paper is called When Green Investors Are Also Green Consumers. So I'd like to motivate the work um, by showing you the, a survey that has been done by Morgan Stanley uh, Sustainable Investing uh, Institute. Um, they showed that among 800 US investors, 33 of them declared to screen their investments according to their interests and values 
in order to avoid in, uh, investing in something they would consider to be objectionable. So they have green preferences for investments. But strikingly, the same proportion of investors declare that they purchase from a brand, particularly because of the company's environmental and or social impact, meaning that they, also, they might also have uh, preferences for green consumption. This is not specifically necessarily the same uh, people who answer this question, but we expect that there is a, a strong overlap between these two samples. So this suggests that the ethical motives underpinning green investors' capital allocation decisions might also be reflected in their consumption practices. Right? They might also be willing to buy electric vehicles or eat local food, for example. The second thing is that these people who have preferences for buying green goods or exposed to a specific type of shock, especially supply shocks, meaning that the supply of green goods might decrease for several reasons, or equivalently, the price, the relative prices of green goods might increase for some reasons. And what could be the reasons? It can be the election of a new government, like the Trump election with the withdrawal from the Paris Agreement, the repeal of the Clean Poor Act, or suspension of some subsidies to renewable energies. It can also be the contraction of international trade. During the COVID-19 crisis, there was a rise by 300% in the price of silicon in, in French silicium, which is an essential, con essential component of solar panels um, over uh, three months. It can also be linked to you know, the outbreak of an armed conflict we saw with the war in Ukraine, that there was an increase in the share of coal in electricity production in Germany, meaning that the relative prices of brown, uh, of, of, of brown electricity, if I may say, ha uh, um, has uh, decreased in a, relative, in a relative term, if I may say. And also, um, it can also be triggered by uh, e uh, the fear of an economic slump. We, we've, we, we saw that at the beginning of 2022, um, China increased its, its uh, coal production by 10%, and this was, uh, it was suggested that it was driven by the fear of an economic slump. So those are um, uh, main drivers of this risk of supply shocks to which gr uh, green consumers are exposed. So very briefly, what do we know and what don't we know in the literature? So we, we know that there, there is a green, there might be a green premium, and Mirko just talked about that, uh, uh, um, linked to the fact that investors have preferences for buying green uh, assets. Um, so very basically, if you, if you say that you have two groups of investors, um, uh, green investors of which the wealth proportion is al alpha and neutral investors, and green investors want to tilt their investments toward green assets assets, where W is the, the proportion of green assets in their portfolio, and phi is a, a variable that characterizes their taste for green assets, a sensitivity. Well, you can rewrite the expected return this way, in a very simple way, where alpha is the proportion of wealth of these green investors. Um, so this has been, um, this has been uh, uh, um, I mean, a few papers have found empirical evidence of this green premium, so I, 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 I move a bit quickly on that. Um, even though Mirko said that it's probably uh, focused on a few on a few sectors, um, the thing is that uh, the literature is fully silent on the effect of investors' preferences for green consumption. And this is the, the main uh, purpose of this paper: is to understand how do preference pro environmental preferences for consumption translate into investment decisions, and how do they interact with preferences for investment. So we need to extend the analysis to a general equilibrium setting where investors also want to buy green goods, right? So um, there are a few technical hurdles in, in the literature because when you use the GE models in the literature, they often rely on special cases where investors have low preferences or, crap pref or quiet utility functions. They often rely on Cobb Douglas aggregator. You often have one investor or one consumption good. And they also rely on lower or local approximation, meaning that we find uh, the equilibrium equation on a specific sp state, which often is the um, a steady state. Right? So um, what do we find and what do we do, what do we find? So from a technical point of view, we build on, on Maxime Sose's paper uh, by constructing a general equilibrium model featuring two trees, a green and a brown tree. So basically you can think of uh, that as a green company and a brown company, producing two goods, a green and a brown good, with two heterogeneous, inv heterogeneous investors having a bias in investment and consumption, meaning that the green investor wants to buy green assets uh, and also wants to buy green goods. Um, the thing is that these investors have recursive preferences, so general preferences, and this is key in having the results that we show you. We also solve the model globally on the whole state space, so we are not, on, not specifically fully focused on a specific point, but on the whole state space. 
And finally, we estimate the beta representation to see whether what we find theory theoretically um, is also uh, within the data, can be also uh, found within the data. From a more conceptual point of view, what do we find? We find that there are two state variables that drive two new consumption premia. The, these two consumption premia are the relative supply of the green, or is driven, the first one is driven by the relative supply of the green good, and the second one is driven by the, the wealth share of the green investor. The second one is more muted, but the main one, the main effect in this paper, is the premium that is driven by the relative supply of the green good. What do we find? If you take the previous equation we had, we have exactly that, plus these two premia. And what do we show in this paper? is that, let me go back, is that if you take the difference between these two premia, uh, um, so let's focus on the main one, on this, of the two premia, we find that uh, um, the effect of the relative supply premia plays in the opposite direction of the green premium and partly, and in some cases, totally offsets the green premium. Meaning that when investors have also preferences for buying green goods, the green premium kind of disappear because of their preferences for green goods. Why do we have that? <clears throat> we have that because the key intuition, do I, do I say that here? Yeah, I do say that here. The key intuition is that, is that brown assets provide a good hedge or a better hedge, if I may say, with respect to green assets, when the prices of green goods increase. So when I'm unhappy because of the increase of the prices of green goods, the assets that pay in this case are the brown assets. So I keep on having a pocket of my portfolio investing in brown assets to hedge against the fact that the, the goods I want to buy uh, can become expensive. That's the key intuition. And we find empirical evidence of, for that. So for the assets that most co-vary with this factor and the one that least co-vary with this factor, if you take the difference in terms of premium, we find a premium that goes up to 1.5% per year. Right. So this is the, driven by the, the fact that investors might want to hedge against this effect. If we focus on green versus brown assets, now let's forget about the fact that there are some assets that are co correlated with this factor. Just focus on the green assets versus brown assets. Now what we, what we show is that the green assets offer a poor hedge, as I just said, a poor hedge against the increase of, of prices of green goods, while the brown assets offer a better hedge against the increase of the price of green goods. This is why investors keep on investing in that. Why do we care about that? Well, we care about that because there was this dilemma between exit and invoice. If we are green investors, should we underinvest in brown from brown assets? Should we divest from brown assets? Or should we keep on investing in brown assets and putting pressure on brown companies to push them to change, to act as active shareholders? And behind that, there, so the, uh, about that thing, there are a few papers uh, that suggests, excuse me, that suggests that when you as an investor overinvest in green assets and, un and underinvest in brown assets, the, the pressure you exert on brown companies is quite limited. And therefore, um, the impact you have on the practices of green companies is limited. So you don't push much companies to become greener when you do this underinvestment from brown assets and overinvestment in green, from, in green assets. That's what suggests uh, a, a few papers. Another paper, which is a theory paper, suggests that shareholder engagement might be more efficient than divesting from brown stocks. Well, the results of this paper offer a contribution to that. Because in addition to contributing to the asset pricing literature and asset allocation literature, it also contributes, it also has implication for the impact investing literature. Why? Because if this green premium is kind of offset by a new premium, then the incentive you, 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 the incentive you put on brown companies to become greener kind of disappear. Right? So the impact you can have on companies when you also have preferences for buying green goods is almost offset because of that. Um, another thing, another conclusion is that since you as a green investor want to keep on investing part of your portfolio in brown assets for this hedging motive, it's a nice opportunity as a green investor to keep on engaging with these brown companies and push them to change. That's a, a kind of takeaway for them. So let me go very briefly uh, through the model. Um, okay, so we have two investors, a green investor and a neutral investor. They can both invest in the two trees. Um, this is the output of the green, uh, the green goods, the price of the green good, and the expected return of the green asset. Same for the brown company. The green, green investor over in the green tree. 
In terms of consumption, same story. They both consume for both trees, but the green consumer consume a little bit more from the from the brown tree because she prefers uh, consuming uh, like buying electric vehicles or lo buying local foods. So uh, you have two investors, two trees. Um, the output of the two trees is a uh, um, geometrical brown emotion that has this, this specification. These two P's are, as I told you, the prices of the two goods. Those are the prices of the two consumption basket, the one of Miss Green and the one of Mr. Neutral. Those are the relative prices of the two assets. We have two assets. And those are the relative prices of the two baskets, the one of Miss Green and the one of Mr. Neutral. So we have the equity assets that have these prices Q. The dividend yield F is, you can think of, uh, you can think about that as a country pro uh, producing um, uh, a GDP every year. So P, Y is the output. P is the price of this output. So P, Y is the price of what you've produced divided by uh, uh, the price of the assets, right? So the returns can be written this way, uh, also, again, as a geometrical brown emotion. And you have a bond, which is uh, a riskless asset. So here are the preferences of both investors. Do are general preferences. There are Duffy and Epstein preferences. So the one, if you are familiar with this literature, you will recognize the blue part. The new thing here is that we add a wedge, which is a factor that shows the preference of these investors for the green assets. Why? Because phi is positive and is W phi times a factor. I don't talk about this factor, but uh, the, you can include it or not include it. That, that's a kind of debate I have with my co-author, but it doesn't change the result. So W times phi, it's exactly what I showed you before. If you overinvest in the green assets, then W increases, and it increases scaled by phi, which is my test for this green asset. So we just tweak a little bit the model by adding this wedge that um, characterizes the preferences of Miss Green for investing in green assets. We also characterize the preferences for buying green goods through this alpha. Because for Mr. Neutral, alpha is one half. But for Miss Green, alpha will be higher than one half because she prefers buying green goods. The two key ingredients here are the fact that we have Duffy and Epstein preferences and that we, we use a CES fun function here so not a cop douglas function, with theta different than one. Those are the key ingredients. Um, so I'm, I'm skipping that. Um, the market clears. And what's interesting here is that we have an equilibrium that can be recast as a stationary recursive Markovian equilibrium in which all the variable of interest can be expressed as a, a function of these two variables. These two variables are the wealth share of the green investor, and the relative supply of the green good, as I told you before, right? And this one is the main one. So we solve the model globally. I, I don't spend much time on that. And let me show you uh, uh, the, the, the solution, the numerical solutions. So we calibrate the model, look that here, the alpha is higher than one half because Miss Green prefers to buy green good. We also have a positive phi. Theta is different than one. Remember theta is the elasticity of substitution between the two goods, the green good and the brown good. And it's important that theta is different than one because it allows us to have these, uh, these new premier. And okay, we have kind of uh, um, standard calibration. So what do we have? We have the value function here that is expressed this way. The value function is expressed as a function of j. Well, j will be crush crucial when we look at the marginal value of wealth. When you divide the value, the, the, the value function by when we take the derivatives of the value function with respect to the wealth, which is key when you want to optimize, then J will drive the marginal value of wealth. Therefore, it will also drive the stochastic discount factor as well as the portfolios, the asset prices, and the risk sharing. So for simplification and consistent with the literature, we will refer to J as the marginal values of wealth. Right. What do we find? So J, these two Js, or uh, they satisfy this AJB function. I don't spend much time on that. I just want to show you the, the shapes of these two J's. So remember, when J is, is high, I'm unhappy. When the marginal value of wealth is high, I'm unhappy. When the marginal value of wealth is low, I'm happy. Here you, you understand, sorry, here you understand that the neutral, um, sorry, that the neutral consumer is kind of happy when there is one half of green goods and one half of brown goods and becomes less happy when the market is skewed toward either green goods or brown goods. More interestingly, the green, the green consumer prefers when, when there are more green goods in the market, which is kind of intuitive, right? So those are the shapes of the two marginal values of wealth. 
uh, a few words about three variables. This is the relative prices, this is the relative prices of the two baskets, and those are the relative dividends. A key, an instrumental effect in this, in this model and in the results we have is that we suppose that theta, the elasticity of substitution between two goods, is not too low. Meaning that if at some point you can't buy local food, you'll be happy to, you'll be happy to, buy, to buy food from abroad, right? If you can't buy an electric vehicle, you'll be okay to buy a, a, a not electric vehicle. If it, uh, this is consistent with, uh, with the literature that theta, sorry, that theta uh, uh, is greater than one. If we have theta greater than one, excuse me, then, then what do we have? We have that, okay, so th those are intuitive results. Uh, when the, when the, the relative supply of the green good increases, the relative prices of the green goods decreases. Same for the baskets. But here, we have an increasing relationship between the supply of green goods, Y, and the relative dividends. Why? Because the volume effect plays more than the price effect. If you have more green goods, you, the, with, so the volume will be, of, of green goods consumed will be high, but the price will be low and the opposite for the, for the brown good. But the, 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 the effect of volume will be higher, meaning that, let's take an example of a shock. If you have a, a, a shock on the, on the green good, so the green good decreases, what do we have? The volume of the brown good consumed increases and the prices of the brown good decreases. But the volume effect plays more because the elasticity of substitution is greater than one, right? So bottom line, the relative dividend is an increasing function of the relative supply of the green good. Let's go to the results. What do we have? So we show that in equilibrium, there is this new consumption premium that arises. And this new consumption premium can be thought as the covariance between the return of your asset, the asset you're looking at and the marginal value of wealth. So if your asset is correlated with the marginal value of wealth, so if the asset pays when you are unhappy, then the premium will be negative. You will, be, you will accept a lower expected return. If you are set pays when you are unhappy, you will require a higher expected return. We can rewrite this, uh, this premium in terms of two different premia, a, a, relative, a, a relative supply consumption premia, premium and a relative wealth consumption premium. This one is mostly muted. The one that plays more is this one. The question you'll ask me is, okay, what's the sign of that? Okay, so we can calculate the sign of that. We show that, you know, when you have a premium, you have the price of risk, which is lambda, and the quantity of risk, which is beta. Question is, what is the price of risk? What is lambda? We show that the price of risk of this relative su supply uh, premium is, is positive. Why? Because if you have an asset that pays when the relative supply is high, so when the price of my green good is low, then I'm, I'm unhappy holding an asset that pays in this case. That's why I require a positive a premium to hold this asset. Okay, first conclusion. Second conclusion, if now if, if, if we focus on green versus brown goods, what do we find? Well, we find that the, the, the green good covary with this factor, while the, the, the brown good covary negatively with this factor. So the brown, good, sorry, assets. The green assets covary positively and the brown assets covary negatively. Meaning that the brown asset is a better hedge against a, a, a shock on relative prices of green goods. That's the main conclusion here, right? Okay, um, and as you can see, if you take the difference, be, so you take the difference between the green premium of, on the green good and the green premium on the brown good, you have this green premium. You do the same thing on the two consumption premia, the consumption premia on the green good and the one on the brown good. As I told you, the effect is positive and it almost offsets the green premium. So the whole story about the fact that I can have an impact on companies because I can raise the, the cost of capital because I have preferences for green goods, no longer holds much if you also have preferences for buying green goods, right? Okay, so this is where we solve the model globally on the whole sales page. So I skip that, I skip the portfolios, and I will just show you a very quick intuition if I have a couple of minutes. No? Well, no more, okay. theoretically, but if you want to take a little bit. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay, so it, I'm okay. fine. Sorry about that. That's Thank okay. you very much. <laughs> sure. Okay, so do we have some questions for... Okay, wait a minute. 
Galina, okay. 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 Antoine. Okay, Antoine, please. Uh, I just, uh, well, uh, my question is, do, don't your result hinge on the fact that investment doesn't have a real impact in the sense that there is no change in the productivity of the green goods. So in a sense, you know, a green investor invests to reduce the carbon footprint of future production. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the good guy should delay his consumption until production is greener yeah. to consume. But you don't capture that effect. That's a very fair point. We don't have production in this model. It's a, it's a Lucas economy. So that's right. So we do not influence uh, the production. That's fully right. Uh, yeah, so we don't have this effect. We really focus on the, the shock on relative supply. Yeah. Thank you, Galina. Okay. So my question is actually kind of related. So uh, because I, I agree with the comment that probably the results do not necessarily generalize to the production economy. And, but, but in your setting, so you, you have the shocks to supply our IID, right? Uh, but I was wondering if the model is actually a good uh, laboratory to think about carbon taxes, because that is going to change the, the dynamics of the relative prices of brown and green goods. And if there is a certain pro like uncertainty and probability of the carbon tax in the future, and if as a green person I believe it's a higher probability than yeah. a neutral person, that actually can have some... And your model might give like a quantitative yeah. impact of those. Right? One hundred percent true. That's right. So it's without any uh, um, expectation on different returns due to the fact that there might be a tax in the future. That's fully right. And in the end of the paper, I suggest to I suggest to merge this model, which is a, a preference model, with AIM models, where you can have these effect on on. A, on, on the financial returns and introducing carbon tax. So that's, that's fully right. And I think that's the next step is to, to introduce this notion of financial risks, if I may say. That's right. So it's a preference model. Okay, thanks for this, for this presentation. And uh, it's now time for me to call Alex, Alex Clark, who will present us a paper of uh, how sustainable finance creates impact. So, Alex, you have five minutes, 20 minutes, not five, sorry. <laughs> okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm particularly happy to be here because I very nearly wasn't as a result of the strikes in the UK. Usually it's the other way around. Um, so we're really kind of challenging the French um, in that regard. Uh, so very pleased to be here. And, um, and thank you to the Banque de France and the Institut Louis Bachelier for having me. So this paper is actually... Um, quite nicely in conversation with the previous presentation from Olivier and a couple of the themes that have been raised. Um, what we're trying to do in this paper, and this is with uh, colleagues at Oxford University, um, is to think more deeply and conceptually about what we're trying to do uh, when we're uh, trying to create a sustainable financial system. Um, so although uh, this is intended to be a fairly general conceptual exercise, uh, the underlying current, I think, that's implicit in what I'll be saying is that we are looking primarily at climate, um, but we're also trying to develop a, a conceptual framework for thinking about impact more generally and how the financial and real economies are linked. So um, if sustainable finance is to succeed in, in uh, driving change in the real economy, we really need to understand how one is linked to the other. So as we've seen a huge growth in sustainable finance instruments, and I'm using that term as distinct from impact investing as a uh, explicitly a market niche where you're willing to trade off returns for, for impact. Um, this, this has prompted significant new discussion among regulators and among the, in, within the market on debates on you know, exactly what is, should be defined as green. So if you look at the EU taxonomy, the SFDR regulations, Article 8 and so on, everything, everyone is really asking what counts as green. Um, and in the early drafts of the EU taxonomy, it was really green or not green, and we've ended up with dark green, light green, and grey, um, which is you know better than a binary. But asking, spending all this time thinking about what is green is a different question from how exactly um, financial decision making uh, makes the world greener. 
And a lot of the recent growth in, in uh, sustainable finance instruments, whether it's through green ETFs, uh, sustainability-linked loans and bonds, which are really exploding in the last 18 to 24 months, is, is primarily risk management, impact on creditworthiness, and then um, secondly, a growing investor demand for ESG and impact. Uh, and a willingness to potentially trade off returns for uh, greener products um, or not if the, the, the person marketing or the entity marketing that product is um, convincing enough in their, their PR, which is effectively what is still happening. Um, as we know, the, the ESG emperor has no clothes, as, as everyone is, is saying at the moment. Um, so most of the products that are they're claiming to live, deliver on the second point uh, are essentially taking some variation of a portfolio alignment approach to sustainability. And what we mean here is uh, not, not only this, this, uh, these three bullet points here, but some variation that's relatively similar to the following. You're either buying or overweighting green or sustainable finance, financial assets. You're selling or you're underweighting or shorting or whatever else, brown or unsustainable financial assets um, on average. And in theory, you're able to sell the, the resulting product or portfolio at a, at a green premium, or at least at the market rate. Um, and I just put a note at the bottom here that we're sidestepping the, the discussion on you know, whether, philosophically speaking, finance should be doing this. And there's a very valid and fertile debate to be had about whether finance should have a role or whether it's really just the job of regulators and governments to set the rules of the game. But we are interested in just understanding how finance can become what it is claiming to be and what... Um, the regulators, governments, and so on are hoping it will become uh, in driving real economy change. So we need to really move to the, the mechanics of how uh, real economy change is happening. So just to give a, a typical example of what a green strategy might look like, you may be buying green bonds on secondary markets. By definition, there's no new um, activity happening. You're just you know, trading something that's already been issued, or you're increasing your stake in a renewable heavy utility, for example, at the expense of your holdings in oil and gas. Now, that's not to say that you will not have an impact, but it's not a sufficient condition to, to say that you will uh, on real economy activity. Um, so not all alignment strategies are created equal, particularly if they're accompanied by um, an effective uh, engagement um, approach. Um, but uh, fundamentally, bottom line, or the starting point for our work is investing in financial products, green financial products, does not equal making the world greener. Um, I'll just move, move on a little bit. Okay, so um, here's what, how we, we went about our analysis. First of all, we looked at the wider literature on transmission mechanisms. Uh, and this is fairly well-developed literature looking in general at uh, how uh, financial decision-making affects the real economy. This was really given a boost by the events of 2008, um, but tends to look at the economy in general. And we're trying to think uh, about uh, sustainability and climate in particular. Um, secondly, we, we took this review and we looked at how real economy impact might be achieved across asset classes. And it turns out, based on our conjectures, um, which of course need empirical testing, uh, that you, there is a significant uh, difference across different asset classes in terms of the impact you can have and how you would go about generating that impact. Um, we go on uh, in a working paper version of, of this paper that was published some time ago. This is not such a feature in the, the more academic uh, focused article that's currently under review um, to develop ideal types. Uh, so if you were a pure play uh, investor in a particular asset class, how would you think about maximizing your real economy impact subject to whatever your other constraints are? And then briefly, I'll look at the implications for manager selection and, and asset allocation in multi-asset portfolios. So um, when we look at the literature, this is what we, we find. Essentially, three main transmission mechanisms. Cost of capital was referenced by Olivier earlier on. Um, something that we're calling access to liquidity, um, which is subtly different from the cost of capital in terms of it's describing the pool of capital available to, um, to someone looking to borrow. And third is, is usually uh, described as engagement, but essentially the ability of financial actors to influence corporate management and practices among investee firms. And of course, all of these are happening within a risk environment that uh, constrains to some degree what is possible for a financial actor. And these three um, uh, transmission mechanisms are interrelated. There are feedback mechanisms between them all, um, between uh, macro conditions and so on that we should just be aware of. We're not trying to kind of quantify this at this stage, but this is just a, a, 
uh, framework and principle. So this just visualizes what I've just said, essentially. Um, so if we're looking at um, you know, how these mechanisms might look in practice, uh, just very briefly, if you're thinking about trying to affect the cost of capital of a firm, uh, either on the debt or equity, equity side, um, the, the uh, literature tells us that this is typically affected by macro factors. Some of them are listed here, interest rates, inflation, business cycle, and micro factors, which are specific to the firm. So it's creditworthiness. Um, we know that improved liquidity can lower transaction costs, um, potentially also lower the cost of capital, given the greater supply of capital, and incentivize longer-term investments. And there's a, a very large literature now on how investors can use their shareholder rights, their presence in AGMs, potentially if they're uh, bond investors, their ability to engage through other channels to influence how a company uh, behaves and how it invests. So if we're thinking about how this might look in specifically a sustainable finance context, um, there is some emerging evidence. Uh, and I say emerging because there's still quite some debate about you know, the existence or not of green premia, um, the ability of, uh, of green strategies to influence cost of capital and so on. But these, at least some of these findings present an idea of what might be possible if it was properly executed under the right conditions. So we have seen, for example, particularly in, in um, short-term lending and bond markets, the, uh, uh, the driving of a wedge between the cost of capital for sustainable and unsustainable projects. Um, and this is particularly pronounced in you know, the, the, the most high carbon sources of energy, for example, coal, tar sands, deep sea oil. Um, there's not yet any clear evidence of improved liquidity for sustainable projects or firms versus, or versus general or unsustainable uh, projects or firms. But this may change, um, particularly uh, with increasingly stringent ESG requirements on stock exchanges, which just may restrict the, the ability of um, clearly unsustainable firms to access capital through capital markets. And there is broad empirical support for the, the influence of uh, investor engagement on corporate managers, management and practices. Now, exactly what that change is and how effective it is and how permanent it is and so on is, is still very much contextual and contested. Um, but there is some evidence there, at least. So in, our, in the second stage of our analysis, we uh, look at five asset classes split into seven subtypes. So we look at passive and acti acri active public equities, and in brackets here you've got the approximate market size at the moment, outstanding um, instruments, fixed income, bonds and loans, private equity, and, and real assets. And with a, a hedge funds as a side note, and I'll explain why we do that in a second. So uh, I won't go through every detail on this, but this is just to explain our qualitative uh, ranking, um, where we're looking essentially for four characteristics to maximize uh, impact uh, potential, so, you know, if how much impact can actually be achieved, how likely it is, um, how uh, the magnitude of that impact and how persistent it is over time. So this is just the example of, um, of what we call the negligible uh, rating. We're going from one to five all the way up to sort of, you know, strong uh, impact. So an example in this case is a single investor with a minority share in a publicly traded firm is unlikely to have any significant impact or any impact at all on that firm's cost of capital just by divesting its shares. And you know, this is a well-known um, logic which has um, fairly strong empirical support in the lit literature that divestment per se is unlikely to have any real economy impact unless certain conditions hold, like everyone doing it at once uh, and holding a big uh, proportion of that company's shares. I won't go through the ones in the middle. Um, we can come back to them if there's interesting questions, but we essentially go all the way up to um, a strong descriptor where there is potential for impact. It's very likely the magnitude of that impact is large and it will persist, likely to persist over time. So for example, a private equity investment resulting in a controlling share in the underlying company or asset could have a very strong impact um, if the, the acquirer so desired. Um, on that firm's adoption of sustainable practices, uh, either because that firm is in a distressed position and it's it's not in a position to, to bargain over its governance and practices, or simply that it's relatively early stage and it's at a good point in the company's development to um, implement some of these practices. So um, bearing in mind that this is, this is 
all done qualitatively. And uh, part of what we're trying to do is set up some nice hypotheses for, for more empirical research is we look at, uh, you know, what, what might the minimum and maximum impact be based on our framework across the asset classes described. And what we find um, is that loans and private equity in particular are likely to have the greatest potential for real economy impact if executed in the right way. Uh, and particularly through the adoption of sustainable practices. Whereas passive public equities and hedge funds are likely to have least impact overall. And this is just a kind of visualization of, of that table. Um, but perhaps more important than the finding that uh, 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 the, the private equity and, and loans might be a higher impact is that some of the asset classes that are typically targeted for sustainable finance instruments have pretty limited potential for impact. Um, now, this, is, of course, is not necessarily allowing for uh, feedback mechanisms to, to do their work and because we don't really understand them enough to be able to build any sort of uh, working model to try and understand you know, how these relate to each other. But it may be that you know, success in um, changing corporate practices might be contingent on success in uh, affecting the cost of capital, vice versa. Uh, and, and indeed, maximizing impact can also depend on macro factors outside investors' control completely, as I referred to at the beginning. But generally speaking, our, our analysis supports the claim that holding green assets is just not sufficient for generating sustainable outcomes. And there's a whole uh, kaleidoscope of potential outcomes that can be achieved depending on a, a range of, of different factors. So um, I'm coming towards the end. So I'll, has it got five minutes or so? Six. Five, so perfect. Okay. <laughs> So um, we, we try to develop uh, what we call ideal types, which is basically trying to think about what a max, an impact maximizing investor might do uh, across the different asset classes. So just taking the example here of an impact maximizing bond fund that's 100% um, pure play in bonds, what might they, what might they do? Um, well, on the cost of capital side, um, incentivizing issuers to lower their cost of capital through um, standardization and particularly the use of sustainability linked bonds and loans, where uh, there is a direct link between the future cost of capital or the coupon rate or, or what have you, based on the achievement of different KPIs. Um, working with issuers on their capital structure, conditionality of future lending and, and KPIs, and then steadily and predictably excluding the worst performing issuers via internal hurdle rates on the investor side rising over time. And these are, this is not a kind of prescriptive playbook, it's just some illustrative uh, examples. Um, on access to liquidity, a lot of this really is determined by indices and stock exchanges. So um, pushing for the creation of, of risk-adjusted alternatives to existing indices, particularly the liquid ones, and one of the issues for green bonds um, liquidity is that they are typically too small to be included automatically on um, most of the major um, listed indices indices sorry and then on the engagement side uh, you know a lot, a lot of the um, classic strategies are relatively well known but there's not really a kind of robust literature trying to tease out you know exactly which ones are more effective and why um, but things like a publishing a clear corporate stu stewardship strategy, um, maximizing new and transitional financing, participating in re refinancing, particularly of high carbon assets, only in very specific circumstances that need to be actively justified, and then systematically engaging with issuers on their long-term strategies as well. Uh, just because of time, I'll skip through that, and I also skip through this. So, just um, with a concluding with a with a final word on what the implications might be for. The real world where you've, you typically are working across multiple asset classes at once. Um, so uh, there are at least two types of implication. The first is on um, manager selection. So our, su our suggestion or our insight from, from this initial work is that internal and external uh, asset managers should be selected based specifically on their strategic alignment with the um, ideal types that we've tried to build across the asset classes uh, and in doing so help drive demand for, for impact maximizing practice. Um, our findings also suggest that the allocation of capital should be weighted more towards high impact asset classes is of course constrained by risk return requirements as well but uh, at least in principle. Um, and one, one idea that we uh, put forward is the establishment of uh, an impact budget um, to allow for this uh, reallocation across different asset classes, which is essentially analogous to the risk budget approach that's already um, 
used as a standard uh, for asset allocation as well. Okay, so um, just some final concluding thoughts. Our analysis has, has suggested, or at least um, is sort of initially validated the starting point that um, portfolio-based approaches to greening the real economy are at worst ineffectual, and at best they're conti contingent on strategic um, asset class specific activities by asset owners. Um, we've been agnostic of what impact actually means, and in previous um, presentations of this paper, uh, some of the really interesting questions have been, you know, so what, what really is your dependent variable here? What, it, what, what do you think should be um, should we be looking for in, in terms of impact? And that's really a whole different discussion. Um, but uh, just a, a footnote really to this talk is that the, the obvious conclusion many people jump to is you really should be looking to affect the uh, emissions on a year by year basis of a company if climate is your climate impact is your objective. But actually, you know, not only is that difficult to measure, you have all sorts of issues with inbuilt assumptions, disclosures um, that, that mean essentially not only is uh, are your emissions uh, calculations for a particularly large complex firm not comparable over time? They're not comparable across companies either, whether it's scope one, two, three, whatever else. So it may be a more productive route to start looking at emissions intensity of capital stock and future capex, or better yet, particularly because most of this stuff is already um, fairly standard within existing accounting practices, the, changed, the change in um, committed emissions of capital stock, existing capital stock and future capex as well. So um, there might be some more interesting deeper work to be done on linking uh, the transmission mechanism framing that we've been using with, um, with these specific outcomes as well. So further research, of course, we need to think uh, about ways to test the many potential empirical hypotheses that we've uh, generated in this paper to try and quantify the, the dynamics and magnitude of each mechanism in a sustainable finance context and the feedback uh, mechanisms between those. Um, and uh, actually, that was my final point as well. So I think I'll just close it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. <laughs> OK, do, do we have questions here? Well, actually, I might have. Oh, please go. <laughs> Gong. Thank you, Ngong Cheng from the BS. Um, thank you very much for this presentation. Very interesting. And actually, my question is on your last slide on this impact. So what the impact is. Uh, and on top of that, actually, uh, is also, so I, I need to understand a bit more about the impact here is you talk about the environmental impact or you refer to back to the triangle you presented earlier uh, in your presentation. So it's more in terms of the cost of funding and other more financial uh, metrics. If you talk about uh, environmental impact, ultimately another question is uh, who should do the impact? reporting or the, the impact assessment. So it's self-reported mm -hmm. or there should be like a third party independent assessments. Uh, because I think this is a core issue when we talk about like the current green bond markets, uh, impact reporting still remains voluntary for all the issuers. So how to square this in, in your framework? Thank you. Thank you, two excellent questions. So starting with the first one on the definition of impact. I mean, we've used the example of climate here, but the idea is to think more broadly about, you know, whatever your ultimate goal is, you know, not necessarily a, a positive impact goal could be a nefarious one. But, you know, if you're trying to reduce water use or uh, improve gender outcomes or address emissions, um, in principle, you should, you know, the same framework should be applicable to all of them simply because you're just looking for the mechanism that's linking a financial decision to a real economy outcome, whatever that happens to be. And it may, you may, it may be that, um, these mechanisms may work differently when you're looking at different outcomes, for sure. Uh, we haven't really got to that stage, but we're just trying to a priori think about, you know, what 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 is the nature of the links if you are looking to have a real economy impact, full stop, no matter really what that is. Um, on your second question, can you just remind me? <laughs> Who should do the impact assessment? So this is a really, really exciting area at the moment, simply because the capacity of you know, the research community, the nonprofit community, um, the NGOs and so on to independently audit using a combination of available um, asset level data, uh, earth observation and so on to, 
you know, at least provide a check, an external check on disclosures is really, really improving. Um, and yeah, I mean, the, you know, the issues with the green bond market are, are very well known. And until there's either a regulatory requirement to do this or the ability of banks or uh, other financial institutions to conduct effective due diligence that does not depend on a third party auditor or on voluntary reporting and so on, um, then that, that problem will fundamentally remain there. But I'm optimistic that we're headed in the right direction in terms of data availability and methodologies to do independent assessments. Okay, thank you. We thank might you. have the time for one small, quick question, if there is one. Yes, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Hugues Chenet, uh, ESX School of Management. Uh, I wonder how far your, uh, your framework captures the um, reputational potential effect. Uh, in my mind, I imagine that a significant part of uh, divestment movements had impacts directly on the license to operate of firms. So without motivating them to decrease their environmental footprint, but just maybe to, to change their business model in a more strong uh, way, typically for coal, uh, I think it probably had a significant effect on their license to operate as a coal, uh, as a coal industry uh, in itself. So I, I wonder if it's an additional one or if it's captured in the, in the third process you mentioned. Uh, thank you. It's, it's, it's more captured within the, the third bucket, so um, impact on corporate practices and so on. And the, that's a fairly wide bucket that captures all sorts of um, uh, potential reasons for a company to change its behavior, but reputational risk would be one of them. I think if you're referring to the reputational risk of the lender in holding those assets, then that maybe is a slightly different question. Um, but just as a side note, I mean, there's also differences in transparency between equity markets and bond markets, for example, that lead to some very uh, almost absurd uh, strategies by asset managers or asset owners. I mean, there's, I, I probably won't get the facts completely right, but um, there was a case of, I think it was one of the subsidiaries of Adani in, in Australia that um, I think maybe it had got sold and then it was IPOing again or something, whatever the, the, the um, circumstances were, it suddenly became public knowledge, you know, exactly who held the, the debt of that company, uh, which just, it wasn't, it just wasn't uh, publicly available uh, before then. Um, and the cost of capital, the cost of new borrowing for that particular company went up very, very sharply in a short period of time. Um, despite all of the intention being on, you know, who held the stocks in that company, actually the lever for change was on the bond side and the loan side. And that's partly, we didn't get into too much detail in 20 minutes, but that's partly why we conclude that actually, you know, if you're looking to affect the cost of capital for, for a firm in particular, but also uh, to take advantage of reputational risks that might be posed, uh, working through the, the bond and lending channel rather than the equity channel might be more effective. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. And now we will welcome Johannes for the presentation of his paper on the benchmark Grinium. So Johannes, you have 20 minutes for you. Thank you. Okay. Well, Thank you for uh, having me. Um, it's a great pleasure to present our joint paper with um, Stefania D'Amico and Aaron Pencast. Stefania, she's um, at the Fed in Chicago, and Aaron, he is at the University of Texas in Austin. Um, so the usual disclaimers um, apply. And the title of the paper is The Benchmark Greenium. So we know that there's an estimated uh, investment needed to reach the um, goals as outlined in the Paris Agreement. Um, the estimates vary between um, three to seven trillion dollars um, per year. So I took uh, something in the middle, the five trillion per year. And the green bond market is one of the markets that can potentially help us or can be key to finance um, those investments. So as already before uh, we discussed, there is this discussion on what is actually um, the green, how big it is, it is it? And we define the green as a convenience yield that an investor is willing to pay to hold a green asset. Um, we know from Pastor um, et al. that investors actually derive utility 
from holding um, green assets, and they are not necessarily pecuniary. So they are unrelated to risk or return characteristics. It's just um, basically a willingness to pay for holding these green assets. And that effectively then means that it's a subsidy for green investing. So as of now, the evidence on how large a greenium actually is is pretty inconclusive. That's what others has, have said today before. Um, and also there's a little evidence from the government bonds market. Okay, so our goal of this paper is that we want to identify a risk-free greenium um, which can serve as a benchmark greenium for uh, future analysis. And Germany provides us with a very nice natural experiment here. Um, they set up a twin structure of green bonds, always paired with another conventional bond. So those bonds are identical. The only difference is that one is used for green things, for green projects, and the other uh, proceeds are used for other things that are non-green. So it's appealing to say, okay, if the cash flows of those bonds are exactly the same, they're structured in the exact same way, one is only green, the other one is conventional. If we take the yield difference between green and conventional, well, that's our greenium. And we say, okay, that's a, a really important first step to think this way, but it's not sufficient to uncover the fundamental greenium because there are those confounding and idiosyncratic factors that prevent a clear identification from just taking the difference between those yields. Those could be, for example, relative scarcity of the green bond versus the, the, the conventional bond, um, or vice versa, if the ECB buys back a lot of conventional bonds, then conventional bonds become relatively scarcer. So that's just an example. So we need an asset pricing model to estimate the greenium, um, to basically um, purge the spread, the green spread, from those um, confounding and idiosyncratic factors. So what do we do? We um, extend the dynamic term structure model as proposed in PANCOS 2021, um, and we include a green dividend into this model. Um, and we use the, the German twin bonds as a natural experiment, basically, and we purge those green spreads using our asset pricing model from those confounding and idiosyncratic factors. So what we find is that the greenium is of the size of around zero to eight basis points, depending on the time period. So we have a time series of about two years, and that's our range that we find. Um, and we also find that the fundamental greenium is significantly different from the green spread. So we do this, first of all, in our model, and then we also show empirically that the time series of the greenium is related to um, events that shift environmental preferences of investors, whereas the green spread is not related to such things, but related to macro factors such as the stock market or stock market volatility. So why does it matter? It's important that we correctly identify the greenium because it tells us, first of all, what are the real environmental preferences of investors. It also helps us to know how much does the government, for example, Germany, save if they issue green bonds or green securities um, just because the investors are willing to pay a little bit more for such securities. So we need to quantify this um, advantage. And therefore, we'd also have, if there's an advantage from issuing green securities, a justification for other central banks to inc include green bonds in their portfolio. So just to give you um, an overview of how the um, green bond market has developed, so you see there's a really large surge in uh, green bonds here that's in blue. And if you look at the geographic distribution, it's mostly in Europe, okay? And then if we look at this graph, especially France and Germany are the two uh, largest uh, issuers. Okay, so what is really hard uh, in, are there several challenges involved in identifying the greenium? So one is there's a costly issuance process. So you cannot just claim your bond is green. You need to go through a verification process, which is costly. Then there's liquidity risk involved. Um, so smaller sizes, for example, are less liquid. 
Then also there's this question of fungibility. So how um, are the proceeds actually used? So there's this risk of transparency. Um, the evaluation risk, then we want to extract or disentangle the cash flow channel from the only discount rate channel um, because those premiums might offset each other. Okay. And in the interest of time, I skipped the previous literature, but yes, uh, even uh, in this room, we have people who did uh, already work on this. David has a great paper on uh, green bonds, but I can't go into detail um, in the interest of time. So just to give you an overview why we think the German bond market is a, an ideal testing uh, ground to do our analysis. So first of all, German debt is basically risk-free. So that means no real uncertainty about the cash flows. So we can exclude um, basically the probability of default. Then, as I said, each green bond is twinned with a conventional bond. They are identical. Then if you're concerned um, that the green securities trade at a discount, there are two things that the German uh, um, finance agency put in place. So one is there's always the option to convert your green bond into a conventional bond. At any point in time, you can do it obviously also in the market, but if in the market there would be nobody, theoretically, that would buy your bond, you can go to the German finance agency and they take it. Um, and also, if the green bond price falls below the conventional twins price, um, the, the German finance agency does the, these green repos, um, and uh, that also means that we have an implicit floor. Then also the proceeds are fully transparent. So Germany, after each year, issues a report on how these proceeds were actually used. Um, and there's an obligation exactly in T plus one, so every year after um, they have issued the bond. So that's an example. So most of the proceeds actually uh, in the most recent issues went into sustainable transportation. So those are um, the securities that I mentioned, the twins. You see we have um, two times uh, 10 um, years of maturity, one times uh, five years to maturity, and one is a 30-year bond. So here in one formula, the fundamental idea that we have using this as a pricing model. So YITG minus YIT, it's basically the green spread which is not yet purged from those confounding factors. And what we want to elicit is this fundamental greenium. So that's what we're looking for, the time series of this, excluding confounding factors and excluding idiosyncratic factors. And yeah, if you think of um, factors that are confounding, that could be, for example, flight to quality periods, um, or then idiosyncratic factors would be the issue and size of the green uh, twin versus the conventional twin that could cause demand imbalances. So that's the green spread. Simply plot. Um, up. So here you see there's no real indication of whether the term structure of uh, those um, green securities upward or downward sloping, no clear pattern. I will show you later that once we've purged from those confounding factors, actually observe an upward sloping term structure. So here that's um, basically the term structure once we have purged um, the green spread from those confounding factors and you see if the duration increases then also the um, spread between the conventional estimate and the green estimate increases, so that indicates an upward sloping term structure. <coughs> so just to briefly talk about the model uh, and what we do. So here you see we have um, latent factors xt um, that evolve according to this uh, equation here. You can think of it as a VAR model basically in discrete time. And we set up a stochastic discount factor and we define the the price of risk, which is time varying. Then we set up our no arbitrage condition. So just to say here, we haven't included our green dividend yet. I will show you how it looks like once we include our green dividend. This is just the general idea of the model. 
And also this slide is just to tell you we could also incorporate bonds um, that pay coupons to so the German twins. They don't, they're all zero coupon bonds. Um, but if we were to extend our analysis to um, bonds that pay coupons, we can accommodate that in our model. Okay, let's skip the estimation. So on the data, as I said, we use German uh, bond data. We have about 170,000 prices from 160 bonds. Um, so we have four twins. Um, we have data since September uh, 2020, which is the day or the, the month where the first twin has been issued. Um, and average, we have uh, 47 bonds per day to do our estimation. And the green ident identification comes from the icon green tag. You could also go to the German finance uh, agency website um, to see which bonds are green, which ones are not. So now, as I said, we extend this uh, linearity generating model and we include our uh, green dividend here and we set up our no arbitrage condition, including this green dividend. And then you see in the, in the measurement equation that here C only loads on uh, GT and XT is independent of GT. And here basically D is the duration that scales the measurement error. So and here it is, that's the, that's the benchmark greenium, that's the time series. So in red, you see the 30 year greenium, then in blue, the 10 year, and in green, the five year. And that also basically shows you again that we have this upward sloping term structure. And maybe interesting to see is also that here, this sharp increase in cream socks, it's a, a reverted, basically, a graph. So the more negative, the bigger the greenium. So here, that's the German floods. So you see, uh, in this week, we had the German floods with a lot of uh, people dead and billions in economic damages. And here, that's the gas uh, levy um, that Germany wanted to raise to basically um, help Uniper to import uh, gas because they were in financial trouble. And that makes sense because those things would shift environmental preferences. And I show you this in some formal regressions as well. So the regression setup is as follows. We have the dependent variable uh, YT, which is the time series of the greenium or the time series of the green spread. And we regress this on macro factors such as the DAX, which is the stock market, or the VIX, so the volatility, oil futures, then proxies for natural disasters, so for example, a dummy for the German floods, or also a time series of weekly economic damages or weekly econo um, casualties. So we use several proxies for natural disasters, and they all give us the same result. Then we have proxies for demand imbalances, and then dummies for the reopenings of green and conventional bonds. And basically the idea is what we want to look at is our greenium related to events that shift environmental preferences and is, or is it the green spread already um, or not? So, and what we find as a, a little spoiler is that the greenium is related to events that shift environmental preferences. The green spread is not, but the green spread is related to things like, for example, the DAX and the VIX. So um, what do we use to capture demand imbalances? So we have a couple of proxies that we use. So one of them would be, for example, the number of new ESG funds opening uh, per week. Um, and then we have also the difference in weekly growth rates of assets under management in ESG and non-ESG funds. And we test them and they lead to similar conclusions. So here in a univariate, uh, uh, how much time do I have still? Four more minutes. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you. So in a univariate setup, here's basically a univariate regression of the greenium on the left side, on the DAX, and the green spread on the DAX on the right side. And you see, well, there's a very strong relationship between the green spread and the DAX, but not really a relationship between the greenium and the stock market. 
So that's just to show you in a simple graph um, this relationship before we extend it to multivariate setup. Similarly, true for the VIX. And then for the oil future, actually, we have a reversal. Okay, so first the uh, results on the, on the DAX. So here you see the green spread in column one is significantly related with the DAX. However, the greenium, it's not. Then for the oil future, there's a positive relationship between the green spread and the price of oil futures and a negative one between the greenium and the price of oil futures, which is what we should expect because if the price of oil futures, futures goes up, that makes it less attractive. So green investments become more attractive, therefore the negative sign. Then if you take here our proxy, in this case, it's the dummy for German floods. And as I said, the results um, hold also if you use other proxies. The greenium gets larger if there are major events such as the devastating floods in Germany. So that shifts the investors' preferences towards more green. Um, so those are the, the key findings um, from, from this table. And we do the same also with the VIX um, instead of the DAX. So here it's not as clear as uh, in the DAX regression. However, you see the coefficient for the green spread is significantly larger than for the greenium. So it seems that our model still um, did its job, but I admit that, especially for the DAX, the results were um, uh, a bit stronger. So another benefit of our model is that it not only allows us to purge um, the green spread from those uh, confounding and idiosyncratic factor, but also it allows us to calculate expected returns. And there's not much to say. I mean, uh, we, we are able to do it using the coefficients from our model. Um, you see sometimes the expected returns, like here, for example, are pretty much in line with uh, the realized ones. But in other cases, uh, that's not really true. So uh, we can't calculate them, but there's not a particular pattern we can derive from doing that exercise. So to conclude, we say that our greenium um, serves as a benchmark for all uh, green uh, asset pricing um, because we are able to reflect in the greenium the non-pecuniary benefits from holding um, green assets. Uh, we see that the greenium is slightly larger than the green spread and it is not sensitive to the stock market uh, and volatility. And the greenium increases with the maturity. So we have an upward sloping term structure. Um, and then if you think of it in um, economic terms, what does it mean, for example, to the German government if um, the greenium is on average three basis points? So that means to the German government savings of around 870 uh, million euros. And just to give you an idea of if they issue 29 billion in green bonds, which uh, was the case until recently. Um, so I thank you uh, for uh, your attention and please, if you have any questions, um, let me know. Thanks a lot, Johannes. <laughs> Do we have questions? I have one. Oh, well, okay, go, please go. Yeah, uh, he was just asking me the same question and it's just related to something I was yeah. thinking before. So uh, you said that uh, it seems that the greenium is most related to, to, to investment in transportation. Exactly. So, yes. no, so, so basically the proceeds yeah. of the green bond yeah, sorry, were yeah. mostly used for um, rail projects. Right. So yeah. let me be provocative, given that I don't work in a central bank, I can claim this. <laughs> but, so this is just subsidizing, you know, com German companies. In, uh, I mean, mm -hmm. my first idea when I saw that is that this is just a way to subsidize German companies. And so uh, this should also be related to, to the DAX index. And then you said that uh, at the end that this is not really the case. So what am I missing in my reasoning? Okay, so the greenium is unrelated to, to the DAX, right? However, the green spread is related. 
So that's exactly what we would expect to find, right? So basically the price um, of the bonds might be indeed driven by what you call a subsidy, um, but that would be reflected in the spread, but not in the greenium. So basically our model did the job. That's, that's what it says. <coughs> Thank you. That's a good question. I have... Okay, so um, on the last or second to last point of your conclusion slide, I don't know whether, whether you have it. Um, um, anyway, I, I think you uh, draw, uh, draw the conclusion that this might help public investment into green. I would be very careful with that because, I mean, those infrastructure investments, they are done by the parliament like years ago, and now the debt management agency claims, mm -hmm. yeah, we are using this, um, we're using the proceeds of these green bonds for these investments, mm -hmm. but this is a bit ex post, right? So um, I would not be sure whether this is in actually having any real impact, but more like, uh, the, I mean, the nasty interpretation is the federal debt management is just taking, um, or like uh, exploiting green preferences by fixed income investors mm -hmm. to save money. So I think this goes definitely through. Yeah. With the other one, I would okay. be, careful because I think this it's not clear what is uh, wh whether there is any feedback to the investment decision okay um, just as a, um, no, thank as you a, a remark. comment um, so as you say like we also showed that basically there are savings to the government if they issue those green securities so there's just this incentive and you're right that we don't know what they already had planned basically in terms of green investments beforehand that's what you say basically we see exposed um, what they what they did um, so maybe we have to be a bit more careful on this interpretation here um, or dive a little deeper. Um, we also thought about an analysis of the primary market because that would basically also show us a little bit more about um, the savings there because that's maybe even more important than the secondary market for the, for the issuer. Um, but yes, uh, I agree that we have to be careful with the interpretation there. Um, I don't have the point, so I can't, I don't remember exactly what it was. Uh, what we said, um, but you're right that sometimes we only observe exposed what they have done and they were already planning to do this anyways. Okay, so if I may, I have a last question to ask too. Um, I was a bit surprised by the result on term structures of cranium that you gave, the one that were extracted from the model, yeah. since when you were used to tr term structures, most of the time, the highest volatility is situated on the short-term maturities. And here we can see uh, on slide 25 that the more reaction that you get is on the longest uh, maturity, mm. um, which is a bit striking for me. And then my question was, is there something that you deliberately put in your model that I didn't see that creates this result? Or is it something which was unexpected, but you could maybe explain to so basically we had no expectation that it was an observation after we had the results. Um, so there was nothing we put in the model to mechanically create an upward sloping term structure. Um, so that's just the result. We just basically minimize the, the residuals. So then we draw the lines based on the minimization of the residuals. And that those are the two lines on the conventional and on the green. And then if you look to serve the differences, it's an upward sloping term structure. So maybe what it means is that people are concerned about the long run consequences, I suppose. Um, and, uh, but there's nothing mechanic in our model that creates this, this slope. Okay, but just to comment, it was not about the slope, it was about the volatility of the ah, okay. water, but that's okay, thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Okay, it's now the time to thank everybody for this really nice presentation that we get this morning, especially first uh, for you, Johannes, but also for all the speakers that we had with us this morning. Thanks a lot for all of you, and thanks for the questions too. Hello, I, just, I would like first to introduce myself. I'm Peter Tankov and I will be the chairman of your session. And first of all, I would like to remind you that we are counting on about 35 minutes of, uh, of talk plus 10 minutes of questions. I hope that's fine with you. Yes, great. Great. And we will start uh, maybe in, in a few seconds, I guess. Okay. <laughs> so welcome, uh, welcome everyone. It is my great uh, pleasure and honor to introduce Professor James Stock. 
Professor Stock is a Harold Hitchens Burbank professor and vice provost for climate uh, and sustainability at Harvard University. His research uh, includes energy and environmental economics with focus on fuels and the United States climate policy. He is uh, the co-author of a leading undergraduate econometrics textbook, was uh, a member of President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors, and chair of Harvard Economics Department, and uh, co-editor of Econometrica, which is a top journal in, in economics. And today, today's presentation of Professor Stock will be devoted to transition risks, in particular transition risks in the short and medium term, and uh, to the impact of climate policy and climate policy uncertainty on them. Please, Professor Stock, the floor is now yours. Well, thanks so much. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here uh, today, and it was really kind of you to give me this invitation to this talk, uh, to, this, uh, to this conference. It looks like just a wonderful set of papers that are uh, being, uh, being uh, presented here. What I'm going to talk about um, today is, uh, so I, let me see, I just want to confirm, can you see my first slide just on the logistics? Hello? Yes, we do see your slides. Perfect. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. All right. Um, well, that's great. Um, so what I'm going to talk today uh, about is maybe stepping back narrowly from some, stepping back a bit uh, higher level from some of the specific topics within the conference on, uh, uh, on climate risk and especially the financial market side of climate risk and talk a little bit more about, uh, at first, just the big picture of what various climate risk, risks are from a macro perspective. And then I'm going to focus in on uh, some specific transition risks, both policy risk and energy <clears throat> and the transition and the risk posed by the transition to clean uh, uh, energy. Um, I, I think the main, so I, I think just to summarize the, the big picture of the talk here, um, there are a huge number of challenges that we're, we face as macroeconomists in terms of figuring out what the risks are, what the risks are going to be, uh, what the impact is going to be, and, um, and then what the, uh, 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 what, what, the, uh, what, the, what the costs are going to be and what the policy responses to those uh, impacts might be. I'm going to argue that some of the most important and most salient of these risks are uh, ones that are going to be happening in the relatively short term and are going to be associated with the energy transition and the policy uh, uncertainty associated with the energy transition. So I'm going to do that through a series of three uh, separate papers that I've been working on. So this is going to be a high level overview of three separate papers, but hopefully there'll be a, an underlying theme connecting these papers. Just um, making sort of a first, first level of, uh, of, of um, a summary here, it's uh, a nice uh, three-way breakdown of climate risks is physical transition and liability. And the physical risks are the ones that might first come to mind to somebody who's not a macroeconomist, like heat waves and sea level rise and that sort of thing. And then maybe in the more distant, somewhat more distant horizon, climate migration. The second category being uh, transition risks. And often one thinks of, uh, or at least initially, people thought of that as asset revaluations as coal companies cease to lose value. Uh, energy price volatility, food price volatility, and then uh, policy effects are, are examples of, of examples of transition risks. And I'm going to really be focusing on the transition risks uh, primarily uh, today, actually almost exclusively today. Uh, the, um, it's also useful to think about the timeline or the, the time frame in which these would have effects, some being at low frequencies, uh, you know, and, the, and the, this first, you know, one of the places that uh, economists first started in this whole enterprise, going dating back to Nordhaus, is thinking about how to measure the costs of uh, the damages associated, the monetary damages associated with emitting one more ton. And that really entails making very long-term predictions associated with the physical risks. So that's like the most grounded set of uh, long-term research that we've been doing. And that yields, among other things, thinking about the social cost of carbon and optimal long-term policy. But there's been a lot less work at the business cycle frequency. I'm going to argue that we need a lot more of that work today. Uh, a breakdown 
of these different categories. So and I'm just putting liability risks aside and focusing on trans physical and transition risks um, in the long term. These long run upper left hand corner here, the long run physical risks are usually the things that go into uh, that go into um, social cost of carbon. I guess mortality goes into the social cost of carbon now too. Uh, but you know, various things are going to be affecting GDP, economic output, uh, uh, mortality, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, sea level rise, destroying capital, and therefore reducing productivity, re reducing uh, output, per, per, uh, or at least labor productivity. Um, <clears throat> those are all going to be things that enter into the social cost of carbon. Uh, in the long run, there's transition risk too, uh, you know, how does how does policy, the policy choices that we make today could affect not only how quickly we uh, it make this green transition, but it could affect by it, it could affect things like long run productivity growth. If we um, affect efficient policies, then it could even enhance long term productivity growth as we move to an era of invention of new green technologies. And this, but on the other hand, it could uh, retard productivity growth if we do. Uh, do things in an inefficient way. What I'm going to focus on today, uh, this is the short run, I should mention, just to go through the, the upper right-hand corner, the short run. Uh, there are certainly short run effects, uh, hurricanes and droughts and so forth on business cycles. I think, you know, what we've seen over the last two years indicates that these, these short-term impacts are going to be much more uh, prevalent than we had perhaps thought even five years ago. If you think about the droughts, the droughts that Europe, the Euro, droughts and heat waves that Europe has experienced, the heat waves experienced in the United States and elsewhere, the drought, the uh, flooding in Pakistan, all of these are really catastrophic events. And clearly, uh, some of them rise to the level of having macro impacts. Obviously, the Pakistani uh, floods certainly rise to that level, uh, that, uh, that tragedy. But in developed economies, uh, these, I think, still remain uh, moderately, moderately sized, and ones that uh, ones that ones that are sort of managed through normal macro channels. What I'm going to really argue is that the the big question marks are in the lower right hand uh, corner, and that's having to do with uh, the transition risks, both policy risks associated with the policy transition, and then uh, and then I think going down the list, uh, geopolitical risks. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about Ukraine and the. And, and, and interpreting Ukraine in terms of uh, its impact on energy markets, which are you know pretty salient, but also in terms of uh, an example of the geopolitical risks that we might be facing going forward. Um, I think this is this is an area where there's an awful lot that we simply don't know. Uh, we've been taken by surprise in a number of you know a number of significant ways uh, by. Uh, the, uh, by uh, the, the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, and I imagine there's going to be more uh, sub more such surprises coming down the road. One thing to stress in this is the magnitude of the challenge ahead of us. So, if we think about policy risk, it, you know, the policy transition risk is enormous because the policies that are needed to get us onto uh, the pathways that we should, even if it's like a two degree pathway. Uh, there's an enormous gap. So this this picture shows uh, the gap between uh, to a 1.5 degree pathway and where we uh, arguably are right now. Uh, you know, most most uh, most folks or most experts think that the 1.5 degree pathway is simply not achievable at this point. But even to get on a two degree pathway would require an enormous change in terms of uh, in terms of policy. Um, so the the challenge of the transition is enormous. I think uh, it will entail disruptions and uncertainties that we can only guess at. Guess at. And of course, I'm showing a picture here of the uh, methane, uh, methane uh, bursting out of the uh, Nord Stream, uh, Nord Stream One pipeline after it was uh, uh, after it was after it was uh, bre breached, um, breached, uh, and 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 I think the implications are going to be increasingly complex. So uh, this this chart here. Um, this chart here is a very sobering one for economists. So uh, as a result, in, for a number of reasons, I would argue mainly because of energy prices and other supply chain things coming out of COVID, but, you know, potentially because of 
uh, additional stimulus uh, in the COVID response. Uh, we've had a lot of inflation, both globally and especially in the United States. This is a particularly sobering chart that uh, summarizes uh, this, the uh, uh, consensus forecasts of inflation over time. So it plots where inflation was and then what the forecasts were over time. And you can see that the forecasts were consistently far, far, far too optimistic. Uh, and they remain, uh, looking at this chart, they remain fairly optimistic. Uh, although I have to say that I'm among those that have an optimistic view of inflation. But, uh, but still, it is, uh, it, this is really sobering at how we basically got it wrong. Okay. So um, I'm going to draw on three different things, uh, three different papers. One of them is uh, a paper with Gib Metcalf, which is actually coming uh, forthcoming in AEJ Macro. Another one is work in progress with um, Konstantinos Gavrilidis, uh, Diego Kanzig, and myself uh, on climate policy uncertainty. Uh, and then the final one is on uh, is on uh, is on more on focusing on natural gas prices, and I think some interesting implications. And I, the the context of this final one, the way this actually the final one fits in, is that it really is exploring some of these things that were quite unexpected early on in the uh, early on in uh, you know since let's say pre Ukraine and things that have been really surprising developments that could be quite consequential macroeconomically. Part of it is inflation, but actually part of it is going to be relating to uh, economic. Um, macroeconomic dynamics. Okay, so I'm going to just launch into this. The first of these, I think I'm going to go fairly quickly through because it's a, it's the paper itself is a couple of years old and it's forthcoming. So um, it, it might be that some of you have actually seen this and I don't want to bore anybody. Um, so the first one of these uh, examples, it, it, I think that the, the, message, the message here the message is stepping back. The message is we're going to be facing a lot of climate risks. Uh, the climate risks that are the most pressing on my mind are the transition risks. Transition risks entail policy risks and um, <clears throat> and energy transition risks. So those are those are distinct concepts. The policy risks can be mitigated by having good policy. So the first example here is going to be good policy and the conclusion is good policy doesn't need to have and doesn't seem to have particularly substantial macro costs so we actually can make you know there's evidence to suggest that we if by if we tackle the climate challenge through good policy that we can do so uh, without obtain have some substantial cost the second example is the one with um, Constantinos and Diego. And there, that's going to look more at the United States, where it is far from, until very recently, we have had essentially completely incoherent policy. And we will find that there's some evidence that this incoherent policy and the uncertainty associated with incoherent climate policy has actually been economically costly in the United States. And then the third part of the story is going to be focusing on the unknown unknowns of using the Ukraine invasion of natural gas in particular uh, 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 as an example of, uh, of, um, of, 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 you know, largely large consequences of things that are argue, that are clearly related to, maybe not caused by, but clearly related to the, uh, to the uh, energy transition. Okay, anyway, on the first one of these things, there's a bunch of papers on a carbon tax, uh, most of them focus on the effect on emissions. There's smaller uh, number of papers that focus on uh, the effects on GDP and employment. Um, those particular papers uh, tend to focus on a few specific examples, uh, like in the British Columbia example has been heavily studied, but that's just a single case study. Uh, and we're gonna look more systematically. Uh, Konzig, Diego Konzig and his uh, paper from last year, a uh, paper from earlier this year, uh, has uh, studied the EU emissions trading system. Of course, that's not a carbon tax. Uh, he finds somewhat different results than we do, but um, but there's um, there's some, a number. I could discuss that in the Q and A, but I, I think that the main point is that that's it, is the ETS has a lot more price volatility than a carbon tax, and that you know arguably one could interpret his results as indicating difficulties with price volatility. Okay. 
So uh, what we do in the, this first of these three, the, the trio of papers, is we look at um, we look at uh, the EU um, plus Iceland and Norway and Switzerland, which are the countries in the European Emission Trading System. Fifteen of those have a carbon tax. Uh, we look at annual data from 1985 through 2018. And uh, carbon tax, uh, carbon tax countries, year of adoption, and the rates are in the table here. And what you can see is that there's a great deal, both from that and from the picture, there's a great deal of variation in the data. And that's, how, that's of course, very helpful from an econometric perspective. Uh, the rates range from, uh, you know, I guess Poland barely counts as having a carbon tax in these data, that it covers 4% of emissions with a 16 cent per uh, ton uh, rate. But of course, it gets much more substantial than that. Uh, uh, many countries are in the $20, $30 range. Sweden, Finland, uh, the Nordic countries are in a higher, uh, higher level uh, than that. So, um, and, and the range of emissions is about 30 or 40 percent. The reason is that these carbon taxes, uh, especially in the period that we studied, uh, focus, as I'm sure many in the audience know, focus on um, uh, focus on stationary sources and stationary source, excuse me, focus on mobile sources. Stationary sources are covered by the ETS and the carbon taxes typically cover uh, sectors, mainly transportation that is not covered by the ETS. So the carbon taxes are uh, on essentially transportation taxes. Um, there's been some, and, and, and within that essentially on road diesel uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. Okay. Uh, so what do we do on this? The method here is going to actually be the same method as we use in the paper with Diego, which is local projections, which is just a cousin for the, probably many are familiar with local projections. It's just a cousin of structural vector autoregressions. Actually, it's much closer than a cousin of structural vector autoregressions. I'll, I'm going to give a quick plug for a wonderful paper last year in Econometrica by uh, uh, Christian Wolf and Michael Plodberg Moeller, where they go through uh, the details of the relationship between structural vector autoregressions and local projections. And uh, the answer is that they're, they, in population, they're the same thing. Uh, and uh, in finite sample, they seem to be awfully darn close. And exactly why they're so close is they asymptotically going to be the same thing. And uh, in, 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 in finite sample, there seems to be an awful lot of similarities, and they explain why that is. So, um, so it's a really wonderful paper on the methodology here. The, the, basic, the basic identification assumption that we'll use exploits a particular feature of taxes, which is that the, um, which is that the tax rate needs to be set in advance. So you can't, you, the, uh, a, a, tax rate, a tax rate has to evolve according to a schedule and has to be announced in advance. So that means that the tax rate on any, in any particular year is going to be, at, the tax rate going on this year is independent of events this year because the tax rate had to be set in advance. So that's the basic, the basic, uh, the basic identification structure. And that, that gives an exclusion restriction and we're able to identify off of that exclusion restriction. Okay, so I calibrate all the results to be a $40 tax covering 30% of emissions, which is typical in the data set. And so here's a picture of results. I'm just gonna have one page summarizing all of the different results and sensitivity results and so forth. But basically what we find, if you look in the upper right-hand corner, this is the cumulative effect on GDP growth, which is to say, it is the, it is the effect on the log level of GDP. Okay, so what happens initially upon imposition, if you look at, if you, if you stare at this and you look like right at what happens on impact, there seems to be a slight bump up in GDP, but it's not statistically significant. It's not within a, you know, one standard error band. And then it sort of seems the level seems to decline a little bit, and then it seems to go up a little bit, and then it seems to go down, and, and then it sort of seems to be a little bit below at the end. But the point is, like, all of those really small fluctuations of the level of GDP out through six years after implementation of a change in the tax rate uh, are not statistically significant, uh, you know, even at, within a one standard error band. So essentially what we're seeing is no effect on the log level of GDP, which is maybe a little bit surprising. Uh, you might, a classical, neoclassical model would suggest that moving to the social optimum, which incorporates the externality cost of the carbon tax, 
would result in a distortion to what would otherwise be the private uh, equilibrium. And the private equilibrium would be the one would be maximizing, would be having a higher level of GDP and output. And then you, by you're changing the prices, and so you're moving to a less efficient allocation of capital. And so you're going to have a, a lower, lower level of GDP. And, you know, maybe you could squint and see that at the end, but it's not statistically significant. So this is basically saying that this is really not not much of an effect. Um, if you look at uh, the employment effect, the employment effect also is, well, that's basically zero after six years. There's basically no employment effect uh, after six years. So so the effect on macroeconomic uh, indicators of GDP and employment uh, is basically nothing. Um, in terms of emissions, you actually see around a two to six percent reduction, which is not a very big re reduction, but it's clearly there. It's significant, certainly with outside of one standard deviation, and then um, and then it, the, and then in many places of two standard deviations. So it's a you know it's clearly there's clearly a reduction in emissions. It's not a very big reduction in emissions, but you wouldn't expect a big reduction in emissions from a carbon tax that mainly covers transportation. Uh, or in some cases, heating. And if it covers transportation and heating, there's not too many things you can do, especially in this historical period, to substitute out from using uh, using um, petroleum-based fuels. And what that means is that basically you're just moving along a pretty inelastic demand curve. And if you take just pretty well-estimated elasticities of demand for uh, for transportation fuels, you find, uh, and then and then uh, and then tax and then price increases would be consistent with about a forty dollar carbon tax. What you find is you find uh, uh, reductions in this order of magnitude. So this is all expected. Um, you would expect to see much larger uh, when there's options. When you have options like buying an EV, or when you have options if this is covering stationary sources. When you have options such as moving to wind and solar, you'd expect to see longer term effects and those would probably occur at in you know in the three to six year horizon. Uh, but but during the time period covered there were not really those options for substitution for the for the way that energy services were delivered so that so you basically were locked into fossil fuel most of the time in most cases. Okay. So that's 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 case number one. Case number one is basically that you can have effective carbon policy uh, that is um, that, that certainly could be much bigger in terms of its consequences on emissions than than, than this actually uh, than, than our estimates are. If once you have clean things to substitute into, but they have very little effect on uh, GDP or employment. That is, you can have macroeconomic stable macroeconomic outcomes with um, with with uh, reliable and uh, efficient policy. The second example is that what's happening in the United States and what's been happening in the United States. And I think this, this, this slide here summarizes the transitions of, of, of climate policy that we've seen over the course of the last uh, decade at least, arguably more, in the United States. The slide on the left, these are both the Bureau of Land Management is the entity in the United States that is responsible for um, managing a lot of federal lands, and in particular, the United States is a little different than other countries. That in every country is a little different in terms of the way it does its mineral leasing. Uh, the, we have a fair amount of minerals that are under federal jurisdiction, uh, and those minerals include oil and gas and coal. And the Bureau of Land Management is responsible for oil and gas and coal leasing, federal fossil fuel leasing, uh, under um, under. Uh, uh, on, 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 on federal lands. Um, the, the footprint, the federal footprint in oil and gas is fairly modest, maybe 20 or 25% of production, a little less than that for gas. For coal, it's quite substantial. It's around 40 to 45% of overall U.S. production. So about 40 to 45% of U.S. coal is produced on federal lands. That's managed by the Bureau of Land Management. The Bureau of Land Management is also responsible for getting people out and having fun and doing stuff on federal lands. And so, so in one administration, and you could probably, you know, take a guess, one of these is going to be the Bureau of Land Management web landing page under the Trump administration. And one of them is the Bureau of Land Management landing page under the Biden administration. And you can probably take a guess as to which is which. This is a really, really big coal seam. This is like, this coal seam is about 20 meters deep. It's, this is just an incredible seam of subbituminous coal in, um, in, uh, 
in Wyoming. And I'm not exactly sure where this picture is, but it sure looks like a nice place to visit. So this is under the Biden administration. This is under the Trump administration. So clearly, we've had these transitions in policy. What we're going to do in this paper uh, is take a look at, let's try to quantify the effect of policy vicissitudes, or more precisely, climate policy uncertainty on uh, macroeconomic outcomes. So as I mentioned, this is joint work with um, Constantinos. Constantinos had written an early draft of a paper uh, with a particular index, and uh, we decided that it made sense. We, we were doing the same thing, and we saw his paper, and we, we teamed up. There's a, been some other work in this area, too. There's a, a nice paper by, uh, I mean, Rob Engel and a team of folks have looked at not climate policy uncertainty, but just climate policy news and its effect on stock prices. That was refined by Puccini et al. to look at stock prices. Um, there's a paper by Basiglia, um, oh, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that, uh, that is looking at climate policy uncertainty in firm level investment and finds negative effects on firm level investment. And that's, of course, consistent with the, 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 the um, real option value uh, approach to firm investment. So, um, what we're contributing here is we're looking at the effects on macroeconomic activity and seeing if we can tease out any effects. One of the challenges, and you can see this looking at this picture right here, one of the challenges of teasing out climate policy uncertainty effects is that you need to recognize that climate policy uncertainty effects are going to be correlated with economic policy uncertainty effects. So the picture I just showed you was a picture of a transition from the BLM, the Bureau of Land Management under Trump, to the Bureau of Land Management under Biden. But of course, many other things changed between Trump and Biden. And there's economic changes across the board. And just as they raised, just as that transition or specific actions uh, raise climate policy uncertainty questions, uh, they also raise overall economic policy uncertainty questions. So um, one of the big challenges is trying to sort of tease out uh, climate policy uncertainty from economic policy uncertainty. The approach that we use to constructing the index is we're using a number of different approaches. And I want to stress this is work in progress. Um, we're looking, uh, we look at news articles that contain both climate terms and policy terms and uncertainty terms. So that's the sense of which is climate policy uncertainty. We do an eight newspaper version. We do a two newspaper version. Uh, I'm sorry, the eight newspaper version has been extended back now to 1987. So these that, that data is wrong there. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and then you see spikes in sensible places, like around announcements of events. Uh, but, but the trouble is that, you know, the, the, I wouldn't say the trouble, but the reality is that there's correlation. This is a Baker Bloom Davis economic policy and certainty measure, which uh, has been around for a long time, came out fairly recently in the QJE. And the correlation between our measures uh, is pretty high, either 0.6 if you look at one of them, or 0.4 if you look at another one of them, with the Baker Bloom Davis Economic Policy Uncertainty Index. So, so when we're going we're to need to control for uh, control for general economic uncertainty, when we then look at the additional or incremental effect of economic policy uncertainty. So, this the Baker Bloom Davis is going to be an important control variable in our exercise. So again, we're going to use local projection methods, also structural vector auto regression methods. Uh, we'll have contemporaneous variables as controls, uh, which will include, for example, unemployment rate, industrial production, PC inflation. Uh, we use WTI, we've we used Brent instead. Um, but importantly, the key, a key one is the Baker, Baker Bloom Davis Economic Policy Uncertainty Index. And then the assumption is that sort of controlling for those that the innovation in economic policy uncertainty is uh, is uh, uh, the innovation in economic policy uncertainty is un uncorrelated with any of the uh, is, is 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 can be treated as con conditionally mean independent or weak exogenous. Okay, so um, so so that's the. So let me just look at let's look at results. We have some impulse some impulse result impulse responses. With respect to one standard deviation change, uh, I'm just going to show you a few of them so I can try to keep on schedule. Uh, here is um, here is some impulse response. Upper left hand corner is on the unemployment rate, and what you can see is that uh, one standard deviation change in the index is associated with um, an increase in the unemployment rate. 
you know, maybe not as sharp as it could be. There's pretty, you know, there's uncertainty here. So it's uh, maybe one, but this is the, this is the one standard deviation band. So it's, you know, uh, you know, you know, the impulse response usually would be recording one standard deviation band and it's, there is this increase, but it's not, uh, it's not economic, it's not really sharp. Uh, there's a, there, it seems to be associated with a decline in the treasury bill rate. So there seems to be some accommodation associated with this. So if you have this increase in economic, uh, in, in uh, climate policy uncertainty, there's a decrease in the, uh, this, the Fed seems to accommodate that somewhat. Um, industrial production has a fairly weak response. Uh, there seems to be no coherent response to inflation. So I'd say this is, I, I don't, I don't want to oversell this evidence. I'd say it's suggestive evidence. Um, I, I, it, it is, um, it, it, it's suggestive evidence that there's um, some negative consequences. I think we need, we're going to be doing more work on this. This is an ongoing work in progress, uh, and, but it's, it's consistent with the rest of the literature that climate policy uncertainty is uh, having these negative effects on the economy. I'm gonna skip over a couple of these slides here um, because I do wanna talk about the final the final one. Okay, the final point, and I mean, it's, it's a, I feel a little bit of hesitation coming from the United States and trying to talk about the Ukraine situation in Europe uh, to an audience that is you know, immersed in this and challenged by this every day. Uh, so maybe what I'm going to do is I'm going to point out the, just one or uh, maybe one or two of the uh, of the big and unexpected uh, features uh, so it, of, of Ukraine in, impact on, 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 on energy market, but also on the economy. And and I think the, the, the way I'm interpreting this is like a, a case study. So the basic argument, the basic argument is this, which is that, of course, the invasion of Ukraine is primarily motivated by um, profoundly misguided perceptions by Putin and his inner circle and decisions that were made in Russia. It really does seem to me that part of that decision making process would have to have been a realization that as we make this energy transition, Russia is going to be increasingly less, have increasingly less leverage over Europe and increasingly less revenues. So that if, a, if an invasion like this were to be undertaken, it should be undertaken at, you know, an opportune time for them financially in terms of maximizing their oil uh, and uh, especially gas leverage over the rest of the world. Um, if you view it through that lens, this is certainly not a pro the proximate cause of this is, is well, being hostage to fossil fuels, but also the, the proximate cause of this is um, being, uh, is, is the, the proximate cause of this is, 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 is not, is not, is not the energy transition, but it is supported, it is supported by the fact that we are having this energy transition. So, so this, I think, the way I look at that, and I know this is a bit potentially a reach that you could argue with, is that this is a bit of a case study of what we might see in the future as we have more geopolitical stresses associated with the energy transition. So this picture here essentially tells the story. And what, what, what's so interesting about this, this is, so the, what are we looking at here? What we're looking at here is the WTI oil price uh, 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 and in, this is in dollars per barrel. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, I've converted it to dollars per MMBTU on an energy parity basis. And then this is the Henry Hub uh, spot price. This is the main price for natural gas in the United States. And what the, the point of this slide is that there's essentially been three episodes. The first episode was a long time ago, which was when these two were used as substitutes for um, for uh, uh, for production of electricity in the power sector, we stopped using oil as a as a product in the power sector in around 2006 2007. And we transferred into a transitional regime, and then then we really moved into a new regime, this regime two, which was the period where we did an awful lot of hydraulic fracturing or fracking. Uh, that's where fracking started basically in 2010. 
and we have seen a uh, and in, and we saw a really de- low uh, low of prices domestically of natural gas, and those prices essentially became completely detached from international oil prices. What we've seen recently is as the U.S. has started to export natural gas, we've re-engaged with the, with the world market. And since maybe 2020, certainly, uh, we have uh, seen domestic prices rise in line, maybe with a different coefficient, but in line with uh, world prices of oil. And that is a, a really important development because what it means is that to a big extent, the U.S. now, by reconnecting to the world market, well, first of all, that means that we get to provide natural gas to Europe. That's a good thing. Uh, but what it also means is that we're exposing ourselves to a lot more macro volatility than we have been before. And that macro volatility is now going to be translated not just through oil prices, but through natural gas prices, which is a really large component of our uh, energy mix domestically and especially of our, and it's the largest source of uh, electricity. So it's a a big driver of electricity costs in the United States as well. So we expect, I expect to see, you know, increasing energy price volatility, uh, increasing macroeconomic impacts of natural gas and world oil prices uh, because of this reconnection relative to this period of considerable quiescence uh, in the mid-2000s. So I think that I'm out of time. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip over all these really fun slides. Uh, I'm going to skip over all these really fun slides about the consequences of that. Um, obviously, I misjudged my time, but I'm going to leave you with some, uh, leave you just with some thoughts, which is uh, basically that we should not be expecting this transition to be smooth uh, or easy and that there's going to be a lot of difficult to predict transition risks. Uh, the picture that I have below here is of the uh, of failure, the breakdown of the Phillips curve. Uh, that's, to, that's the real source of everybody making their mispredictions of, uh, of uh, what inflation is going to be looking like over the next few uh, years that we started out with. And, um, and, I, and, and that is, I think, largely attributable to uh, uh, shifts back to, uh, to uh, an, er- an earlier period of, um, of, of, of oil price volatility affecting prices in the United States. So I think what I'll do is I'll just stop right there and leave time for, leave, we still have a fair amount of time for questions. Okay. Open for discussion. Are there any questions? Uh in the room. And also, please feel free, for those who are attending online, please feel free to type your questions in the chat box. Uh, Thanks a lot. Uh, I was wondering if um, you could uh, say something about the the existence of, you know, dif- of a window of opportunity for climate policy. I mean, the discussion of what's are there macro conditions or also conditions on the energy market where you think there is, it's more suitable to implement macro policy at some point, uh, climate policy at some point, and at others? Yeah. Um, so, oh, I, I think there's some, I hear some echo. Are we, okay. So, so I think that's, that's really a great question. Um, It's a it's a very complicated question. I, I think in the United States, it, it appears as though most likely our window of opportunity has closed mainly for political reasons, uh, because we are now going to have split Congress, at least for the next couple of years. Uh, so the window of opportunity for implementing it at state level is probably is, is it remains open in, in many of the states, but for implementing it at a national level, I think is largely closed. I think that you know, I, I don't want to really speculate about what what that would be, what that would be in Europe. Um, obviously, you know, I think one of the other side consequences of the invasion of uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine is that it's made us all incredibly more aware that that, that we that we need to, in addition to needing to make the clean energy transition, we need to do so in a way that supports um, stable and affordable uh, 
fossil fuel energy during that transition. And we also need to support uh, energy reliability. So we need to have reliable and affordable energy as we make the transition to clean energy. And the, of course, the huge risk is the focus on reliable and affordable energy drives out the transition to clean energy. One of the reasons that we did the study of natural gas prices is that there's a lot of concern in the United States that because of all this build out of LNG export cap capacity, that what we're doing is locking in long term, um, long term fossil fuel, uh, long term fossil fuel uh, uh, infrastructure that's going to make the energy transition more difficult and retarded. Um, my view, and I didn't go through this because I didn't organize because of, because of time, um, and perhaps it's not completely germane. Uh, my view is actually that that's not correct. That that the LNG export by by connecting us to world natural gas prices, we're going to see natural gas prices in the United States that are a lot higher than they've been historically over the last 10 years. And because they're going to be a lot higher than they've been over the last 10 years, it's going to mean that we're going to be using less and less natural gas. And this is actually acting like, in effect, like a carbon tax on the United States power sector, so that the power sector's transition is going to be expedited. Our estimates is that the order of magnitude of the effect of the additional LNG export channel and the higher world prices is of the same order of magnitude as the recent major legislation that we passed, the Inflation Reduction Act. So we're seeing significant climate event impacts, but, but not through the policy channels. Any other questions in the room? Well, I, I do have a question from an online participant that I will now read. My perception is that the program that has been presented is based on existing tools and techniques. How appropriate is that given that the trajectory that the world might follow will be well over two degrees of warming? For example, wouldn't system thinking, system dynamic modeling be more suitable? Oh. So, so I think, you know, we could be looking at very different, very different dynamics for very, you know, I'm not so sure. So I'm going to, I'm going to actually say, I think that it's, I think that one has to have faith in the stability of many macroeconomic relations. So we get shocked by new things all the time. I'm, I'm arguing that we're not going to be able to predict these shocks. Of course, that's sort of by the nature, we're not going to be able to predict their shocks that we should expect to see really big shocks. The shocks that we've seen so far, they're like giant energy shocks, uh, shocks to other parts of the system that we can't really anticipate. But that doesn't necessarily mean that our underlying basic dynamics are, are going to be changing in major ways. So sure, you know, what would I be saying about macroeconomic policy in 2050, short term macroeconomic policy and monetary policy in 2050? I don't think I have anything to say about that. What I'm really talking about is over the next 10 years, the next 15 years, as we really make a, a big push on this energy transition, I, I'm not really worried about the macroeconomic tools uh, that are available. I think that they're a pretty robust set of tools. Um, I'm, I'm more interested in uh, more interested in really making sure we're really, really able to handle the shocks that are going to be coming up. Thank you. So we might still have time for maybe for one last question. No, this does not seem to be the case. Well, otherwise, let us just thank Professor Stock again for sharing his insights with us today. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Okay, so we've got another session now, starting on physical risk. And Antoine, I'm looking at you because uh, you are the one moderating this session. Uh, I'm going to give you... Uh, the agenda for you to know who is com coming first, and I think it's you, Tristan, uh, who's coming first. So please, Tristan, come on stage. Thanks. Uh, well, thanks. So welcome to this uh, second section of the afternoon. And the first paper is by Tristan Jourde uh, and co-author. So Tristan from is from the Banque de France, and he's on systemic climate risk. So Tristan, I take it that you have 20 minutes, like the other speakers, and remaining time for Q and A. Oh, is yours. Thanks. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, first, many thanks to the organizer for accepting my paper. 
Uh, this is joint work with Quentin Moreau from uh, University of Glasgow, uh, and I'm uh, Tristan Jourd from Banque de France. So I'm going to present you uh, a paper about systemic climate risk in which we uh, develop a market-based framework to assess the effect of climate risk on the systemic risk of the financial sector. Um, so here on, on the chart, uh, you can see the main theoretical links between climate risk uh, and financial institutions. And as you can see, there is no direct link between them. So the potential effect of climate risk on financial institution uh, goes through the exposure of financial institution to non-financial sectors. Okay, and uh, our framework uh, try to uh, represent the three circles on the right. Okay, we are not considering the potential feedback loop. So we uh, are looking at both transition risk and physical risk. Uh, then we uh, build some uh, market-based climate risk factors to uh, estimate the um, impact of climate risk on non-financial sector through, for instance, business interruption. And then once we have these climate risk factors, we are looking at the um, effect of climate risk on financial institution through uh, the direct exposure to credit and market risk. And uh, also, and this is one of the main originality of the paper, also through the potential amplification effect, so contagion effect, uh, uh, that's rising from climate risk due to the existence of a um, financial interconnection network. So as I was saying, we design a market-based framework uh, in which we study uh, first so the first round effect of climate risk on financial institutions that goes through a decrease in the value of financial portfolios. Uh, and we also capture the potential second round effect of climate risk on financial institution due to contagion effects. So the key questions we try to answer uh, with this framework are the following. Which are the most vulnerable financial institutions? Can climate risk generate contagion effect among financial institutions? And finally, is it possible to uh, take action to mitigate uh, systemic climate risk for financial institutions or for policymakers? Um, so first, let me start uh, by giving some uh, intuition for using our market-based framework. Uh, the main idea is that financial institutions will be impacted through the repricing on, of, the, uh, of the financial assets. So it seems only natural to use a market-based framework from that perspective. And the main purpose of our paper is to examine whether climate risks are reflected into asset prices and to uh, check whether these climate shocks are already propagating to the financial institution and also among the financial institutions. So we take an investor point of view, uh, which, uh, is, which differs with the forward-looking approach of the regulator, uh, which is based on the current holdings of financial institutions and on long-term scenarios. Okay. Uh, it, um, the, the, the regulator approach, since it is based on long-term scenarios, uh, is subject to uncertainty. Uh, our framework just complement this by giving uh, the, an, an investor point of view. So the, the, the current effect we estimate on the market, do shocks already propagate uh, to the financial sector and uh, among financial institutions? So we can decompose the framework into uh, four different steps. The two first steps you can see here is to develop some inputs, and then we will use these inputs into a regression framework. So first we need to uh, build a systemic risk measure, a market-based one. Uh, 
Uh, that capture two very important elements of systemic risk, which is tail risk, individual tail risk, and then the contagion effects. So to do that, uh, we uh, first dynamically estimate the value at risk of each financial institution using equity data uh, and GARSH models. Uh, and then we extract the covariation between all these value at risk using a PCA analysis based on the correlation matrix. Um, so this systemic risk measure is uh, related to uh, other measures in the literature. Uh, I'm not saying it's better, but it's more suited to the purpose of our study. Um, then we built some uh, market-based climate risk factors, a la FAMA and, and French 1993. But instead of using the, the size characteristic and the value characteristic, we use the climate characteristics. So we disentangle between transition risk. Okay, for, for transition risk, we use the climate intensity, scope one and two. And uh, to, rep to, to get um, a factor representing, representing physical risk, we use the physical scores of true cost. Uh, and these factors are supposed to capture the effect of climate shocks on the value of non-financial firms. So then we use these two inputs into a regression framework. So this is a two-pass procedure. The first step is to uh, run some time series regression uh, of the variation, the time variation of systemic risk on uh, our climate risk factors plus a number of control variables. And uh, then we uh, run a cross-sectional regression of the financial institution contribution to systemic risk on the financial institution exposure to climate risk, which have been previously estimated. Uh, the final step of the framework is um, to, to consider the characteristics of financial institu institutions that are correlated with uh, the climate risk exposure. So we look at many different potential determinants, financial characteristic, ESG data. Uh, we look at the uh, scope three of financial institution, which are the carbon emission induced by the financial portfolio uh, of the financial institutions. Uh, we also look at institutional ownership and also some ESG disclosure data. So here we just have a summary of the framework. First, we design some inputs, then we run some regressions. And finally, we look at the potential actions that can help to mitigate the systemic climate risk. Uh, we contribute to three different strands of literature. Uh, the first one uh, has been described before and is developing uh, very quickly in the literature. This is about the integration of climate risk uh, into asset prices. So uh, regarding this literature, uh, we build uh, a method to assess whether extreme climate risk have an impact on uh, the tail risk of, uh, of uh, equity markets. And I'm mentioning here that the framework is flexible because here we, we use it for, for financial institution, but it could be used for other sectors, other uh, time frame, other uh, asset types, other countries, and so on. Uh, our main contribution uh, is on the second strength of literature, um, um, which uh, look at the effect of climate risk on financial stability. So, regard, so most of the paper in this literature look at the direct impact of climate risk on uh, individual financial institution. Our contribution here is to take into account the potential tail risk dependence that might arise from climate change, so the, 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 the contagion effects. Uh, and finally, we are looking at uh, many different determinants of our uh, newly uh, designed measure of tail climate risk. So <laughs> once we have defined the framework, we apply it to a sample of European financial, financial institution. The data goes uh, from 2005 to 2022. 
uh, we have more than uh, 300 uh, stocks for financial institutions that represent uh, all types of financial industries. So we have banks, insurers, financial services, and uh, real estate companies. And uh, to build our climate risk factors, we use uh, thousands of uh, both active and dead non-financial European stocks. Uh, for all these, uh, these companies, uh, we download uh, many different uh, data. So we have financial data from data stream. We have environmental data. So we have carbon emissions scope one and two, uh, carbon emissions scope three for financial institution that come from carbon four. Uh, and we also use the physical risk score from true cost. Uh, then we look at the institutional ownership of the financial institution. So who holds the financial institutions in terms of sector? For this, we are using uh, the uh, NECB database, uh, which is called Securities Holding Statistics. Uh, and we also uh, use a large <coughs> set of systematic risk factors and also some market stress factors as control variables in the regressions. Uh, so first, we compute some results for individual exposure to climate risk by financial institutions. So the idea here is that we uh, are looking at, um, as a dependent vari variable, we take the dynamic value at risk of financial institution and we regress it on uh, our transition risk factor here and the physical risk factor here. And here we have uh, a bunch of uh, control variables. Um, we are interested into these coefficients there and there, okay, which is the sensibility of the value at risk of each financial institution to uh, our climate risk factors. Um, we do that for each financial institution, then we aggregate the results using the, uh, the mean group estimator of Pesaran. And then you can see on the two charts that the exposure of financial institutions to climate risk uh, have been rising over time. Uh, and it is uh, positive and significant only for tra transition risk. Okay, for physical risk, uh, it's uh, negative at the beginning and it's not really significant. Uh, now that I have shown you the, the result for individual stocks, uh, we, we study the, the effect of climate risk on potential contagion effects. Okay, to do that, um, the, the, the first regression, the time series one, is pretty similar to the one I have shown you before. But instead of having the individual value at risk of each financial institution, we take the first principal component of all these value at risk, which represent the covariation in tail risk of uh, among financial institutions. And again, we regress it on uh, the, the, um, the climate risk factors and uh, a bunch of control variables. Um, and then we uh, run some cross-sectional regression. Okay, so as a dependent variable here, I have the contribution of each financial institution to tail risk dependence. Okay, uh, these are just the weights on the first principal component here of each financial institution. And uh, I'm regressing this on the exposure of each financial institution uh, on, uh, on climate risk, okay, which have been estimated uh, in, the previous, uh, in the previous slide, uh, and also on the exposure of each financial institution to many different uh, market stress factors. So the results, um, so again, BMG here is for transition risk and VMS for physical risk. What we can show is that the coefficient for transition risk is positive and significant, both in the time series dimension and in the cross-sectional dimension, meaning that uh, transition risks already affect uh, systemic risk, creating some contagion effects, while uh, there is no uh, impact for physical risk as the coefficient is uh, either negative and non-significant. Um, 
I wanted to mention that the results are robust to many different sets of control factors. Uh, here on the cross-sectional regression, we can uh, add some uh, fixed effect and we can clusterize standard errors. Okay, now uh, we turn to the last um, step of the framework, which is uh, looking at the characteristic correlated with the exposure to climate risk. Here, the, the table is for the exposure to transition risk. Okay, so what we can see here uh, is that the, the larger the financial institution, uh, the higher the exposure to transition risk which is in line with some results uh, of the, the last uh, climate stress test of the ECB for banks. And also we have some quite intuitive results there. So the, the more polluting the portfolio, the higher the exposure to, transi to transition risk. Uh, also, if a financial institution is more concerned about the long term, uh, the exposure to tra transition risk is lower. And finally, uh, when the institutional ownership for one financial institution is higher, we find a lower uh, transition risk exposure, uh, which can be due to the fact that uh, institutional investors are more concerned about the long run. Uh, for physical risk exposure, we do not find uh, that many significant uh, coefficients, but here there is something interesting. So we find that the larger the financial institution, the, the lower the exposure to physical risk, which tend to make sense since uh, a bigger institution can diversify away its exposure in different areas. And, and then we look at some adaptation measure that a financial institution could take. So here we can see that the higher the exposure to transition risk, uh, the higher the level of ESG disclosure by financial institutions. And for physical risk, we find that uh, financial institutions that are uh, very exposed to physical risk tend uh, to engage in some initiative to reduce their environmental foot footprint. Um, but here we, we still have some work to do to uh, maybe better uh, deal with uh, potential double causality. So as a conclusion, um, we have uh, designed a market-based framework to uh, answer two main questions. Uh, so what, which are the financial institutions most exposed to uh, take climate risk and also uh, to detect the potential contagion effect arising from climate risk? Um, we find that transition risk is already a significant, a significant risk uh, for the financial stability. Uh, and it is not the case for physical risk, uh, which is in line with some results in the literature based on survey showing that physical risk could be a, a, a more long-term risk, could happen in 30 years in the future, for instance. Uh, then we show that financial institutions with cleaner investment portfolio and higher institutional ownership are less exposed to transition risk. So uh, basically, uh, the financial institution and also the policymaker could act against uh, this, uh, this risk for the financial system. And finally, I wanted to remind that the framework is flexible. It can be used to, uh, for different countries, different sectors, uh, different asset types, and also potentially different types of risk. So for instance, we could uh, use it to assess the effect of cybersecurity risk on financial stability, uh, as long as uh, there is a time series representing the evolution of the risk in questions. So many thanks for your attention. Uh, the paper is now available on SSRN. If you want to download it, your feedback would be highly welcome. And if you have any question, we'd be happy to answer it. Thank you, Tristan. Uh, I don't think we have questions online. Are there questions uh, from the room on Tristan's presentation? It's okay. Um, so I was wondering uh, if there is a way for you to quantify 
the magnitude of the systemic risk you find from the transition risk for some institutions. In particular, I think it would be very interesting to compare with the C risk uh, that the VLAB is listing. I'm sure you have some overlapping financial institutions. Uh, and they're measuring it just like S risk in terms of marginal expected shortfall. So that could be a way to, to, to see how material, right? So you find it statistically significant, but is it really material? Uh, which I think is, you know, central bank or something you want to know. Thank you for, for your question. Yeah, it, it's totally possible to, to quantify it. We just have to look at the at the the, the strengths of the coefficients, and uh, so we, we can say that one percentage deviation in our climate risk factors lead to a decrease in the value at risk of the financial institution by a significant uh, component. For the contagion effect, yeah, we we have to think about it. But uh, thank you for for your remark. Uh, how does so? Why do you use scope three uh, only later on in the analysis to check ex post if that correlates with the uh, betas, right? And do you use it ex ante as a proxy to exposition of some of these risks? Uh, yeah, I, I'm not doing it also in my paper, so this is what I have to do. So the answer for my paper is that the, the time series uh, or and the cross section is not good enough. Is it the same qu answer in your paper? But I don't think so because you're using it afterwards. So, yeah, uh, I have different explanation for this. Uh, the first is a question of availability of the data. Uh, so I'm not using it for designing the non-financial climate risk factor. Okay, uh, so there is a question of availability. There is also a question that maybe the regulators might be more concerned first about the f the, the scope one and two because the company has more uh, impact about it. Okay, and uh, and finally, yeah, uh, we we use it for financial institution, uh, um, especially to check whether our, our, our measure has, can, be, can have some economic intuition in terms of the cleaner the investment portfolio of financial institution, the lower the exposure to transition risk. Thank you. A quick question on the, on the data <clears throat> part related to the physical risk. What is the granularity of the uh, indicator you use uh, related to, um, to the asset? Is it at country level, at uh, company headquarters level, or at asset level? Because it's very geographically uh, dependent, I would say, to be relevant. So I wonder if there is something there. Thanks. If I may, I will just add a bit to that question. Uh, because so you have a very strong statement at the end of the day of the end of the presentation, which is physical risk does not have an impact on systemic risk. But you are basing this analysis only on the true cost scores, right? Yeah. Or have you checked, you know, for possible alternative measures of physical risk? Because then, in a way, you're not saying physical risk doesn't have an impact on a systemic risk, but the true cost scores. Do not have an impact, or you know, I mean, maybe you have checked the robustness of these two other metrics. Also. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we we have checked for a dozer score from ESS uh, ESG. Uh, the results were non significant, also, but um, we, we we could check for additional uh, additional data, and we could put the robustness test in the in the paper too. Uh, regarding the granularity, uh, it's uh, the score is given at the equity level, so it has a, a, an easing uh, identify, so it's at uh, the uh, corporate level, company level. And, uh, and w w one issue is that the, the score is, uh, f is constant over time, so, so we have to, to use the, the same score. But I don't, I don't think that there is any physical score at company level that evolves over time so right now. I think we are out of time. So let us thank Tristan once again. And uh, switch to uh, an online presentation by Pauline Avril. Great. So the floor is yours to present this paper on natural disasters and financial stress. OK. So hello, everybody. My name is Pauline Avril. I'm a PhD student from the University of Orléans. I'm so sorry I couldn't reach Paris today because of the meteorological condition in my region, 
But still, I would like to thank the organizer of this conference to give me the opportunity to present my paper today. So the paper I will present today is co-written with Grégory Levieuge from the Banque de France and Camélia Turcu from the University of Orléans. So the usual disclaimer apply. And the paper is titled Natural Disaster and Financial Stress. Can Macroprudential Regulation Tame Green Swans? So here you have the agenda of the presentation, and I will directly start with some contextualization. So uh, as it's shown, for example, today with the organization of this conference, today we face a growing awareness about the consequences of global warming, which can be divided into two types of risk, transition risk and physical risk. And here in this paper, we will be focusing on physical risk, so namely natural disaster. The important thing to stress here is that in the economic literature, there are a lot of studies that focus on the impact of natural disaster on the real economy. So meaning on such aggregate as GDP growth or trade. But there is like a few studies that look at the link between natural disaster and financial stability. So that's why we decided to focus on it. Um, moreover, we were thinking about the recent development of macroprudential policy, development that is completely independent of uh, climate financial risk, but have as a main purpose to ensure financial stability. So against both of this background, we ask ourselves, do natural disasters actually trigger a financial stress? And to what extent having a strong set of macroprudential rules can actually help to alleviate the financial impact of natural disasters. So here we will be focusing on two types of disasters that are quite worldwide distributed and frequent and damaging. It will be storms and floods. Um, so the first step of our work was to identify the transmission channel through which we imagine that a natural disaster can cause a stress on financial stability. So we proxy financial stability by using a premium on lending rates, and we identify five main channels of transmission. So for sake of time, I won't develop all the channels, but for example, the first one we think about was through the destruction of land and property that would ultimately lower the collateral value, and then through the financial accelerator mechanisms, it will higher the risk premiums. Now, if we try to think about the expected benefits of macroprudential policies, so as I said before, the main objective is to dampen the systemic risk. But what we were thinking about is that if it dampens the systemic risk, we can imagine that it can also help to alleviate some of our financial shock. And in the specific case of natural disaster, we can imagine that having a, having a stringent set of macroprudential regulation can actually help to have a more sound and healthy financial system because it will, for example, reinforce balance sheet or restrict risk taking. And we can even imagine that in some condition, it can actually prop an easing of credit condition after such a shock. For example, if we focus on the short-term recovery, it can help to reduce the procyclicality of lending standards, also reduce uncertainty, foster the funding for the construction and so on. And if we look at a more medium slash long term, we, we know that natural disaster will destroy some capital. And then if you have enough confidence in your financial system, you can actually replace the capital by a more modern or productive one in some countries. And then it could be conductive to more lending opportunities and easier funding conditions. So the key, of, the key empirical findings of our work is the, the fact that we find that storm can actually cause a financial stress, conditionally on the level of macroprudential regulation. However, for fluids, we find that the results are not so clear cut. So in terms of contributions, we, as I said before, we highlight the channels through which a natural disaster can cause a financial stress. We also construct a new database with some exogenous indicator uh, measured by some satellite and meteorological station data to have a measure of natural disaster in terms of physical intensity and exposure. 
we, to the best of my knowledge, we are the first to consider uh, microbidential tools as a mitigating feature of this type of shock. And finally, what we do is that we distangle our effects according to the period, the level of development, and the intensity of natural disasters. So now going through the methodology, we base our work on a sample of 88 countries from the period 1996 to 2016, and it's at a quarterly frequency. So the main hypothesis we do to lead our identification strategy is that we will consider a natural disaster as a treatment variable with a random assignments once we control for the characteristics that can influence the occurrence and the intensity of such disaster. Uh, and at a macroeconomic level, it will be the geographical position of a country and its size. So knowing that we are in a panel setting, we can control for it by adding some country fixed effects. So once we do that, we can consider that the conditional independence assumption is verified, and we can assess some average treatment effects. What we want to do here is to see if the effects are long lasting or not. So we want to have some average treatment effects at different horizons. To do that, what we use is the local projection method of Jorda. And we add an interactive term to see the benefits of having a more strict macroprudential framework. So here you have our model. So our dependent variable, it's the external finance premium. So it's the base lending rate minus uh, money risk-free rates. And concerning our variable of interest, they are in red in our equation. So you have P that stands for the macro potential stringency. So it will be equal to zero for lax macro potential country meaning the countries that have activated two or less instruments, and it will be equal to one if we consider that the country has a strong microprudential policy, so if it has activated more than two instruments. So here we measure microprudential policy by its extensive margin, uh, and moreover, D stands for the disaster intensity index, but I will detail the construction in the slides. We also control for a lack macroeconomic variable, for some um, feature of the financial system and the banking sector and some institutional quality variable. Uh, we also control inside our projection horizon for other disaster and banking crises that can happen during the projection. And we had two lags of our dependent variables, some country fixed effect, time fixed effect, and you have epsilon that is a residual. So to go a bit deeper into the construction of our natural disaster measurements. So the thing we think about is that in the literature, there is an issue with using only economic and damages because they are quite linked to the economic and financial situation of a country. Then they could be prone to the endogeneity issue. So what we decide to do is to construct a new data set where natural disaster will be gauged by geophysical intensity measure. So we use EM database as a starting point. This is a, a known database for natural disasters that lists all the disasters that happen in a country. So it's helpful for us to identify the type of disasters, the location, and the dates. And starting from there, we compute quarterly indicators at a country level by selecting the maximum of geophysical intensity over this quarter. And then we normalize it by country area. We normalize it by country area because it can seem a bit obvious that for a smaller country, natural disaster will have a larger impact and larger country have more chance to have natural disasters. Uh, in terms of intensity, geophysical intensity, for storm, we use the maximum wind speed reported in the adequate location. And for fluid, we use the rainfall deviation with respect to the long term mean. Here again, in the adequate location, meaning where the disaster happened at an administrative level. Um, so here you have our two indicators. So the first one is the indicator of geophysical intensity. So the one I described, so geophysical intensity normalized by country area. But we construct a second one that is the first one, but augmented by a measure of exposure. Because here we wanted to, to know 
if the region that was hit by the disaster was an important one or not, because it seems obvious that if a disaster happened in a city like Paris, it won't have the same effect than it if it's happened in a desert. So we augment our initial indicator by population density in the heat area. So it's AIGI, our second indicators. So now I will present the main empirical results, starting with the case of storms. So here you have two uh, responses, one for each indicator. The blue line stands for the lax macroprudential framework countries and the red line for the strong macroprudential framework countries. And the shaded area corresponds to the fact that we have uh, our interactive term that is significant. Um, however, we shock by one standard deviation for, to make our boss indicator comparable. So here what we can say, uh, looking at those graphs first, is that the patterns are quite similar. So indeed, we see that if the country has a lax regulation, you will have a, an increase of your lending rate premiums. However, if your country has a strong regulation, what we see is a sharp decrease of your EFP. We can also notice that the effect seems to happen one year after the disaster, and it can be a bit surprising as a delay. But we can imagine that for the shock to be, uh, to be seen in the uh, financial condition of a country, it can take some time because you need some time to assess the damage, to have some plans for reconstruction, etc. And it can also be a bit surprising that if you have a strong regulation, you will actually have a better EFP at the end. But we will see later on that is only the case in a specific type of country and for a specific type of disaster. So now if we look at the results for floods, so what we see looking at floods results is that the results are less clear. Indeed, if we look at the first indicator, the EFP seems to rise at the beginning of the horizon when your regulation is lax, but it's not robust for the second indicator. So what we are trying to do here is to find an explanation. So actually we think about the fact that fluid are less randomly distributed than storm. Actually, it's easy to identify flood risk area because it will be mainly along coast and along river. So therefore, it could be easier to circumvent the financial impact by, for example, taking on insurances or by not constructing in those areas. So what we try to do next is to go deeper into the results for storms and to have a better view of what's happening. So the first thing we're trying to do is to re-estimate our model only in the recent period of our sample. So meaning from 2006 to 2016. And we compare the magnitude of the coefficient with the estimation on the full sample. So here you have two graphs to map the intensity and the magnitude of our coefficient. So the first one is for the first indicators. That's why it's in function of country area. And the second one is for a medium-sized country, and it's in function of population density. Both graphs uh, are for storms that have the same wind speed than Katrina and two years after such a disaster. So what we can notice here is that when you have a strong regulation, if we look at the difference between estimated our model on the full sample and the recent period, there is not a huge difference. However, if we look at lax macroprudential country, we see that the dot line that stands for the recent period is really above the full line. So here it could be explained by the fact that those countries that have a lax regulation, they have actually had some difficulties to deal with the previous disaster. So then it makes them more and more fragile and it became more and more difficult to deal with the natural disaster that are becoming more frequent and more damaging. Um, so what we try to do next is to split our sample according to the income level of country. So we have three income country groups. We have low income countries, middle income countries and high income countries. And what we see here directly is that the type of countries that seems to trigger our results are middle income countries. And it's actually making sense with the literature because when you have a confidence in your financial system in those countries, 
when your regulation is strong, you can have a decrease of your EFP because you can create new lending opportunity to replace the damaged capital by, by a more productive one that has already proven itself in other countries. So that's an explanation for the fact that it's the only type of country that have a, a positive effect, a positive effect of natural disaster. But if we look at this country when the regulation is lax, we see that there are still a rise of the EFP. If we look now at low-income countries, what we see is that in those type of countries, the regulation doesn't seem to matter. Indeed, when you have a lax or a strong regulation, we see that the EFP still rise. So here, the country have some trouble to deal with the financial impact of natural disaster, even if they have a strong regulation. However, if we look at high-income countries, what we see is actually what we expected, is the fact that if you have a strong regulation, you don't have any significant movement of your EFP. Uh, and it's not surprising in this type of country because the capital that was destroyed was already a good capital, so you don't have new opportunities, you just need to reconstruct. And if we look at the fact that you have a lax regulation here, we see that there is a a bit of an increase at the end of the horizon, but a uh, small one. So the conclusions are quite similar when we use our second indicator. And what we are trying to do uh, at the end is to exclude the more extreme events. We wanted to do that because we wanted to show that the fact that we have a decrease of the strong, uh, when you have a strong regulation, is only specific to the fact that you have an important disaster that destroy a huge part of your city. So here, when we exclude the one person's strongest storm, we see that the positive effect of natural disaster disappear when you have a uh, strong regulation. However, we see that uh, when you have a lax regulation, you still have an increase of your EFP, looking at the first indicator. However, even for the second one, we see that when we exclude the more extreme events, you don't have the rise of the EFP anymore. So this is symptomatic of the fact that to have a macroeconomic impact on the financial sphere, the disaster needs to be extreme. Uh, finally, in terms of robustness check, what we do is that we use another measure of regulation we use prompt corrective action from Barcelona, which is uh, measuring the reactivity of a government to, to respond to a shock. We also did some uh, reverse causality checks, and what we do at the end is to control for other possible shock absorbers. This is an important part because some people might think that our macro potential context is actually linked with other mitigating features, such as GDP per capita or GDP growth. So what we do here is that we interact the other possible mitigating factor and we see if our mitigating factor, which is the macroprudential frequency, is still significant. And what we find here is that concerning storm events, our results are quite robust for all of these changes. So to conclude with this paper, so our aim was to empirically investigate the impact of natural disaster on finance, conditionally on the macroprudential framework. So what we find here is that having a strong macroprudential regulation can actually help to improve uh, your ability to cope with the financial impact of natural disaster. But this conclusion specifically, specifically applied to storm and to important shock because they are highly unpredictable and damaging. And what is important to say here is that we are not saying at all that macroprudential policy can solve the climate change crisis. That's not the point of the paper. We are just saying that having a strong regulation and a sound financial system can help to save some resources that are needed to finance the transition to a greener economy. And finally, in terms of user research, it would be really interesting to go deeper into the transmission channel uh, using some more uh, microeconomic data, for example, land level data or banking level data. So thank you very much for your attention. So 
We have time for a couple of questions. So I would I would I would start. I mean, you are you are putting forward as indicator of macroprudential uh, stringency the number of indicators, but uh, isn't it that the string? I mean, the stringency of the policy is more related to let's say the value of those indicators, or for example, the value of the capital buffer and this kind of thing, rather than the the number. Uh, have you tried to, to to look also at that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But actually, uh, knowing that we have a panel of 88 countries, at the beginning we were trying to have it in level, but we see in the literature that it's not really comparable between countries. So we use the number instead, but I agree with you, it would be better if we had the level of uh, regulation. Thanks. Well, I had another question, if there are no questions from the room, about the, the, the floods. Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, it's just about the, the distribution uh, of um, geographic wealth, like you use the, the population, uh, as far as I understood, to, to assess the impact of the natural disaster on the region, and why didn't you try to use like a a more economic uh, indicator like uh, uh, the GDP uh, per region or wealth or something uh, like which might be less biased than uh, the, just the population. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I also I, I, I didn't want it to use the uh, GDP because it well, I, I think it's linked to the GDP of the country. So it will be a bit endogenous, but I was thinking of maybe using the net light intensity to have a measure of the concentration of the economic activity in the region. But actually it's a good comment. Maybe I will try to create a, another version with the night light intensity as a proxy of the economic, uh, because I don't have the GDP also for all the region in the world. It's a really difficult data to obtain, but maybe night light could be a good alternative. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah, a quick one and a quick answer, please. Uh, just one comment. I think would have been interested to look interesting to look at the liquidity risk as well, because uh, a natural disaster for financial institutions would mainly impact the liquidity levels, especially maybe in countries uh, where the financial state uh, system is not that much regulated, and let's say the the banks have higher level of risks. It's just a comment. Yeah, actually, it's a, it's a really good point. We use only one dependent variable, but actually, it's a good point. We should also look at uh, liquidity risk. It should be really interesting. Thank you very much. So thank you. Um, and thank you, Pauline. And, uh, and uh, we shall move to the, the next speaker with Tina. Imam Baksh. So, Tina, uh, the floor is yours to talk about float fires and fumes. Thank you very much. Good afternoon from my side. I'm very happy to have the opportunity to present to you uh, this research project that I'm working together with uh, Carmelo Saleo, who's also participating in this conference. And um, the purpose of uh, our paper is to investigate whether banks price in firms' exposure to physical risk when issuing corporate loans. And the primer that I want to give you in the beginning is that um, in the last decade in Europe, average temperatures have already increased by around 1.9 to 1.16 degrees relative to pre-industrial levels, which is already quite close to the 1.5 degrees that were set as a temperature target in the Paris Agreement. And in case we fail to transition to a net zero economy, then this um, will increase the, the intensity and the frequency of extreme weather events, 
which the IPCC predicts to have what they call irreversible consequences for both the economy and the environment. Now, banks play a very special role when it comes to extreme weather events because on the one hand, they are important uh, providers of uh, recovery funding for firms so that they can recover their assets after that they were hit by a natural disaster. And on the other hand, they are also important financers of adaptation technologies that firms invest in so that they can protect themselves against um, future exposure to natural hazards. And at the same time, banks actually might become more aware of a firms' increased exposure to natural hazards, um, given the increased attention to climate change, and therefore change their lending behavior by, for example, reallocating funding to less exposed firms or just tightening lending conditions, which could then have as a consequence that um, the, the firms most vulnerable to physical risk would uh, be prevented to protect themselves against um, or recover from natural disasters. And when looking at the empirical literature, then uh, there were also already numerous studies that showed that banks take into account the transition risk uh, of firms that were already mentioned also by Galina in the morning. So most notably, uh, firms that have clear climate commitments uh, were shown to have actually uh, more, more beneficial uh, lending conditions compared to uh, other type of firms. But for physical risk, this evidence is still uh, quite scattered and incomprehensive. So uh, there is one paper that shows that, for example, band lending uh, decreases for SMEs in Italy that are exposed to flood risk. But at the same time, there are other papers that show that uh, banks increase lending to firms affected by floods in Germany and that this lending has actually a positive impact on the profitability and risk exposure of, of banks, especially when their portfolios are regionally diversified. And one other paper that is worth to note uh, is um, one that investigates in the US firms that have not yet been affected but are at risk of being, a, being affected in the future by natural hazards. And here was shown that uh, those firms already experience tightened tighten lending conditions uh, by now uh, in form of higher interest rate spreads. And now giving these findings uh, in our research uh, project, we want to uh, look at the EU area financial system and combine these uh, different research question into one uh, paper. And the first research question we investigate is whether banks take into account firms exposure to physical risk when, um, when, changing on the when deciding on the lending conditions. And in the second step, we then uh, look at whether banks differentiate by different type of hazards. And here we focus on acute physical risk, uh, namely flood risk and wildfire risk, given that these are the most prevalent risk uh, hazards that have been happening in Europe um, up until now. And finally, the third question we investigate is whether banks differentiate between firms that were already affected in the past by hazards uh, compared to firms that uh, are yet unaffected but are at risk to be affected in the future. And to give an idea of the preliminary results that we obtain, so we actually find that uh, banks do take into account firms' expo exposure to physical risk when deciding on uh, the lending conditions. And most notably, it's wildfire risk that leads to higher probabilities of default and higher interest rate spreads for uh, firms more exposed to wildfires. And when it comes to the third uh, research question, here we find that firms that were previously affected uh, by either floods or wildfires, uh, those experience uh, smaller loans and higher spreads. And for firms at risk, here the picture is quite um, differentiated. So uh, wildfire at risk firms experience similarly smaller loans and higher spreads, but flooded risk firms uh, have interestingly the opposite effect. So they have uh, larger loans and uh, lower spreads. So this could uh, potentially tell us that firms underestimate or do not take into account flood risk of firms, but uh, it could also be a problem of a potential confounding bias, which I will explain in more detail in a few slides. But before I go into the model and the results, I would like to present you the theoretical framework in which we conduct the analysis. And so we basically apply a mediation analysis which is already a quite common method used in other fields of microeconomics, but less so in finance. But it proves itself quite useful when trying to capture the pricing um, channels of banks. So we start with uh, physical risk uh, of firms on the left, bottom left. And this can affect uh, banks' lending conditions in two main ways. So either directly, 
meaning in this case that banks perceive the physical risk of firms and therefore decide to uh, tighten lending conditions. And how we define lending conditions is here through the external margin, so loan size and internal margin, the interest rate spreads. Then the second channel could be actually indirectly through the probabilities of default. And what happens here is, for example, a firm is hit by a natural disaster. This would then lead to produ potential production uh, disruptions and deteriorate the firm's balance sheet. Then this would lead to lower profits and therefore the profitability that a bank pays, uh, that a firm pays back its loan uh, goes, goes down. Uh, with, and this information would then feed in, into uh, the potential risk uh, models of banks and therefore uh, lead to higher probabilities of default that banks assign to firms. And given these uh, higher probabilities of default, this would then have uh, consequently an impact on lending conditions. So through this indirect channel, the PD works as a mediator, um, what is it, what, so to say. And now given these uh, three elements, then uh, there are also potential other factors that might actually affect both physical risk or PDs or the lending conditions. Um, which we control for in our analysis. So these are bank controls, loan and uh, firm level controls, but also fixed effects such as time fixed effects and country fixed effects. Now, um, in order to then capture the total effect of physical risk on lending conditions, here we combine then the impact of both the direct and indirect channel. So in this case, it would be um, the impact of uh, here in arrow C together with the product of arrow A and B. Then uh, mediation, analysis, certain, mediation analysis has certain assumptions. I don't want to go into detail for the interest in time, but I will mention them later in the conclusion. Um, but instead, I want to give a bit more information on the data that we use. So uh, we use granular instrument level data for our analysis, and this we derive from Anacredit, which is a ACB internal database that reports individual loan exposures of euro area banks. And we have this uh, information available on a monthly basis between 2018 and 2022. And we focus our analysis on loans issued uh, in Germany, Italy, Spain and Portugal within the four years uh, of, of, of period that we have. We combine then this instrument level information with uh, firms uh, balance sheet information from Orbis, which we have on an annual basis and which we use on a one year lag with the assumption that banks don't have um, ad hoc uh, financial information of firms available, but uh, use usually financial reports from the previous year to assess firms. And for physical risk, here we have uh, information on historical wildfires and floods. For wildfires, we have the amount uh, of hectares burned by NUTS3 on a monthly basis. And for floods, we have uh, also the euro area damages, uh, euro amount damages on industrial and commercial real estate, also on a monthly and NUTS3 level basis. And uh, both wildfires and flood uh, data we have since 2010. And in addition to that, we also have individual physical risk information of uh, firms. And here we use data from Moody's 427. And these are risk scores uh, uh, calculated on the address level of firms, which um, give information on the frequency and intensity of floods and wildfires to which firms are exposed. Um, one caveat is that these risk scores are static, however, they're forward looking, meaning that they um, give information on firms exposure up until 2040. Now, our, our total sample comprises around 1.3 million loans that are issued by around 200 banks and um, borrowed by around up to 200,000 uh, firms. And here in this map, you see uh, an overview of the distribution of firms across the regions that we use in our analysis. So here, each dot represents a firm. Red dots are tail risk firms, so those with a risk score within the top uh, fifth percentile of uh, total risk scores. And then that's three area, uh, areas shaded uh, give you information on uh, the intensity of either flat wildfires and floods um, happening in that specific region. And what is interesting for, sorry, what is interesting here for wildfires just to point out is that um, uh, it's so tail risk firms are actually not necessarily located in the regions that were previously affected by wildfires. And uh, this is quite important uh, to note because this, um, this actually reveals that uh, forward looking climate change uh, is, does not necessarily coincide with, um, with the natural disasters that have happened in, in certain regions in the past. Uh, so there's the potential amplification going forward. 
And for floods, here we have a certain concentration of tail risk firms, especially in the north of Italy and western Germany. And uh, it's not quite visible in the map, but they actually, these um, locations actually coincide with uh, regions that were also previously affected uh, by floods in, in those specific countries. Now, coming to our model specification. So in order to answer our first research question, here we conduct a panel regression. And we basically run three different regressions. For the first, the direct channel, here we regress uh, once loan size and once interest rate spreads on the risk scores of firms, so both wildfire and flood risk scores. We also add the uh, firm's probabilities of default and uh, loan and firm level controls. So for loan level controls, here we use uh, standard uh, controls uh, used in the literature, so, such as maturity, type of loan, purpose. And for, lo for firm level controls, we use uh, profitability, leverage, uh, log of total assets, so basically all the balance sheet information that we have. We also add bank fi level fixed effects, uh, sector, country fixed effects, and time fixed effects. And our standard errors are cl clustered at a firm bank level. For the indirect channel, here we uh, regress probabilities of default on the same set of variables except of uh, the loan level controls. And this is because the PDs here are, are, um, are uh, assigned by each bank to a firm and they don't, do not vary uh, across banks that are from the same firm issued to the, to the same, uh, within the same bank to the same firm. And now, um, in order to derive the total potential effect of wildfires and flood risk, here we would then combine the coefficients uh, uh, of, of the indirect channel, so the betas, with the alpha 3, and sum this up with uh, the alpha 1 and alpha 2 to get the respective total effect of um, wildfires and floods on the pricing of loans. Now, looking at the results uh, in this table, uh, you see the, the impact of uh, physical risk and uh, wildfire and flood risk specifically on the three uh, set of variables that we, that we investigate. The first uh, sub-column, here we have a physical risk defined, and this is um, in this regression, we do not uh, include both wildfire and flood risk, but only either of those, so always the highest of these scores, with the assumption that banks uh, do not differentiate between hazard type, but uh, just care if a firm is highly exposed or not. And what we see is that there is actually a significant impact of physical risk and uh, more specifically than in the second, what can be seen in the second subcolumn in wildfire risk on profitability of default and on uh, the interest rate spreads, spreads, so a positive significant impact. There is also a weak impact of both wildfire risk and flood risk on loans. However, this impact is only um, significant on the, on the 10 percent level. But with more co uh, co confidence, we can say that uh, increase in wildfire risk of firms leads to an increase in probabilities of default of around uh, roughly 0 0.009 uh, percentage point. So here it says percent, but it's percentage points. Um, it is statistically significant, but in terms of the economic si significance, uh, it's debatable, so it's a bit less than one basis point. And for uh, interest rate spreads, uh, here also when we combine the direct effect of wildfire risk with the indirect uh, effect coming from PDs um, and, and wildfires on PDs, then we have a total effect of 0 0.0053 uh, percentage points. So around half a basis point um, increase in interest rate spreads for firms that are more exposed to wildfire risk. Now, uh, coming to our third uh, research question, which is whether uh, banks differentiate between firms that were already hit in the past by natural hazards and firms that were not yet affected but are at risk in the future. Here we apply a propensity score matching approach in order to uh, combine pairs of firms that are similar in their firm characteristics but differ in, in the level of physical risk to which they're exposed. And so in the first step, we run a logistic regression where we have as a dependent variable, our treatment variable. And, and the treatment variable is basically a physical risk, which uh, has to be defined as a binary uh, variable. And how it, we define it, I will explain in the next slide. But for now, um, just uh, acknowledge that the treatment is physical risk and we regress this on uh, the, all the information of, of, of the firm level characteristics that we have. So uh, profitability, leverage, liquidity, age, total assets, and also certain fixed effects such as sector and country fixed effects. 
Once we, uh, we estimate this regression, we then uh, calculate uh, propensity scores for each firm in our, in our sample and match firms uh, based on the level of their propensity score. And uh, once we have these pairs, we then uh, take the average difference in PDs, interest rates, and uh, the loan size across the, the matched pairs. And the average difference tells us then about uh, our treatment effect, so the treatment effect of physical risk. And how this treatment effect is defined is basically in two ways, um, and the both ways uh, are uh, related to the, the research question that we have. So the first uh, treatment is firms residing in, in areas that were previously affected by either floods or wildfires. So more specifically, what we take here is regions that uh, had more than 1,000 hectares of wildfires um, in the past or more than 100 million euros of damage due to floods. And on top of that, we only take firms that have a risk score that is within the fifth percentile of uh, uh, within the top fifth percentile of total risk scores. And the second definition we have is uh, for firms that are outside of these regions, so we're not yet affected, but uh, are at risk. Um, so basically here, um, those uh, firms that have, uh, again, a risk score that is within the top fifth percent of total risk scores of our firm sample. And uh, so the treatment effect that we estimate is the average treatment effect. And uh, this treatment effect takes into account the treatment both uh, um, the, from high risk, uh, high physical risk firms and low physical risk firms. So what this basically means is we also look at cases where firms are low risk, but we match them with high risk firms and look at what would happen if they have been uh, high risk instead. And um, just to also note that uh, this propensity score matching, we, we, we conducted for these uh, two different type of firms separately. So they're not combined into one. Now, looking at the results, here you see uh, the treatment effect for wildfires on the left side and for floods on the right side. And here we have a slightly different picture than uh, in our panel regression. So here we actually don't see any mediator effect coming from PDs. So uh, physical treatment has, d doesn't have any effect on firms' PDs. But what we see is that uh, both firms that were affected by wildfire in the past and floods in the past, they experience a smaller loan size and higher interest rate spreads. And uh, on the other hand, firms at risk, here we have uh, quite of the opposite effect between wildfires and floods. So firms uh, that are uh, at risk uh, to, from wildfires, here we have a similar results as before, so smaller loan size and higher interest rate spreads. But for flooded risk firms, here we have a bigger loan size and smaller spreads. So here we can actually say, or we, we might uh, conclude, okay, banks uh, actually underestimate flood risk and they actually reward firms that are more exposed to flood risk. However, uh, we might also have a potential confounding problem here because um, there, there might be some information that we missed to control for, which then could uh, actually lead us to this result. And uh, one important factor that we do not take into account, which is especially important for floods, is insurance. And since we do, do not have information on firms' uh, individual loan insurance coverage, this um, effect that we capture here might actually be uh, due to the case that firms that are more exposed to floods are more insured or more supported, and therefore have this uh, positive effect on their lending conditions. Now, uh, just to conclude, uh, this is basically a repetition of what I already said, but very quickly. So we find that banks take into account uh, firms' physical risk, uh, more specifically wildfire risk when uh, issuing loans. We find an effect, of, uh, uh, especially on properties of default, where uh, firms more exposed to wildfires have uh, around one, one basis point higher PDs than other firms and uh, around half a basis point higher interest rate spreads. We find only weak significance for loans and um, also for flood risk firms, we actually find no effect. When it comes to firms that were previously affected or at risk firms, we find that um, previously affected firms and wildfire at risk firms have, again, smaller loans and higher spreads. But for flood risk firms, uh, we have this, uh, this uh, puzzling result that they actually have beneficial lending conditions. So here, the uh, next step would be to investigate further how we can control for potential confounders to, to see whether this is indeed the case or not. So this is it for my side. Thank you very much. And uh, questions, happy to tackle. Uh, 
very interesting. Thank you. So um, it, my question is related to one of your last comments about mm -hmm. confounding factors. I was wondering if you have any information on the loss given default, because given that you're looking at fires and floods, uh, you know, the the collateral is the physical asset that's likely to be destroyed. And uh, to the extent that that might be amplifying the effects and, you know, that pro I'm assuming you don't have that data because insurance would affect that. But um, even if you don't observe insurance, is there a way to see whether the banks require insurance as a precondition for the loan like they do with residential real estate? Mm -hmm. uh, that might help also. Yeah. So the question about collateral is a very uh, good point. And we actually do have information on the collateral amount of loans in our data set. However, the coverage is very bad. And uh, at least in our sample, uh, we have only collateral information for mortgages. So then we would kind of disregard all the other uh, type of instruments that we actually investigate in our paper. But uh, as a next step, this would actually be one of our uh, trials that we also put uh, take into account collateral in the regressions and see what, hap what happens with the results. And I actually have anecdotal evidence that indeed uh, firms have to uh, give insurance uh, once they want to uh, take a mortgage loan off banks, which would then also actually lead to no impact from physical risk on loan conditions. So we will investigate that. Thank you. It's just a clarification question. Uh, so why you find the evidence of, uh, I mean, what is your story or explanation for finding evidence for direct effect and not uh, an effect on the probability of default? So my story behind this question, that's a good, that's a good question. I, I don't have a specific uh, story or explanation behind this yet. Um, so we do find an impact on PDs in the for, in the panel regression. We don't find it for for when doing the propensity score matching. I mean, uh, one explanation could be that the way we define physical risk in in our second approach for the matching is we only look at tail risk firms and we compare these tail risk firms with other type of of risk firms. Whereas in the regression, we basically look at the whole sample of firms that we have available. So there might be something happening with tail risk firms. So Maybe they just don't have a different effect on PDs as the average firm, which could then lead to a muted impact on PDs. But uh, this is actually yeah, something we should investigate in more detail. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Given that PDs are estimated historically, and uh, we have a lot of uh, regulations around that, um, historically it, it was, um, I mean, there's very few cases where these uh, risks are taken into the estimation of the PDs, uh, either to direct risk factors or indirect ones. Couldn't, it, couldn't this be a bit by chance that we have this results because if our PDs, if banks PDs don't take yet into account uh, these factors and especially the regulatory uh, IRB PDs. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, I, I agree with you. So this is actually also something we find in the matching, right? That we do not find any evidence that physical risk affects the PDs. So this would actually speak in favor of your argument. But, uh, I mean, the hypothesis would be that maybe there is some residual element that uh, maybe doesn't go through profitability or leverage or any other balance sheet information of firms, which would then be physical risk, which consciously or, or unconsciously goes into the calibration of PDs. So I also don't expect banks to already have uh, physical risk measures that they actively put into the risk model, but it could be through one way or another that it might materialize, and this is what we wanted to investigate. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. I think we're out of time. Uh, so thanks, Tina. Thank you. Thanks to all the speakers uh, of the session. So I now have the pleasure. My name is Stéphane Voisin from uh, Institut Louis Bachelier. And I'm uh, the pleasure to start uh, this new session uh, dedicated to 
ESG disclosure on data. Data is a fuel to all this uh, fantastic research that we heard today. And um, last but not least, uh, we'll, uh, we'll hear about um, uh, very interesting papers on the topics. Uh, the specificity of this session is that uh, all the speakers for various reasons uh, will be um, basically uh, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on calls. So sorry for that, but uh, we still uh, thank you uh, to be there. And uh, with no further ado, I am uh, Panjvani. Uh, I'll leave you the floor. You have now 20 minutes to, to present your paper. Thank you. Okay, thank you, everyone. I hope you can hear me well. If not, please let me know, Nora. So, yes. for having I, me. It, yes. yes, it's your turn You're on stage now. Awesome, excellent. So I'll get right into it and try and make up for the lost time. Um, sorry about that. So in this paper, we asked three questions. First, what is the relationship between we have a, we have a sound problem. Three emissions uh, and their long-term cost of borrowing? With, with that respect, we document that firms that disclose scope three emissions via the carbon disclosure project, the CDP, face a lower cost of borrowing by about 20 basis points. And we refer to this as the scope three disclosure discount. Next, we turn to the intensive margin and looking within the firms that do disclose scope three emissions, we find that credit markets do not significantly discriminate the actual amount of reported scope three emissions, despite being materially sensitive to scopes one and two combined. And then lastly, these findings sort of naturally raise the question, why do investors not penalize actual emissions while seemingly rewarding disclosures? And so we dig deeper into the CDP data and find substantial discrepancies in firms' disclosure across time, region, and sectors, pose, which would naturally pose challenge for, and challenges for any investor, policymaker, researcher in interpreting this data and this would be a natural area of engagement for the various stakeholders at play. I'll just quickly summarize the data sets that we're using, scope three data from the CDP, scope one and two from Refinitiv and S&P TrueCost, and then credit and financial variables from Refinitiv Icon. And we have about 2,700 firms from the MSCI ACQUI, the All Country World Index. And we consider years from 2015 to 2020, so six years inclusive. And for both scopes, we see that the number of firms reporting has been increasing over the years. However, the number of firms reporting scope three is you know, markedly less than the number of firms reporting scope one and two. And so we end up with an unbalanced panel. And while the number of firms has been increasing for both scopes, um, the sectoral and also the regional composition of the sample has actually remained very stable over the years. And while I'm showing the sectoral breakdown here, it's the same uh, takeaway for the regional breakdown as well. You see very little movement. So now for the results. So on the extensive margin, oh, I should be telling someone to change the slides. I'm on slide five of 16 at this point. The numbering is on the bottom right corner. Sorry for the technical challenges, sorry. So on the extensive margin, disclosing scope three emissions is associated with a scope three disclosure discount of about 20 basis points, as I mentioned earlier. Next slide. This is true despite firms being penalized for higher scope one and two emissions. We also find that the disclosure discount is more material in Europe and Asia Pacific markets, although it is starting to emerge in North America. And I will discuss this in more detail in just one second. Um, and overall, our results are in line with the existing literature that suggests significant greenwashing in the industry. Next slide. Our main econometric specification looks at the relation between firms' long-term cost of borrowing 
and whether it dis discloses scope 3 emissions, that's an indicator variable. Positive scope 3 emissions means it's just a 1. And so this beta 1 is our coefficient of interest here. And we include other firm level controls, including scope 1 and 2 emissions, and debt to, uh, debt to assets, credit ratings, market cap, et cetera. Next slide. So we find that the firms reporting scope three emissions receive a discount of about 20 basis points on their long-term credit spread while being marginally, very marginally being penalized for higher scope one and two emissions. This trend is particularly robust for firms borrowing in uh, the EU and Asia Pacific markets with the scope three disclosure pre discount of about 18 basis points and 74 basis points respectively. Next slide. However, we do not observe a similar trend in the US debt market and using year by year OLS regressions, we find evidence that such a trend is starting to emerge in the US as well as seen by the lower beta on disclosures in the graph on the right. Next slide. Just to make sure I'm on slide nine of 16 now. So, I met, as I mentioned earlier, our second main finding is on the intensive margin. So it's that investors do not significantly penalize higher scope three emissions despite showing sensitivity to scope one and two. So conditional on disclosing scope three emissions, firms do not face a penalty for higher emissions actually. Next slide. And so investors are sensitive to one and two, um, and these results are robust across all regions and suggest that firms can benefit by reporting scope three emissions because that's finding one scope three emissions. There's a discount if you disclose, uh, but no penalty for disclosing higher emissions. Right. And so this is in line with Olivia's finding, actually, that uh, green investors have minimal impact on uh, asset pricing at this stage of market development. And so there's a natural incentive for firms to disclose scope three emissions to benefit from the discount um, and for in stakeholders to nudge firms towards this um, towards this decision. Next slide. So um, in the main econometric specification, we just replace the indicator variable with actual log of scope three emissions um, and see that there's no meaningful relationship between the two credit and scope three emissions, quantitative scope three emissions, um, despite controlling for other variables as one would. Um, next slide. So our third and last finding is that actual scope three emissions reported by firms are not robust and not consistent. And that would answer this natural question that why is it that firms that disclose get a discount, but then if they disclose higher uh, emissions, they don't get charged for it. Um, and really are one of the possible explanations we do not, um, claim causality here, we, one of the things that we think is at play is the lack of robustness and consistency in the scope three disclosures that firms are putting out. Um, next slide. Since we use primary data from the CDP, we can dig deeper and we find substantial discrepancies in firms across time, region, and sectors, which are posing challenges for investors and policymakers in interpreting the data. Specifically, firms are more likely to report emissions for upstream categories than downstream categories, so there's a bias there already, with market variability in emissions across subcategories from one year to the other. So there are 17 scope three subcategories in the CDP. You see a lot of reallocation from one year to the next, and particularly for downstream categories. We also show that the cost of borrowing is positively related with some scope three categories, particularly the upstream ones, and negatively with uh, some other subcategories, in particular the downstream ones, actually. Next slide. Again, um, this is an important slide, so I want to make sure we're on slide 12 of 16 at this point. Um, this figure here shows the subcategory level 
emissions profile for the top 10 oil producers by emissions in 2020. So here we see that Shell uh, reports significantly positive use and positive emissions for the use of sold products, pur purchased goods and services, and fuel and energy related services, right? These three categories here, um, among upstream categories, but other oil producers, right? So you can see a lot more color within Shell's reporting, but Total, for example, does not report their emissions with such specificity or magnitude for that matter, right? Despite being dominant contributors to these, these um, you know, they do not report uh, consistently or materially for other subcategory, despite being dominant uh, contributors to overall emissions due to the production process. It's inherent to the production process. Perhaps some subcategories are indeed irrelevant for these firms, could very well be, um, or there's no emissions to report, but the market difference between, say, Shell and you know Gazprom or any one of these, Petrobras, for example, it, it, it suggests that stakeholders um, should pay extra attention to ensure that it is indeed that a subcategory is irrelevant and not just you know, not being reported on. Right? Uh, next slide. This figure here um, shows subcategory level emissions from Microsoft and Alphabet as reported to the CDP between the 2015 and 2020. That's our study window. Now between 2015 and 2018 and 2019, 2020, Microsoft reports having its um, emissions under purchase goods and services, while almost quadrupling its emissions under capital goods. Um, on the other hand, downstream um, transportation and distribution and downstream lease assets show market volatility from one year to the next and no discernible pattern in either direction over the years. Likewise, Alphabet's reporting under purchase goods and services and upstream leased assets is very noisy, as you can see here. Um, but uh, it discloses, you know, those emissions in 2015, this light blue color in 2015 and 2016, and then it suddenly goes away. And then by 2018, um, it, it, it's emissions classified as other. So it's just a bucket, Buck up, upstream other increases dramatically, this big green tall bar, and then remains elevated thereafter. Since the firm does not classify them or break them down by subcategories, just bucketed as other, it makes it challenging for anyone, investors, stakeholder, you know, policymakers, researchers, anyone for that matter, to identify and engage with the firm on specific fronts. Now note that the two firms have markedly different scope three profiles, despite being in, you know, despite being peers in the same sector, um, technology broadly, sure, slight differences, but you know, the differences here in scope three report disclosures are immense and in region, um, you know, in the North America credit market. So um, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip these slides so that we can make up for the session uh, here. Um, but just to say that firms that report on all subcategories, all upstream or all downstream subcategories is very small. So looking at subcategory level effects on credit is fairly challenging. Uh, for the upstream, you only have about 350 firms that report on all, all their um, upstream uh, subcategories. And then we have like around 40 firms that report on all downstream categories for all the years in the study window. So let me conclude with that. Um, we have shown that firms that disclose scope three emissions face a lower cost of borrowing. Um, also I'm on the conclusion slide 16 of 16, by the way. So we have shown that um, Firms that disclose scope three emissions face a lower cost of borrowing. That is a scope three disclosure, disclosure discount of 20 basis points. But of those firms that do disclose on the intensive margin, 
invents investors do not penalize firms reporting higher emissions why might that be one possible explanation is the weakness in scope 3 disclosure data makes it less reliable for investors and mar market participants broadly um, to figure out what's actually going on which means there's a room for engagement with these firms so with that I'll end. Um, any questions thank you Thank you very much for having me with you uh, here today, even being online. I very much appreciate your effort to, to accommodate me. Um, so I'm here presenting my joint work with two colleagues, Jose Manuel Carbo and Jose Manuel Marquez, who work in the Financial Innovation Division of uh, Banco de España. Uh, so our work is machine learning methods in climate finance. And what we do is a literature review of this, uh, let's say, subsample of the research field. We are interested on understanding where machine learning is adding value in climate finance. So next slide. When we usually talk to uh, a finance audience, uh, so many times we have these kind of questions or concerns like, is machine learning a hype? Um, is this just something strictly new that is not adding anything new? or valuable. And what we put here is just an example that we find it quite visual uh, of a research project done by the Quebec AI Institute and presented in the previous to the last uh, conference of the parts. Uh, um, so basically what people are doing here is uh, as climate change, it's facing uh, an intrinsic challenge uh, coming from the data, uh, coming from the statistical modeling requirements that they need in this case because we have not had any materialization of climate change as of today people usually are not aware of the importance of this issue so what we what the, these researchers did was using ai uh, actually guns and what you might know as deep fakes to really try to visualize how much uh, um, a flood or a heat wave or a fire could materialize in your own place so here, people are using AI to raise awareness of climate change. Obviously, this is just a very particular example, but what I want here to convey and try to convince you is that machine learning is adding something strictly new that other statistical techniques could not provide us, but will, as we will see, also provide us also complementary value to other statistical techniques that are also very uh, well known, like econometrics. So next slide. We restrict ourselves to climate finance. Obviously, when we talk about sustainability, sustainability is a quite broad research field, but we wanted to restrict ourselves to just climate. Um, so there are so many uh, articles and papers that actually um, uh, mix uh, so many terms. Uh, some people ask, uh, talk about carbon finance. Others know this field as green finance, but let me just uh, try to, to always talk about climate finance, okay? Uh, uh, I will say how we, we will pin down the, the terms um, to really just uh, talk about climate finance in a minute. And, and when I said that something uh, was idiosyncratic uh, uh, of climate change and why machine learning is added value here, I was referring to two major challenges, two major issues. One is the large amount of data is uh, what we could uh, uh, now as big data that uh, climate researchers usually have to deal with. And this data, as we will see, it's not only big, it's also uh, so many other properties that we discuss in our paper, like the frequency, the variety, and the structure and unstructure format that usually people have to use in climate finance. I'm talking about images, I'm talking about text, something that is somehow new to economists. And also, uh, this uh, refers us to the statistical complexity to model climate change. So there are so many non-linearities between the two systems, not the economic system and the climate change. There are so many things like endogeneity and so many other properties that make us machine learning a good fit for purpose. So uh, sometimes uh, uh, traditional econometric techniques just cannot handle all these issues. So next slide. Um, yes, a quick motivation of how, how we came with the idea of uh, narrowing down uh, and trying to explain to understand why machine learning itself is, uh, is usable and valuable in machine learning is because basically we saw uh, previous studies uh, 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 
concluding this result that there, there were methodological and data constraints that prevented economic researchers to really come with a good quality and big quantity amount of articles in climate finance. So this exploded in, uh, from 2015 onwards, obviously with the Paris Agreement, but there were so many articles that were facing this uh, challenge of the fragmentation of the field. No, it's not clear the definition of sustainability. Uh, however, uh, from the regulatory and the supervisory authorities, the, the commitment was already there. And in fact, they were kind of uh, overtaking the academic community, already experimenting with AI and machine learning, trying to really solve some operational uh, barriers that were preventing green finance to really become mainstream. So I'm referring to the Beast Innovation Hub, the Beast Innovation Network, and some other expert groups uh, in the ECB, where we are trying to uh, really use machine learning uh, to accelerate uh, finance between the market players. Uh, we know that it's uh, needed to design better policy instruments, um, and um, at academic level, we were only able to find a very limited amount of surveys with a very uh, narrow and little scope covering only some subtopics of how machine learning is trying to help somehow uh, the developments of climate finance. So we found that there was uh, this gap, this need to really better understand how machine learning, a new discipline for us, it's uh, really needed in climate finance. Next slide. What we try also to put here is a little bit of objectivity uh, in the sense that we try to, deal, uh, to do a systematic and automatic review. So we did ourselves put some machine learning into this paper and we tried to do some natural language processing, in fact, some topic modeling, trying to understand which are the keywords that better describe the articles that use machine learning in climate finance. Um, so we described in detail in the paper, but basically we came with um, a combination of 20 keywords describing uh, climate finance and describing machine learning. Uh, and we put those uh, words into three different databases, uh, Web of Science, Google Scholar, and Dimensions AI. And we came with uh, uh, more than 200 unique references uh, that were a comprehensive uh, summary uh, of the corpus of the of the literature that we wanted to review. Next slide. Uh, when we did this topic modeling, we are referring to something that maybe some of you may already know because it's starting to be uh, more and more known and used by other authors. Is uh, the LDA, the Latin Derivative Allocation model. So I don't want to spend too much time here, but happy to address any question if you have it. Basically, what we want to do here is automatically, I mean, statistically, reverse engineer the Latin topics in our corpus of documents. So we have these 217 papers where we had the Latin abstract as our text, and we're trying to divide this matrix uh, into two um, uh, smaller matrices. Right? Basically, we wanted to divide the corpus into a matrix of topics. Next slide, please. Into, uh, we wanted to divide our corpus uh, in a matrix of, uh, of topics uh, that are, let's say, thematic area. No? And within those, we also want to uh, have a matrix of token that are our keyword. So basically, the LTA is it's, uh, uh, it's trying to, to find a smart way to solve a trade off. But basically, when we have a um, uh, easy to read text, we can say that that text has a, like a very small number of topics that represent the spirit of the writer, what the writer wants to convey eyes, uh, to convey to us, no? like two or three keywords. At, at the same time, we want um, only like um, in very well-defined uh, topics, only have uh, some keywords with a very high probability. And that is a difficult challenge, it's a trade-off because usually to better define a topic, you need to put more work in it. So uh, you also have to uh, to suffer from uh, a loss of probability per token. So I don't want to spend more time as said before here. And basically, we by doing this next slide, we are able to find out the an optimal number of topics. Uh, there are some other statistical indi indicators that uh, allow us to understand when we have to stop finding the number of topics that we, we were talking about perplexity and coherence. And we actually found our more stable model uh, looking for 10 topics that the machine finds. However, machines and humans are 
and are not the same. And we, as human experts, are able to label only seven out of these 10 topics. Next, next slide. Here is a very first indication. Here you have the probability of each keyword in each of the topics. And what we are here putting is a, a priori label of what are uh, the topics we presented. As you may see, we have natural hazards, biodiversity, carbon markets, agricultural risk, ESG factor and investing, and energy economics, and climate data. Next slide. What we need here is uh, in order to provide a robust clustering was to really understand better you know, what this combination of keywords per topic is telling us. Uh, so we need to further inspect each topic and we do that by uh, doing this relevance score. Um, I put here just an example that illustrates, you know, the for the analyst, how this really helps us to understand what is happening inside each topic. Next slide. Uh, just out of... Uh, Next slide. Uh, an example here, we, we are able to inspect the importance of the topics within the topic and between the topics. So here, for example, in this particular example, and because it's very small, the figure, sorry for that, I just want to put here an example of energy economics. And what we find out here is that, for example, when we play with the keywords within topic and between topics, you see, for example, uh, some keywords being very important, like energy efficiency, buildings, uh, and GHE. So we really, uh, after the inspection of the relevance score per topic, we're able to confirm the human label that we put to all the seven topics. Next slide. And we just wanted to put some uh, 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 findings, key findings, uh, as a message to future researchers that are, you know, having these machine learning skills and want to help in climate finance. What our first finding in the paper is, is that basically machine learning actually, so today it's covering most of climate finance topics. So if we go to other literature reviews that are trying to understand what's happening in climate finance, basically it matched basically all of the topics are finding that some papers are using machine learning, all of them, the majority of them. So this is telling us that this technology is here to stay and here to add value. Also, we find a very interesting trend uh, looking for the time series of the papers published. Obviously, there are some topics that are uh, very much uh, better well known, for example, energy economics and uh, biodiversity and natural hazards that um, happened some years before. Uh, and from 2018 and onwards, new topics are arising, for example, ESG factors and climate data. Next slide. Uh, and this is a very novel field. This is new. And this is something that we really uh, came out with the, since the very beginning. We, we, we needed to go into Google Scholar to find working papers because this is uh, something that there is so much done and it's not still published. Uh, so we find some key topics that are actually very, in a very high percentage, still in working format. And I'm talking about climate data in particular and ESG factors and investing. So those papers, are in, most of them are still in working paper format. And um, out of curiosity, we found out that, for example, economic journals actually do not pay that much attention to uh, things like physical risks. So people who are using machine learning for estimating, forecasting floods, uh, heat waves, and the impact of physical risks are usually published in other type of journals, like environmental journals or computer science journals. Next slide. Um, and because most of us usually think about machine learning like the most complex models, we also try to break down which are the models per topic. Uh, so just a very quick uh, insight here. Usually what we found out is that it depends on the data. So depending on the topic, it's not always the most complex models like deep, deep learning and deep uh, neural networks, what researchers do uh, or apply. Uh, depending on the requirements of the or, or the uh, research question, sometimes they have uh, to use other more simple methods, more transparent and interpretable methods. So we find that, for example, in physical risk, where there is a very vast majority of data from satellites and texts, etc., there actually the neural networks are the most used method. But for example, in transition risk, uh, other methods like uh, elastic nets, reach, and lasto, and more uh, easier to interpret uh, methods are the most uh, used ones. 
And also, uh, very interestingly, we found out that machine learning itself has given birth to new topics. And I'm referring to climate data. That is what we are here to talk about. Climate data and the analysis of disclosures, it's here because we are able to analyze text. And this is an intrinsic value and a unique value of machine learning. So no other literature review found such a big, important amount of uh, climate data papers that actually basically all of them rely on NLP uh, to extract their conclusions. And next slide. So we uh, were able by doing our LDA analysis to extract uh, statistically which are the, the topics covered by our corpus of documents who are uh, using machine learning in climate finance. Uh, and we could uh, conclude with some uh, key findings, as I was just discussing right now. Uh, but all of that uh, gives us an idea about the strengths of machine learning and climate finance. But we also wanted to put a little bit of last uh, part of analysis into important limitations that we also observed when analyzing these papers. First, this is that machine learning can try everything. And a little bit with uh, my previous colleague speaking just before me, we found so many papers that actually were trying to use machine learning to solve uh, the low quality of a scope speed data. And we found that they could not add much more value. So if there is not good data, there is nothing that the technology really can help you. Uh, so the emphasis here is to be, as a policy recommendation, be put on gathering and collecting better data through technology. But if we do not have good data, technology will not allow us to better analyze that bad quality data. And also, uh, just a, a, a small claim here, uh, and for further research, green AI and responsible use of machine learning is a big topic here that is growing more and more. So uh, we also wanted to, to, to put some highlights on it. Uh, and we really just, uh, I can conclude and finalize my talk here, just hoping that this uh, research help a new machine learning expert to provide and to, to put their skills uh, into climate finance. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Andres. Uh, do we have any questions from uh, the audience to Andres? Maybe one quick question before we move to Thierry. No question? Okay, I'll take a quick one for, for, for you, Andres. Do, do you believe that uh, the upcoming, uh, I mean, a greater classification system that we uh, may have in the, in the climate finance space or even, you know, in the, within, with the taxonomy and all the, the coming um, um, normalizing uh, KPIs will help you to, 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 to basically to improve the models and, uh, and machine learning in general? Yes, indeed. I think that machine learning is trying to bridge the gap in between that happens. Um, but for example, if we, if we could foresee the future and we see like the taxonomy and all the ESG disclosure standards already happen in, in a machine readable format like XBRL, at that point in time, machine learning will not help. But as maybe that takes some years to really happen and materialize, we need machine learning to really help us during this process that I agree is temporarily. Uh, and I, I, I do believe that the standard, the standardization of these standards will help us. Uh, but in between, machine learning is a great tool not to stop any policy design and to really try to get green finance happen beforehand because the size of the challenge is so big that we cannot wait for the coordination at international level of the standards. We should already start working. And I am also referring to, to the private sector. So that's also a message to the private sector. Do not wait. You already have technological tools to start doing something, to start analyzing uh, the, uh, the sustainability of the companies by analyzing the text, going to the satellite data, etc. Thank you, Andres. And sorry for the technical problems. I see you have a beautiful uh, Christmas tree behind you, so we wish you a happy Christmas. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye, Andres. And uh, with no further ado, we are moving to, to Thierry. Uh, we have technical problem with Thierry, so we won't be able to see him, but we uh, will be able to see his slides and also to hear from him, hopefully. Thierry, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Pascal. So do you hear me? Yes, we do. Okay. So... Uh, we begin with the, the, the slide four. So uh, I continue <laughs> my talk. So 
Uh, another issue concerns the, the, the decarbonization pathway. So in, in slide four, uh, I have reported the CTB and PAB pathways in order to compare them with the decarbonization scenario huh, uh, of, the, uh, of the economy huh, provided by the International Energy Association. So first problem, how to compare trajectories based on carbon intensity uh, with trajectories based on carbon emission. Huh? So indeed, uh, CTB and PAB uh, are defined with respect to carbon intensity, huh? while, uh, and more generally, uh, in finance, we use uh, uh, carbon intensity, while the uh, scenario of the International Energy Association is defined with respect to carbon emission. So, so this is the first problem. The second problem is uh, concerns the magnitude uh, of the reduction scenario. Huh? Do we have to decarbonize strongly at the beginning, in the middle, or at the end? So the dilemma is, is then the following. First, decarbonization and then transition, or first, financing the transition in order to decarbonize strongly in the future. So if we go to the next slide, slide five, huh? so this question, huh? Uh, is related to the second pillar uh, of net zero policies. So in, in slide five, uh, I have reported a recent report published by uh, McKinsey uh, in, in, in February. Uh, so in order to achieve uh, net zero by 2050, uh, we must collectively invest uh, an extra $3.5 trillion per year. So this represents uh, 4.1% of the world GDP. So the gap between current investment and what is expected is, is huge, huh? <laughs> it's, it's very high, huh? and we cannot close the gap uh, as that. So it, it will take time. Huh? So I think that um, uh, these figures are very interesting because when asset managers or asset owners speak about net zero investing, they mainly focus on portfolio decarbonization, huh? how to reduce the carbon footprint of the portfolio. But we cannot reduce net zero investing to an exercise of portfolio decarbonization. Huh? Portfolio decarbonization is one part of the solution, but what is really key huh, is the second part huh, of net zero investing, how to finance the transition to a low carbon economy. So this is really the difficulty huh, of net zero investing because we have two goals. Huh? portfolio decarbonization and financing the transition and how to be sure that uh, there is no conflict between the two objectives. And for instance, I will show you uh, uh, in some slides that, that uh, sometimes uh, you, you, can, you can have some negative correlation uh, between uh, 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 carbon metrics and, and transition metrics. So uh, I will skip the slide six and, and, and then I will go to the slide seven. Uh, so, uh, uh, let us see uh, which net zero metrics that we can use to build uh, a net zero portfolio. So in fact, uh, we have two types of metrics, uh, net zero carbon metrics for the decarbonization pillar uh, and net zero transition uh, metrics uh, for the, the transition pillar. So one important question is the scope definition of carbon emission. In particular, uh, the debate uh, uh, do about uh, scope three emissions, uh, do we have to use Top three emissions, or do we face double counting figures? So yes, huh? uh, we face uh, double counting figures, uh, and, and moreover, uh, uh, scope three uh, emissions are, are very noisy in terms of data. Huh? But it is really important to take into account the scope three emissions of companies. Why? Because COP one and two huh, gives a false perception, a false view huh, of the carbon footprint. And net zero uh, implies that the system is closed. Uh, the, the system must be closed. Uh, we cannot just decarbonize a part of the economy and, and the rest of the economy uh, uh, is not decarbonized. So in order to show uh, the impact of the supply chain, I have reported here some figures about carbon emission intensity. For instance, let us compare the scope one carbon intensity of Apple and the scope one carbon intensity of Samsung Electronics. Uh, they do exactly the same job uh, the, the, uh, they have exactly the same business, uh, but what do you see? You see that the scope one of Apple uh, cannot be compared to the scope one of Samsung Electronics. Uh, they are very different, uh, 
the ratio is uh, uh, 25.6 divided by 0.2, so uh, the ratio is uh, 125. So we can have issuers uh, with uh, uh, low carbon intensity uh, for scope one and two, but uh, when we introduce scope three, uh, they have, uh, they may have a high carbon footprint. Uh, another example, uh, uh, if we don't take into account uh, scope three, uh, what, what do you see? You see that uh, uh, most of carbon emissions uh, uh, are located in the scope three uh, of food and beverage companies uh, because uh, of the carbon emission of the upstream, uh, in particular uh, when they produce uh, uh, milk or, or dairy uh, products. Uh, if we go to the slide eight, uh, carbon, uh, current carbon emissions uh, and, and intensi intensities are very important, but they define uh, uh, the current picture, the, the current carbon footprint of, of a company. Uh, so this is the current picture, so slide eight. Uh, uh, however, uh, um, this is only uh, the current picture and what is very important uh, in order to have a, a net zero viewpoint of the carbon footprint, uh, we must use net zero carbon matrix. So what is the underlying ID? The ID is to compare the carbon trend of the issuer using the past uh, history uh, with the net zero scenario of the sector, for instance, provided by the International Energy Association and the carbon targets uh, announced by the issuer. So in what follow, uh, I will not use all, all this information, but I will only focus uh, on the carbon trend. Uh, generally, uh, the carbon trend is normalized by, by the carbon emission. And in this case, uh, uh, the metric is called the carbon momentum of the issue. So in the next slide, please, so the slide nine. Uh, in slide nine, I have reported some statistics uh, of carbon momentum for all the issuers of the true cost database. So uh, uh, the, the carbon momentum have been estimated using a five-year historical data. So how to read uh, these results uh, or these figures? Uh, first, uh, we distinguish carbon emission and carbon intensity. Uh, we also consider several scopes. Uh, scope one, one and two, uh, scope one and two and three upstream. So the median carbon momentum uh, is equal to 1.7% uh, if we consider carbon emissions uh, and scope one. So for the scope one uh, and carbon emission, we have 43.3% of issuers that have a negative carbon momentum. And we have, uh, for instance, 17.1% of issuers that have a positive carbon momentum greater than 10% every year. So we don't like <laughs> this type of issuer. A net zero investor prefer an issuer with net negative carbon momentum. Um, now, if we consider the carbon intensity, uh, the story is completely different. Huh? Since the median carbon intensity, uh, the, the, the median carbon momentum uh, for carbon intensity is negative, and there are more issuers uh, with a negative carbon momentum than with uh, a positive carbon momentum. Uh, just, just a figure which is very important, this is the rule 30%, 30%. If you consider the MSCI world index, uh, what do you see? You see that uh, in terms of carbon emission, uh, uh, you have 70% of positive carbon momentum and 30% of negative carbon momentum. But now if you use carbon intensities uh, for the MSCI world, uh, Uh, this is the contrary. <laughs> 70% have a negative carbon momentum and 30% have a positive carbon momentum. So carbon momentum uh, uh, is very important to measure the self decarbonization of a portfolio. Indeed, uh, if we have a portfolio uh, uh, with uh, positive carbon momentum, uh, the only way to reduce the carbon footprint over time is to apply uh, uh, sequential decarbonization. So, We have to rebalance the portfolio uh, at, a frequent, uh, at a frequent period uh, in order to, uh, to have, uh, to observe a reduction uh, uh, of the carbon footprint. So uh, let us skip some slides. So I think that it is the, the, the slide uh, 13. Yes, slide 13. So um, generally, uh, uh, 
uh, we consider two approaches uh, for implementing uh, net zero investing. So the first one uh, is a core satellite approach, uh, uh, which is used for strategic asset allocation. Um, so, uh, and, and the second one, uh, so we can go um, to, to the slide 14, please. <laughs> and the second one is the integrated approach, uh, which is very popular uh, in mutual funds and, and ETF. Uh. In the case of the, uh, of the core satellite approach, uh, the decarbonization uh, is implemented on the core portfolio, while the satellite, uh, so slide 14, uh, correspond to the transition portfolio. So a typical allocation is currently uh, 95% for the core. So we decarbonize all the portfolio, uh, all the allocation of the asset owner, and 5% for the satellite, meaning that 5% of assets uh, are dedicated to financing the transition. The big issue is to define the allocation pathway um, uh, between the core and the satellite, uh, uh, since the proportion of the transition portfolio uh, must increase with the greenness of the economy. Uh, so at the end, uh, at the end, uh, if we success uh, to, uh, to be uh, net zero by uh, 2050, uh, uh, when the economy will reach net zero, we can imagine, imagine uh, we can assume that the, the satellite uh, corresponds to the market portfolio. Now, if we go to the slide uh, 17, uh, in the case of the integrated approach, uh, so slide 17, uh, the underlying idea is to implement the decarbonization pillar uh, and the transition pillar at the same time. Uh, for instance, in, in the case of ETF and index portfolio, uh, we generally use an optimization problem where we minimize the tracking of volatility uh, with respect to a benchmark, for instance, the MSCI world, uh, subject to the constraint of dynamic carbon reduction. Uh, so in this case, uh, the reduction rate depends on, on the time uh, and some additional constraints uh, for the transition. Uh, so I have reported here uh, three uh, very famous constraints. Uh, we can implement uh, first a minimum green revenue share. Uh, for instance, uh, we like to uh, uh, for, to give you an idea, but the green revenue share of the MSCI world is uh, uh, around 5%. Uh, we like to target 10% of green revenue share of our portfolio. Uh, we can impose a minimum self decarbonization rate uh, to give you an idea, but the, the, today uh, the, 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 the decarbonization rate, the self decarbonization rate uh, of uh, the MSCI world is about uh, minus 1.7%. Uh, so perhaps we would like to not to target minus 1.7%, but perhaps minus 3%, minus 4%. Uh, and we can also exclude uh, the bad issuers uh, that present, for instance, a positive carbon limit. So if we go to the next slide, uh, uh, I have reported in the next slide uh, the results when we like to multiply uh, the green intensity uh, of, uh, of the portfolio uh, uh, by a factor of two and when we would like to target the self-decarbonization by 5%. Uh, so results are given uh, for, a, uh, for a PAB decarbonization pathway. So the blue line, uh, uh, the, uh, here, do you, what do you have? You have the, the relationship between the date, uh, uh, between uh, 2020 to uh, 2050, uh, and the tracking of volatility. Uh, the blue line corresponds to just the decarbonization pillar. Uh, and, and, uh, and the green line uh, uh, corresponds to, 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 to the case when we had the tradition, transition dimension. So the green surface uh, uh, indicates the additional cost uh, when we had the transition dimension. So when we combine the two dimensions, uh, uh, decarbonization and, and, and transition, the additional cost can be, uh, can be high. Uh, indeed, uh, what do you see? You see that the green surface uh, is significant. Uh, for instance, here you have the results for the MSCI world. Next slide, uh, you have the results for the MSCI AMU, and the next, uh, and then next slide, you have the, the, the results for the MSCI USA. But what do you see? You see in particular uh, that the, the green surface uh, may be very important, in particular when, when the universe of assets is very low. Uh. So, for instance, it is better, uh, it is easier to implement. Uh, a net zero approach 
using the MSCI world universe than using, for instance, the MSCI USA uh, universe. Now, um, if we go to the slide uh, uh, 22, so uh, we can think that uh, the tracking error huh, uh, seems to be manageable. There are, but huh, uh, we can also study two other risks, huh, the diversi diversification risk and the liquidity risk. Huh. So in slide 22, I have reported the shrinkage of the investment universe when we implement uh, a net zero policy and when we consider the addition of an issuer exclusion constraint based on its momentum. So stocks are excluded, uh, issuers are excluded if the carbon momentum is positive. So you see the big impact. Uh, so uh, what do you see? You see that uh, uh, if you had uh, an exclusion policy uh, based on positive carbon momentum, uh, you, your universe uh, is uh, the shrinkage is very high, uh, and, and so this explains that generally uh, this type of constraint is not implemented because it costs so much uh, in terms of diversification. Now, um, if we go to the next slide, what is very interesting is that if we take into each constraint individually, for instance, uh, uh, the, 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 the green revenue share, the, the decarbonization, or also the self-decarbonization, so if we go to the slide uh, 23, huh? uh, what do we see? We see that um, the cost is not so high in terms of uh, uh, investment shrinkage, in terms of diversification. In fact, this is a combination of these different metrics uh, uh, that explain the high diversification cost. Why? Because net zero carbon and transition metrics uh, are currently not correlated. For instance, uh, uh, what we can show, we can show that uh, we have a negative correlation uh, between a uh, green revenue share and uh, we have a positive uh, correlation, sorry, between uh, green revenue share and carbon intensity. Why? Because uh, green revenue shares, uh, green activities uh, are located uh, in companies that present a uh, high carbon footprint. Uh. So when you would like to decarbonize your portfolio, you reduce uh, your allocation uh, uh, on issuers with very high carbon intensity, but at the same time, uh, you reduce the part of green revenue share in your portfolio. Um, now, uh, we can perhaps go directly to the slide 25. So in conclusion, uh, uh, three main important points. Uh, first, uh, a net zero investment strategy is not a low carbon investment strategy. So uh, uh, this is not exactly the same thing. Uh, you have to take into account the self-decarbonization. You have to take into account the transition uh, dimension. Second point, uh, the implementation cost. Uh, so I, I, I have just uh, give you some results for the, for, for the equity market, but to have done the same exercise for the bond market, the implementation cost for equity portfolios will be greater than for bond portfolios. And why? Because the reason is that uh, the greenness of the primary market uh, is more important than the greenness of the secondary market. Uh. And so in the case of the equity market, uh, the impact of the primary market is close to zero. Uh, the primary market has, has, has little uh, influence uh, on the market capitalization. Uh, uh, and so, but this is not the case uh, of the bond market. Uh. On average, uh, 10% uh, of the market cap uh, in, in the bond market is explained by the primary market uh, every year. So the structure of bond benchmarks uh, uh, changes faster than the structure of equity benchmark, uh, meaning that uh, uh, the greenness uh, of, uh, of bond, bond benchmark uh, is, is faster than, than the greenness of equity benchmark. Uh, last remark, uh, third remark, uh, so be careful, uh, implementing net zero is not straightforward. Investors generally consider a lot of metrics, uh, a lot of constraints. Uh, the risk is that their investment universe uh, becomes very small uh, and less liquid than usual. So this is a re really a, a, an important point. Uh, uh, net zero investing is a dynamic approach. Uh, so if we go too fast today, uh, uh, very quickly, uh, 
euh, une fourrière, c'est une fourrière, hein. certainement, où il fait des difficultés, hein, uh, in order to have hein, a, a liquid, uh, diversified hein, and manageable investment portfolio. So, OK, I have finished. <laughs> Thank you very much, Thierry, and uh, thank you for the very perfect timing that you're respecting. Unfortunately, and uh, sorry again for all the technical uh, uh, problems that we've been facing. Unfortunately, due to that, we cannot take any any questions, uh, and that's uh, that's a shame because I think there was a number of them for your very very quite interesting presentation. But um, we have uh, technical constraints to 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 leave the building. Uh, so uh, we wish you um, a good night, a good match also, all of you, and uh, this will uh, conclude uh, this uh, first day of this uh, GFA conference here at Banque de France. Thank you, and I see you, we will see you tomorrow morning. Bye-bye. Thank you.